Hello and welcome to my crash course on React.js fundamentals. Together we're going to learn the most important concepts from React.js and we'll get ready to build modern, complex and scalable front-end applications. The focus of this course is to learn by example. We're going to build a minimum version of a memory game, nothing super fancy, nothing super complicated, but with everything that we need to get a very good and solid understanding of the basics of React so that we can scale our knowledge to more complex scenarios. This course is divided into 10 sections. The first one talks about the introduction and the setup. Then we talk about JSX, fundamentals of React components, class components and function components, how to manage state in React, working with events in React, diving deeper into the components life cycle. Then we talk about React hooks, we talk about React context in more details, and we end up the course with setting up a React application from scratch without the help of the Create React App utility. The goal of the first section, Introduction and Setup, is to set up a React project using the Create React App utility as well as its necessary dependencies. We'll set up Node.js in three different ways. We'll then set up our React project, we'll understand its structure, very important, and we will understand the role of Webpack, Babel and other important tools in building a front-end application. We start with Create React App so that we can focus and jump faster into working with React itself. As already mentioned, at the end of the course, we will have a whole section in setting up a React application without the usage of Create React App. The second section focuses on the fundamentals of JSX. So our goal is to get a good understanding of the syntax as well as how our React application is rendered in the browser. So we will explore the JSX syntax. We will cover it in details, understand how it relates to HTML, what are the similarities, what are the differences, and then we finish with exploring where our React app is rendered. In the third section, we dive deeper into React components. We want to use JSX to write basic dynamic React components. We understand what they are, we implement our first dynamic React component, and we will explore in details how React handles updates in the DOM. In the practical videos, we will build a simple counter, very basic, but we will build it from scratch without using any of React's state and other constructs so that we understand everything we have to do in order to reflect changes in our web application. We then move on to section number four, where we talk about function and class components. And the goal here is to understand the multiple ways we can create React components and the advantages and disadvantages of each of them. Super important to get familiar with all of them, because when you are working in many projects out there, you will probably come across different versions and different ways in which React components are created. So the first goal is to understand the multiple types of components. We then explore the syntax for class components and the syntax for function components. And then we spend some time to clarify the difference between these two types of components. In the practical videos, we will build the card and the board components for our memory game. We then come to section number five, where we start managing state in React components. And our goal is to understand how React stores information and updates dynamic components when this information changes. This is one of the fundamental building blocks of working with React. So we spend a lot of time to understand the difference between JavaScript variables and React state, as well as clarifying why changes to JavaScript variables do not trigger updates in the DOM by default and then we will explore how to handle states in class components. We'll go through best practices for updating state in React components. And then we also finish the section discussing how components can pass state to other components, common patterns and pitfalls of each approach. In the practical videos, we'll focus on implementing the behavior of flipping the cards in our memory game and keeping track of which cards are flipped. In section number six, we will work with events in React. We will get familiar with the event syntax in React, as well as the most important aspects of working with events in React. We want to refresh, to revisit the event syntax in JSX, clarify the requirements and common pitfalls when working with events in class components, a very common source of bugs here. So we wanna clarify that and make sure that everyone is on the same page, understanding how they work behind the scenes. And we close the section with discussing the best practices for defining events and interfaces in React components. 
This is particularly important when we want to ensure that our components are modular and encapsulate logic properly. So defining events and interfaces is a good discussion that we're going to have in section 6. We then move on to section 7 where we dive deeper into the component's life cycle. So React has multiple phases that components go through and our goal here is to understand the details of how React components are managed by React as well as these different phases that the components go through within the application. In the first moment we'll explore the different life cycle steps of a React component and then we dive deeper into mounting, updating and unmounting phases. We also go through best practices and common pitfalls of correctly placing code within these different life cycle phases. In our practical videos, we will spend a lot of time understanding how the different lifecycle methods can be used and how to avoid common bugs such as forgetting to clean up state or forgetting to clean up a timeout or forgetting to clean up an interval. In section number 8, we cover React hooks in detail. So our goal is to learn the power of hooks and how we can use them correctly. We will understand what hooks are and what they bring to React function components and then we will explore the use state and the use effect hook in detail as well as the use context and the use reducer hook. We will discuss how we can write custom hooks which leverage other hooks in React and in our practical videos we will reflect our components to be function components and leverage hooks. This is particularly common, particularly useful after React 16.8 that release introduced hooks and then we have seen a continuous movement away from class components towards function components. So it's very important that we get a good understanding of how hooks work and how we can implement them following best practices in React. Section number nine is a very important section because we talk about React context. Our goal is to provide a practical introduction to the many aspects of working with React context. But here, it's not only React context. Here, it is really everything that we have learned so far about hooks, about components, about updating state, about managing state properly in React, lifecycle methods, and many other things. So section nine has a lot of important discussions and it brings everything together that we have learned so far through all the previous eight sections into a very detailed and extensive discussion of how these elements work together in React. The first part, we understand why React context is so powerful and which types of problems it best it's best suited for. And then we practice defining a React context as well as best practice for exposing the context to other React components. We also want to discuss important aspects and common pitfalls of working with React context. For example, when something changes within the React context, it's very easy to lead to a full re-render of the application and that can have impacts on performance or even lead to infinite loops. So we need to be aware of these important aspects and common pitfalls and we discuss that in this section. In the practical videos, we will implement a statistics context which collects data from different parts of our memory game and exposes the da this data to the user. And last but not least, section 10 talks about creating or setting up a React application from scratch. We will become proficient in setting up and managing the configuration of React applications. We'll dive deeper into this. We will set up everything from scratch. And that's super important to understand what is happening behind the scenes. The first moment here, we want to understand the limitations of Create React app. And that's mostly that even though it gives us a full blown React application out of the box, it does have limitations in terms of configuration. And then in the second moment, we want to set up an application from scratch without using Create React app. We will dive deeper into how to configure these tools such as Webpack, Babel, Jest and many others. And we'll also learn how to handle static files, for example, CSS, SVG images as well, and how to mock this for our unit tests. In the practical videos, of course, we will set up all the necessary dependencies for our React project. So that's it for this course. I'm really happy to have you around and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the first lecture.
before we jump into working with our React application, we need to make sure that we all have Node.js and NPM installed in the system. I'm going to show you three different ways of doing that and not all of them are compatible with all the platforms. So keep that in mind when, when choosing which one to use. The first one is simply to download the binary or the installer from the nodejs.org website. Once you open the website, you will see what is the long-term support version here in the time, at the time of the recording of this video, this is 18.14.2. When you open it, it will probably be higher. And all you have to do here is to click the button to download the installer, okay? If you have another system, you can click on other downloads and you can see that there are different ways here that you can download the installer for different platforms. You have for Windows, for Mac, and also the source code for you to install it in your Linux machine. There are Linux binaries here as well. So this is the most straightforward way of installing Node in your machine. Um, while this is compatible with Windows, Mac OS and Linux, um, it has a big disadvantage in the sense that it allows you to have only a single version of Node installed globally. If you have multiple Node projects and some of them depend on an earlier version, for example Node 16 or even Node 14, there may be several incompatibilities between them and this may, may lead to a much harder way of managing these different projects. That is where NVM comes into play and NVM, also known as Node Version Manager, is a way for you to manage multiple versions of Node side by side in your machine, okay? So if I scroll down here, you will see that it's possible to use different versions of Node by simply executing NVM use and then this is going to use a certain version. Um, you can install multiple versions with, with NVM installed and you can quickly switch between them. You can also have a global version for Node as well as local versions for different projects. While this is very intuitive, one of the drawbacks is that this NVM tool it's not very much compatible with Windows okay and that's <laughs> I think it's a it's a curse of development that many tools which are out there are not do, do not have full compatibility with Windows so if you're on a Mac on a Linux machine that's going to be easy for you just need to run this command and that's going to install the tool and then you can immediately start using it you might have to to adjust your bash profile with a couple of with a couple of uh, exports here to make sure that M NVM works correctly but if you are on a Windows machine, you will have here at the bottom, if you just scroll down, scroll, scroll, scroll until this important notes section, you will have a couple of tools here that might make this work in a Windows machine. It's not 100% guaranteed. Just keep in mind that support here for Windows is slightly more limited than the standard node installer. The last tool I want to show you is my personal favorite. I use this tool, ASDF. And it is very similar to NVM in the sense that it allows us to manage multiple versions of Node side by side, but it does go much beyond that because since it has a plugin architecture, it allows us to manage multiple versions of many tools. In addition to Node, it also allows us to manage, for example, Python or Terraform or any other tool where you may have different versions. Java is another one. So, you can manage all of this with a single tool, ASDF. And instead of having one tool for Python, one tool for Node, one tool for Terraform, one tool for Java, you have just one specific tool, one single tool, ASDF, which you, then, which you can then install plugins and manage different versions for different systems. To install ASDF, you just need to come to asdf-vm.com and then here under getting started, you find all the instructions and you will see that, for example, in Mac, you can install with brew install ASDF that is going to install the tool. And then you will have to come here at the bottom and just add a couple of lines to your bash RC or to your ZSH RC, depending on which tool you are using. Okay, so if for example, you are in ZSH, then you would have to add this, this path here to the file to make sure that ASDF is working properly. You can also use directly the, the, the git command to download its latest version or the specific version 0.11.2. This is going to place the repository under .asdf and then you can just follow the instructions here. So there isn't really a, an installer per se, you just need to clone the, the repository or to install it via brew and then configure it in your bash RC or in your ZSHRC file. 
there are a couple of dependencies for, for ASDF, so make sure to read through the documentation and make sure that you have all of them installed. Once you have it installed, you should be able to run this command here, ASDF plugin list all. And this is going to show you all the different tools that ASDF supports. As you can see, this is a lot of stuff here. It's a lot of tools supported. If we scroll up, we should see here somewhere Terraform, right? So here we see Terraform. If we scroll up a little bit more, we should see Java as well, as I mentioned. Here is Java. We should also see Python at the bottom. Here it is. We have also RabbitMQ. We have Kubernetes. So let's have a look here. There you have it, kubectl, right? So, so kubectl, that's for Kubernetes. You have Minikube if you ma want to manage different versions. You have PHP as well. So as you can see, there are a pro as well if you want to. There are a lot of different tools, a lot of different languages. It's an extremely flexible tool. And, and I highly recommend getting familiar with it because it's going to save you a lot of headache and a lot of times whenever you need to work with different versions within your machine. Then you don't need to really worry about whether uh, what is the what is the globally installed version no if it's not available you can just add it with asdf and then set it locally for for it, for it to be used within a certain project let's see how it works with node.js right so here we can say asdf plugin list this is going to show node.js this is the only one that i have installed in this environment here but then we can say asdf install node.js and let's take the version here from the installer so back in the home page that's going to be 18.14.2 18.14.2 and that should install the version in our machines once it has downloaded here then you will see um, that this is already then available by our a within our asdf installation by running asdf list node.js we will see that we have two versions installed that's the 16.15.0 and the 18.14.2 and then here we can simply say asdf for example let's set the global one for 16.15.0 that is going to set now if we use a node version we see 16.15.0 now if we were to set this to 18 dot 14 dot 2 then immediately our node version is updated to 18 dot 14 dot 2 for this course let's keep it at at um, 16 version it doesn't really matter here we are not using anything node.js related anything advanced so it's going to be compatible with also later versions there's no problem i just want to show you how you can manage different versions here and how can how this can be useful for you later during your development life so Global is not the only one. We also have the local if we want to set Node.js to a specific version within a certain directory. And we could say that here, the local is going to be 18.14.2, for example. So now, if we were to run Node-V here, we see 18.14.2. But if we were to come back one directory higher, and then here within code, simply say Node version then we should see 16.15.0 okay so um, here once again fundamental reacts we can then visualize it a little bit better the node version within fundamental reacts is set to 18.14.2 but outside of it for example in its parent directory or in any of its siblings directories it's going to be set to the global version of 16.15.0 okay so this management between global and local versions also very flexible it is possible Possible both with NVM and with ASDF with the difference that ASDF you can have multiple versions for multiple tools while NVM is restricted only to node last thing let's just here within our fundamentals react remove that local version so that we still look at the global version here or we could also set the local to 16.15 but here let's then just do that and how do we do that there is a file which is added by by um, asdf which is called here a dot tool versions okay if i were to show the result the the value of this or the content here you see that it identifies node.js 18.14.2 and then this is used by asdf whenever we are working in this directory so to remove that we can just remove the two versions once this is gone then we should be able to see that node here within our folder is back to 16.15 so as simple as that we didn't need to do anything else we still have both versions installed if we were to say here 
plugin or rather list node.js we would still see that two versions are installed and you can see setting and removing a local version is as easy as running a command here on the bash and removing a file afterwards regarding compatibility similar to nvm i haven't found much support on asdf for windows but it is widely supported for mac and for linux so if you are in one of these two platforms then you are covered if you are on windows then it might be harder to make it work once again you always have the fallback option of downloading the installer and running node in the traditional way by installing it globally in your system via the provided installer in the nodejs.org website i have talked a lot about node but nothing about npm and that's because npm comes installed with node okay so if you download a node 14 16 18 doesn't really matter you come with npm ideally you would be using npm version 8 or higher so here with node 16 we have version 8.5 installed if we were to use here um, asdf global node.js 18.14.2 then let's see what we get for npm and that's a 9.5 version so it's a higher version and nonetheless both of them will be compatible with the things that we'll be working with here so no need to worry about it i'm going to reset the global version once again of node.js to 16.15.0 and the npm version is going to be 8.5.5 so if you have these versions that's already good enough um, you will be able to follow with the whole course if you have later versions that's also fine and if you have earlier versions i believe everything is compatible here but you may see slightly different files if you have npm version 6 that's why i recommend that you have npm version 8 there is no issue here to really have multiple versions of node running as we have seen so there is no reason for you not to have the same versions that i have installed here in my system Perfect, with everything set up, let's now take a short pause and let's come back in the next video. We are now going to set up our React application with the help of create of the create react app package. For that, we will run the command npx create react app. Here, then we pass the folder where we want to create. That's going to be fundamentals-react. And then we'll pass a template of a TypeScript and then we'll pass very important very important parameter here the scripts version to make sure that we are all on the same page we're going to install the version 5.0.1 while this command is running let's understand each of the different parts of the command and what they actually do the first part npx is simply our package executor this is available in npm version 6 and later and before that we would have to install the package globally so that we get the binaries and then we could run the binaries locally with npx we don't need to install the packages globally we can just execute npx and then the package that we want to execute here and this will perform the installation and execute whatever binary we are requesting here without requiring us to install the package globally this is good because it prevents us from or it frees us from having to be bound to a certain version specific version of the package once we install that version globally and maybe in another project we want to execute the command again but in a different version then we would have to override the already installed version and this could lead to conflicts as already mentioned the second part here is the package that we want to execute so npx will look for a package published with this name and then it will execute the respective command according to the following rules there are a couple of rules which are followed by npx and the first one is that if there is a single entry in the bin section of our package.json file then this script is going to be executed right so it's also going to match the name here and then it will execute whatever script is indicated here in the bin section the second rule is that if there are more entries in the bin section of our package.json file then it will pick the one that matches the unscoped name of the package now what is that whenever you see something like an at sign and then the scope forward slash and then something else it simply means that the first part before the forward slash is the scope of the package and the second part is the unscoped name of the package so you can see here that npx will match package name under the bin section to the unscoped name to the part that comes after the forward slash 
The third element is simply the folder name, defines where our project will be stored. And the fourth part, very important, is the project template. This enables TypeScript features in our React project by default. I always recommend using TypeScript. TypeScript gives so much type safety and so it, it catches so many bugs at compile time that it's definitely worth using it. Sure, there is a little bit additional effort because we need to think about our types, but this effort is actually very good because exactly it requires us to think about how we are managing and storing and interacting with our data. So highly recommended. I will always try to leverage and explain the TypeScript features we are using. If something is not clear, then make sure to use the questions and answers section, and I'm happy to clarify any doubts there. The last part, the script's version, as already mentioned, we also need to be sure to have the same one. This, this ensures that we all follow the same version and prevents newer students from facing breaking changes, right? So um, inevitably, after the publication of the course, React and Create React app continue its developments and they release new versions. And if you are watching this video much, much later in the future, it may be the case that there is a small or some different changes, some breaking changes between the versions that we are using. So if we don't specify the script's version, it will use the latest one. This is perfectly fine if you're starting a new project and you already know how to work with React. But for us to make sure that we are all on the same page, let's use the same version with the 5.0.1. Back to our screen here, we can see that it has successfully added all the packages and it has created our TS config file. So let's scroll here down up to the top. There you go. So creates a new React app and then it install a couple, so more than a thousand packages. It's a, it's a lot of packages because create React app ships with a lot of functionality out of the box. And then here later on, it sets up our TS config. And then afterwards, it gives us a bunch of scripts that we can use to check that everything is already working as expected. So if we change into fundamentals react, and then we simply execute npm start, we should see our application on the screen. Perfect, so we have our React application set up with the help of create React app. At the end of the course, the last section of this course is going to be focused on setting up a React application from scratch without create React app, so that we understand all the different components, all the different elements that are necessary for a React application to be up and running in the browser. Let's now take a short break and come back in the next video. Welcome back. Let's take a couple of minutes to understand what we have just generated with Create React App. If we go to the folder and we open it in our IDE, this is Visual Studio Code IDE, you will see that there are a couple of folders here. There is the Node Modules folder, a public folder, a source folder, and a couple of files. Git ignore is for Git so that we avoid committing any of the files, for example, under node modules, right? This we don't want to commit because this should be generated by the npm install command in our CI CD or in our local environments. We then have a package.json and a package.lock.json. And these two is simply define the structure of our npm project. The package.json specifies a bunch of options here, the name, the version, the dependencies of our project, as well as a couple of scripts that we can run. We can run any of these scripts with npm run. And it also has a few more configuration options. The package lock.json file specifies a very long file here. If I scroll down to the bottom, it has almost 30,000 lines and it specifies the exact versions which are installed in the, or which are installed as a result of our npm install command. This is very important because it ensures that whenever you install something with npm install, you get the exact versions which are specified here. That makes sure that if it works in your local environment, it's going to work somewhere else if you make sure to run npm install or npm clean install. Okay, so package log file, very important to commit, very important to be added to your repository. I do find sometimes advice online that you should not commit it. I'm completely against it. I think you should commit because the package.json doesn't provide such extensive lock of the dependencies to a specific version. You can see here that in our dependencies, we have just a few. And here in our package lock, we have way more. And that's because 
um, npm is also going to save here the version for example here of something called a dir glob and you if you look in the package.json there is no dir glob here uh, that is because their glob is a transitive dependency it is a dependency of one of our dependencies or perhaps a dependency of a dependency of one of our dependencies so the package log specifies all the dependencies of the project very important to keep it readme file traditional to projects so it gives a brief description as well as the scripts that are provided with the application and then a ts config for our typescript configuration then within our public folder we get our, a couple of files here we have the perhaps the most important one not perhaps but the most important one is our index.html and then here you will see that we have just an empty html and later on we're going to explore where the react application is mounted and this div with an id of root is going to be very important for that so the public public folder contains these static files here which then are bundled as when we build our application and also shipped as static files we then have our source folder which contains the actual core of our application and we start with the index.tsx this is where we are rendering something here we will explore this in details afterwards and then we have other files such as app.tsx and an example of a test file we also have a bit of css here with app.css index.css and then we have an svg this is the react logo the addition of files here one of them is a type declaration for react or for the react app env and um, basically here is bringing the types of react scripts into the into the project and then we have some utilities from react which provides web vitals for the application in case you want to report on the performance and health of the application as well as setup tests and this is just for the um, configuration for the just configuration of our tests if you are familiar with react projects it may be the case you're asking yourself where is my webpack configuration where is my just configuration babel configuration and you can see that there's nothing in here related to that and that's because we are using create react app and create react app abstracts all these things if you were to dig into node modules and react scripts you will find all of that later on at the very end of the course we're going to have a video where we will explore the structure of react scripts and we will find all the configuration we'll look for where everything is because it's a very very valuable source of information to understand how things are set up by create react app but for now we rely on the abstraction that's why you will not see any of these configurations here that's it for the summary of our application for its structure let's then take a short break and let's come back in the next video welcome back let's start exploring what is jsx and this is the most fundamental piece of information that you need to know for for building react applications and here you see that we are declaring a certain variable in javascript this is pure javascript up to here right we're just declaring a constant and we are assigning a certain piece of information that looks like html but it's not really because this is inside of a javascript file now this is what we call jsx now jsx is simply synthetic sugar it doesn't add any new functionality everything that is written with jsx could be written with vanilla javascript as well but jsx provides a much much more intuitive way for writing code that is then later on transformed into plain vanilla javascript so how does this transformation happens the first thing that we run is npm run build this is the build command or you could also say npm run start that is going to trigger the build command behind the scenes maybe not the specific npm run build but it's going to trigger the build process and then once we run this npm run build command here you will find in many projects many configurations that is just going to call the webpack equivalent now webpack is the library which is responsible for building our react application and transforming it into standard html javascript css and so on application so a standard application a standard web application with all the supported files for both modern and older browsers so jsx is not really understood by javascript if you try to 
run a, a JSX file with, for example, a node engine or by just calling or importing this file in a traditional HTML file and then expecting it to be loaded by the browser and executed, this is not going to work because JavaScript doesn't really know what JSX is. So Webpack is a library which packs a bunch of functionality, one of them being this Babel functionality. Now Babel here is again another library which is going to transpile JSX into actual traditional vanilla JavaScript. So something like this, which looks very much like HTML, but is JSX behind the scenes. It is then transpiled by Babel into a call to a certain function from React, and then it's passing a bunch of parameters to the function or a bunch of arguments. The first is the type of the element we want to create. The second one is the props. And the third and any subsequent arguments here are going to be the children of this element. So bottom line here is that we do have a process that we have to go through to be able to take a JSX file or a TSX file, for example, and transform it all the way into JavaScript, vanilla JavaScript. I also mentioned here in the Webpack process, the chunking keyword, and this is another very important thing because Webpack will optimize how it distributes code between JavaScript files so that it optimizes the loading time of our application. We don't need to load all the code of our application at once. We can do that in parts, we can do that in chunks, and that's what the chunking process or the chunking step in Webpack means. At the end of this whole process, Webpack is going to output a dist folder or a build folder. It can also be called build. And this is going to contain all the files that then can be served. These are then standard JavaScript files that are compatible with most modern browsers and also most slightly older browsers. And then this can be served from an S3 bucket in AWS, for example, or for, from any other location, it can serve these files. For us to better understand what's going to happen with our application and to visualize this whole process, let's execute the npm run build command and let's see what is generated by this script. Perfect. So as you can see here, once we run the npm run build, we start, we are executing the React scripts build command. Let's have a look at the IDE. And here you will see under package.json, if we go to the script section, we have build and this simply executes the React scripts build. Now you see that there is a build folder here. And once we open it, you see that there are a bunch of files, right? So here you see that within static, we have the CSS files, we have the JavaScript files, and we have some media files. And you see that the JavaScript is really nothing like our application. Our application has an app.tsx and an index.tsx. But in the end, we have a bunch of chunks here, and these are a result of the Webpack chunking process. And if we open, for example, the main.hash here and the .js.map or also the .js, it's fine if you prefer to open this one. I just don't like the fact that there are these, all these errors here. And that's fine because this is a generated file, right? This doesn't need to be developer friendly. But if we open the map one, which just doesn't show all, this, all these errors, and we look for create element, then we will see that there are a couple of instances of this of this function here and we can see what it is doing we can see that we are assigning something to mb here and then we are setting the inner html of mb to something related to svg so all these little things are then here in this bunch of like very very nasty code hard to understand right we don't need to understand it um, this is Webpack generated, but I just want to show you that here there is nothing of JSX. In the end, everything that we use for JSX, everything that we mention in our files, and here is one example, right? This is JSX, this is JSX, this is not HTML, and this is then behind the scenes transformed to calls to create elements. So all of this is once again handled by Webpack, which is our, our bundling tool, the tool that is going to take our code and transform it into a web application that can be served to browsers. And this is extremely useful because then it allows us to actually focus on the things that matter and use way more developer friendly tools, for example, like JSX. Let's now take a quick pause and let's come back in the next lecture.
Welcome back. In this video, we will explore JSX in a little bit more detail. So I have the app.tsx file open here. And as you can see, all we have is a function. And this function is named with a capital letter. And then we return something that looks like HTML from this function, but it's not really HTML. This is in the end JSX. If we hover over the div or the header, for example, you will see that TypeScript is already hinting at its type. It's saying that it's from JSX, intrinsic elements, div. Now, each HTML tag has an equivalent JSX tag. So here you see that the same thing, JSX intrinsic elements header, JSX intrinsic elements IMG, and this will, in the end, be transformed into their HTML equivalent, but they are not really HTML. They are very similar, but they are not the same thing. This means that if we were to try to write HTML here, we will have a couple of issues. So 90% of the knowledge can be transferred directly, but there are a few gotchas. The first one is we don't, we cannot use class here because as you see, the moment we remove the name here, uh, this simply says that property class does not exist on the type of HTML props. And that's because class in JavaScript is a reserved keyword. So since this is JavaScript or this will be transformed into JavaScript afterwards, we cannot use JavaScript reserved keywords here. So um, an alternative that was provided by JSX is to use the class name. Class name will then later on in the HTML file or in the HTML components, it will be equivalent to class, but here in our code, we have to use class name. Another very useful feature of JSX is something that you see here, where we have this image source, and then we have a pair of curly brackets with a variable in between. The logo is being imported here, so it is stored in the logo variable, but we could also write or create a new variable in JavaScript. For example, file name is going to be, let's call it app.tsx, right? This is our file name. And then here we could say edit code source. And once again, curly brackets, and then the file name. Now this here will interpolate the value app.tsx within or after our forward slash. So it will substitute the value of the variable by the content here. Let's save this. Let's back. Let's come back to our terminal. Let's start our dev server and let's see this in action. We now have edit source app.tsx, but if we were to come back to our IDE and change this to anything else.tsx, we save this and then we will see that in the browser, the value is actually changed. So it's a very powerful thing to have interpolation here because this gives, this is the foundation of having dynamic elements or dynamic React components. Another very important part of JSX is the fact that we can return it from functions. You see here that we have a function app that returns JSX. And then within index.tsx here, very interesting, we can just import this. This is the default export from our app.tsx. And we can simply use it as a very HTML-ish tag here. So this is not HTML. Once again, this is JSX. And here we, it just looks like HTML, but this makes it much easier for us to work with this component. So a component is basically anything that returns JSX, a function that returns JSX or a class that follows or implements a certain or rather extends a certain super class that is provided by React. We will explore all this later on in the course. But here we can think of a component as a function that is returning JSX. We can then write here const hello world like so. And we could say this is just a function that returns a div, which says hello world like so. So if we were now to take this here and my, and, and, and add this as a, as a tag in our application. So let's put it maybe above our code. Let's put within a paragraph and then we have hello world, not like this. If we add like this, it will just show the text hello world. But if we add it between open and close like so, and then we can self close the tag, then this is going to actually tell us or show us the content here. If we were to change this to say goodbye, for example, goodbye world. 
and save this, then we will see that this also changed on the screen. So the moment that we have a function that returns JSX, we can use this variable here within our code as we were using, as if we were using this standard tags. One very important thing is that whenever we have this pattern, we need to add or have the first letter in uppercase. If we have this lowercase, this is not going to work as expected, okay? If we were to add it here, we will see that we get an error from TypeScript and that is because TypeScript and also JSX and React behind the scenes, they look at the first letter to define whether this is an intrinsic JSX element or whether this is a custom JSX element. Intrinsic JSX elements are all this, which have a direct HTML equivalent, so div, header, image, paragraph, and later on link as well. And here, since there is no equivalent HTML element for Hello World, then we get this error from TypeScript saying that the property Hello World does not exist on a type jsx.intrinsicElements. So how do we solve that? We have to use capital H, like so here, and then like so here. Another important difference between JSX and HTML is how we pass events or how we pass functions to our components. In HTML, we have something like this, right? So on click and then we pass a string and this string would be the function we want to execute. But in JSX, you see that this is not the case. We are not allowed to do so. It simply says that the property on click does not exist on this type here, the HTML props of our div element. Okay, it even gives us a hint, did you mean on click like so? And this is the difference that in JSX, we do need to use camo case. And here it's not a string, but we should actually pass a function. You see here that it tells us that the type string is not assignable to a type mouse event handler. If we wanted to see how the type looks like, we can click on the on click here. This takes us to the TypeScript file declaration and then we can once again, here I'm holding option in, in Mac and then we can click here once again and we will see that's a, that's a very nest, nested. So there's a lot of definitions here that we need to actually follow. But eventually we will start getting into the final definition or actually the signature. For us not to spend too much time here, but I do find that this is a very useful process whenever you are working with external libraries to be able to follow the type definitions to understand what needs to be provided. Here you can see that as, as long as we hover over event handler, you will see that it has here in the end, it is simply a function that receives an event as a parameter and it returns nothing. Okay, so this is what is expected. I'm gonna close this. And here you will see that um, if we were to substitute from the string to once again, use the interpolation, open and close curly brackets and we pass a function, we simply say console log clicked like so. This is already a JavaScript function. It is valid. We will save this, come back to the browser. And now let's open our developer tools. We have a bunch of warnings here. This is coming from the previous things, invalid things that we were doing. You see the hello world with a, capit with a lowercase h here. And once we refresh the page, then we will see that this is just going to give us a, a warning regarding HTML. We could get rid of it by just removing the paragraph and then instead of using, for example, a div here, we could use directly a paragraph like so, right? So if we use a paragraph and then we come back, everything is the same, refresh the page and the warning is gone. Now back to the event, once we click on this div here, anywhere on this div, you will see that this gets printed in the console. This is once again, much more flexible than pure HTML where you had to work with strings because here, you can have very, very complex behaviors. You can receive this function from outside of the component or via the properties of the component, which we will explore in a later video. And we can define this function within our component and reference a couple of other variables. Very powerful, very flexible approach, much easier from a development perspective. So these are the main differences or these are the main characteristics of JSX. Don't worry if there are some concepts which are not clear that we are just at the beginning of the course and we'll revisit these concepts over and over again. We cover them in much more details and we see many more 
different use cases for now. Before we close the lecture, let's just remove a couple of the things that we have added here. We don't need to have this different, the, this, these elements here. We can remove the hello world as well. And then here we can also have the old app.tsx file like so. So once we save this, and then everything should here on the browser be back to, to as it was in the beginning. Having covered some of the most important concepts of JSX, let's now take a short break and let's come back in the next lecture. Welcome back. In this video, we will explore where our React application is rendered, where in the HTML file and what is the relationship between React and pure HTML. So I want to start exploring with you the index.html file that comes shipped out of the box with create react app. I'm going to double click here to make sure that the, the file is pinned here on the top and we can explore it. We already went through it. We saw that there are a couple of meta tags in the head and then here within the body we have an, a body with just two tags. The first one is going to be run whenever we do not have JavaScript enabled. Since we need JavaScript for React, then we will print this. Otherwise, the app is not going to run properly. Uh, this is not the case anymore in most of the modern browsers. This is really, I believe, a quite, quite outdated statement here. So normally JavaScript is enabled, but in some cases for security reasons, it might be disabled by default. We then have the core here of that, that we are looking for. It is a div with an ID of root, okay? So whatever ID that we pass here, this is independent, it, it, it's irrelevant. We could pass just whatever ID, for example, and we could then here simply use this whatever ID within our get element by ID. I'm gonna save this and then back here in the browser, we will still see the same application. So the ID name or whatever we call the div is irrelevant. The important thing is that there is a match between this ID here in the div and the ID that is fetched then here by the document.getElementById. For us to make things a little bit simpler, let's add here instead of rendering directly the app in our in our root, let's render just um, a string here saying hello world. Okay. So now once I save this here and I come back to the browser, we will just see hello world at the very top. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so that it's easier to see. Great. So now we are able to render this on the screen. Uh, the question is what happens once we want to add some more HTML here? What if we want to add a paragraph outside of React? All right. So what happens if we want to do something like this? Is this possible? And once we save this here, we should see that this is perfectly possible. It's no problem that we add more HTML code here outside of the React application. So the React application gets rendered under this div with an ID of root, but it doesn't mean that we cannot do other stuff outside of the React application. There is a catch, however, is that whatever we are doing inside of this React application here, this requires some additional ways or additional work to make it communicate with stuff that is placed outside of this React application. Okay, so what we explore during this course is how we work with a single React application, cases when we have multiple React applications or React applications next to pure HTML or React application next to jQuery applications, for example, or next to Angular applications, this would enter more into the direction of micro frontends. And there are a few tools, a few techniques that we can use to enable communication between these different applications, but that's outside of the scope of this course. I have just mentioned multiple React applications. So what do I mean by that? Well, what do I mean by that is simply that we can replicate this flow here as many times as we want. If we come here to our index.html and I will create another div here and I will say that this is another application. And then here within our index.tsx file, then we can simply get another root, right? So we could say something like another root. And then here we will get by the another app index. So now here the ID, another app is going to be taken as the root for whatever we will render on the screen. Now we can simply say another root dot render. And then here we can pass exactly the same thing. We'll just change the, the string here inside so that we say, for example, goodbye, like so. 
And now if we come back to the screen, we will see that we have everything rendered. It's no problem. So we have two React applications here, actually, two React routes, which are rendered in different parts of the DOM. They are independent from one another and you could actually manage them independently. Um, and that's where we enter into the realm of multiple React applications. So things that we use inside of this first React application, for example, a context or something like this, they will not be available in the second React application. Now, once again, exploring these possibilities for communication or the restrictions as well, it's outside of the scope of this course, but I just want to let you know that the possibility exists. This also means that you can actually be very specific here. Perhaps you want to have a menu and here you would like to, let's say, maybe you want to say that you have a nav bar here and then within your nav bar you have a logo and we're just going to use a paragraph for now and we'll say logo and then next to the logo we want to actually have a menu which is a React application. So we can just say div and then we could say id is equal to menu for example and then here we can simply say Okay, now within our index.tsx file, I'm gonna remove this just to avoid having a lot of stuff here. I'm gonna remove this as well. And then here we'll not have the another root anymore, but we will say const menu is equal to react dom dot create root. And then here it's going to be the same principle. I'm just gonna copy this and paste it here. Menu, and then we'll simply say menu.render. And we'll simply say this once again, like so. And we'll say a menu item, menu items, for example, right? So that's the, the same principle here. Since we are using just a, a traditional nav with a display of block, then this is not going to show side by side. But the bottom line is that here we are adding a menu that is coming from our React application. This is nested in the HTML DOM, right? So this is not really at the top level directly under body and we can nest it as much as possible. We can provide individual components as we can provide them from multiple sources. This can be from a React application, from an Angular application, from Vue application. So bottom line here is um, while most of the cases or in, in many cases you will come across a, a React application being rendered directly here and then having just a simple HTML like this, and then the whole application is actually uh, the HTML page that you're seeing in the end, or the, the web application that you're seeing in the end, it is possible to have this composition with multiple React applications. Perfect, so I want to undo a few things here just so that we make sure that we get back to a clean piece of code. I will keep rendering hello world on the screen for now because in the next video we will play a little bit around with this file here. We will ignore a little bit the app.tsx. This is where the React application is rendered here. I want to explore a couple of fundamental concepts with you in the next couple of videos and we're going to use the index.tsx file. But before that, let's take a short break and we'll come back in the next lecture. Welcome back. In this video, I want to discuss a couple of fundamental concepts in React. And for that, we're going to explore a very simple implementation of how we can implement a counter on the screen. Okay, so here, very simple, we're going to start with a counter variable, we're just going to say that this is zero to begin with. And then here we could just directly render, we can say something like this, my value is and then if we interpolate here, we just get the counter rendered. Okay, so if we come back to the browser, we see that my value is zero. We now would like to update the counter and for that we can think about adding a button, right? So here I'm just going to wrap this around the div and then I'm going to copy paste this. And then one intuitive way for us to think here is that we would simply add a button at the bottom, right? So this is a simple button and we'll say here increment. And then whenever I click on this button, and remember on JSX the events are in camel case, whenever we click on this button, what we would like to do is we would like to increment the counter, like so, right? So uh, increment assigned to the same variable here. We're gonna save this and let's see how this behaves in the browser. So very interesting here, I'm gonna open the console and let's click on increment and, and nothing really is happening when we click on increment. Now, why is it so? Is it the case that the counter variable doesn't really get updated? And the one way for us to check that is that we can simply console log the counter here, right? So we increment it here and then we just console log to see what is the new value of this variable. 
once we come back here refresh the page and we click on increment then we see that this is actually one and we keep clicking on it and it is properly incrementing it is properly increasing but it is not being reflected on the ui the question is why aren't i using this counter here within react and as it turns out whenever we call the root.render or whenever we render a certain component in react it is going to be rendered with the information that is available at hand updating a variable in the javascript code will not directly trigger a re-render of this component that's one of the fundamental concepts of react is that of a re-render whenever we call whenever we talk about re-render it simply means that we are re-executing our code with new information once that information has been changed okay so here if we wanted to see the updates in our counter we would actually have to call once again the root.render here after we have incremented the counter now as you can see this is very ugly okay i'm aware of that but i just want to show you that if we come back to the browser and we do it once then we will see the value upgrade if we do it once again this is not going to work because we do not have another root.render here we just have a console log so if we come back here then you will see that we are back to the console log so the point is that it's not really possible it's not feasible for us to simply copy paste the root.render whenever we change the value of a variable this is also not efficient because this would basically re-execute the whole application and a lot of javascript code and this can be very heavy in terms of computation we will see in later points in the course different ways that we can work with information that needs to be updated and tracked by react and these are for example the state state is a specific field in class components and the state field is tracked by react and whenever it changes react re-triggers it re-renders the component in which the state was changed but i'm going ahead of myself and entering into some concepts that we will explore in depth later on for now here let's try to fix this issue that we cannot really go more than or we cannot really go indefinitely here in our updates so for that we're going to simply define a function and that's going to be a function called increment counter and what increment counter will do is it will then do our counter plus plus right so here let's simply copy paste this we're going to copy this and i believe that i will need to remove this here and probably an additional one perfect so the increment counter is going to increment our counter and then it's going to call this root.render where the on click button here is not really going to be another function it will simply be a circular reference or a recursive reference reference if you want to call it but it's just going to be a reference to our old increment counter once we save this and now within this button here we use the increment counter like so i'm going to save it once again just to format everything we can think it this way that the first time we're going to render this application under our root and then we're going to pass a reference to the button on the on click event now once the button is clicked we're going to trigger whatever this is this is a function so we're going to trigger it and then we're going to once again render this application on the screen and we're going to pass the reference exactly to the same function so this is going to be then a circular way of us actually referencing the function over and over again and then this we can actually execute as many times as we want the increment functionality what is happening here it's just we are taking our time to understand that we actually need to re-trigger the render process once things change later on once again as i mentioned we will see that react will take care of most of this for us behind the scenes but it is still very valuable to know how it actually works okay and uh, how it actually works it's it's not 100 percent like this of course react has a lot of optimizations behind the scenes so that it makes sure to minimize the amount of computation it needs and prevent the the users from entering into very slow applications or entering into very slow states so how exactly react implements that that's again outside of the scope of this course it's a very advanced methodology but it relies on a couple of heuristics and on a couple of shortcuts to make sure that it can provide very good optimizations to make sure that the applications are 
working correctly and efficiently. But the principle here is the same. It changes something, we need to re-render the component, we need to re-render whatever relies on the information that was changed. Before we take a short break, I would like to explore with you what actually gets re-rendered in the DOM. I'm gonna highlight this and then here you can see I have my root. Within my root I have a div, my value is 11, right? So I'm just gonna refresh this, we get then a div with my value of 0. And once we click on increment, pay attention to what gets highlighted here. It's fairly quick, but you should be able to see it. And you can see that only the number is actually changing and being highlighted. So this highlight is basically what gets rewritten to the DOM, right? So here when we click on increment, you can see that it's not everything that is getting rewritten. Even though we are re-rendering everything here, uh, this is not being rewritten in the DOM. And that's because DOM operations are expensive. They take time and they are fairly slow. And that's why React provides ways of optimizing it so that we minimize the number of DOM operations that we execute. One of these ways is that React is not going to rewrite components that didn't change. So for all purposes here, what has changed is just the number, right? The my value is, is a static text and the button here still stays in increment, okay? So here you can see that the button is not re-rendered and also the text here is not re-rendered. Perhaps another aspect which you are shouting at me and complaining is like, why do you have this code duplication? It is exactly the same piece of code that I have between this part and this part. They, they can be replaced 100%. So do we need this kind of duplication? And that's exactly what we will explore in the next video when we come into contact with the concept of components. But before that, let's take a short pause and I'll see you in the next lecture. Welcome back. In this video, we will continue exploring some fundamental concepts of React and we're going to talk about components. Now, components, we already saw a, an example of a component that is the app function here. This is simply a function that returns JSX. And you can think about it this way. Anything that returns a JSX and starts with a capital letter can be thought as a component in React. More specifically, this is what we call a function component because, well, it is a function. In addition to functions, we also have class components and these are, I guess, classes, right? So we could say my component here and then the way for us to define a class component is to extend the React, not like so, but the react.component superclass and then here we need to provide a render method. That's the only required method. The render method is equivalent to what we get here with the return. And you see that I get I, I get an error and that's because I need to return some JSX here. Same principle. Okay, so if I have div, then the error goes away. They can be used in exactly the same way. They can be used as tags here. So we could use, for example, my component like so here and that's perfectly fine and the same way that we can use app here that we used before we saw that the app was here okay so that is a very very fundamental definition of components when we talk about react components you think about either class components or function components function components are starting or they actually started being much more popular after react 16.8 that's when hooks came into place once again we have a whole section about hooks so we don't need to worry about them now. We will understand, we will explore in details, class components, function components, and how to migrate and provide the same functionality with each of them. That means we can create a component out of this code that is duplicated and then we can reuse this component. That's, that's one of the main use cases. Components are how we can modularize and build reusable pieces of code in React as we would, for example, extract functions that are used on, on different places and we would extract them under a single function that gets called in multiple places. That's the same thinking, that's the same reasoning that goes behind creating React components. And it may be the case that you want to extract a smaller piece. Perhaps you would like only this div to be a component. And here we, could, we can see that we have a duplicated code. So here we could just create, for example, const counter. And then we could simply return the div like so. And here let's call it counter value, for example, counter value. 
right and then we can also use this here and that's going to work just fine i'm going to save this back to the browser refresh the page i'm going to close this just for a bit and you will see that this is working just fine so what we did is we extracted a shared piece of functionality into a common component that returns jsx which then allows us to use it within React components or within other components. Now, there isn't a lot of value here in having just this. So what we could actually do here is we can extract this to be, let's say a div, which just acts as a wrapper here. And then we can have this and we can also have the button, right? So once we have the button here at the bottom, we could replace this whole thing with the counter. I'm just gonna rename this to counter like so, counter. And we can actually remove this whole thing here. We can say counter and then save everything for a better formatting back to the screen, refreshing, everything is working just fine. If you also want to, re to move the react.strict mode here, that is also okay, even though counter is not really the, the, the root of your application. So um, you can also leave it as it is here. Last thing that I wanna mention in this video, very important, very important, uh, is regarding how does this counter component, let me just cut this and put a little bit below, like so, and the, the declarations are fine. Here you can see that the counter is used within increment counter and increment counter is used within counter. That's fine because JavaScript is gonna bring all these definitions to the top. So it will actually be able to work with them uh, without causing any bugs, right? So it's independent from the order that we define things here. So the very important thing I want to discuss with you is actually regarding the counter here and the increment counter. And as you can see, these are referencing things which are outside of our component, right? This function is declared outside of our component. The value of the counter is stored outside of our component. Now this, introduces a lot of indirect coupling here because now our counter component cannot really exist on its own. For it to exist, there has to be a counter variable declared and there has to be an increment counter function declared. And if you want to customize the behavior of what happens when we click on the button, it's not possible to do so because that's really hard coded. Whenever we use the counter, we know that when we click, it's going to increment the counter. So this is not really testable in a sense that if I want to use this counter component within our maybe a unit test or whenever I wanna use the counter to customize the behavior, perhaps I want to execute something else in addition to, to increment counter. Perhaps I want to have something logging the information somewhere else. So it's not customizable. I cannot really customize what happens within our on click nor I can customize where this value of the counter is coming from. It is inevitably and always bound to the counter variable. That's a very strong coupling and it makes our counter component harder to maintain. And it also makes the component impure because if I were to simply change the counter here to another value, let's say 10 or 100, or if I were to change the increment counter function, then this would have side effects inside of my counter. And if I, whenever I use the counter component and I click on the button, I also have side effects because this function here, it is actually changing state. It's changing a piece of information that is outside of our component. This is a side effect, right? So whenever we use a component and we trigger some change outside of the component as a result of using that component or interacting with it, that's called a side effect and that makes the component impure. So not the best setup here. There is a way for us to address this and that's what we will explore in the next video when we talk about props. So let's take a short break and come back in the next lecture. Welcome back. In this video, we will discuss the concept of props in React, which is extremely important for us to create modular, reusable and customizable components. It's a it's very important concept and it simply refers to how can we pass information programmatically to a component from the outside world. We already saw that this component is coupled indirectly by hard coding a certain variable here within our counter and the function increment counter. In this video, we will see how we can fix that by adding some props to the component. So I'm gonna start by defining the type of information that we would like to receive here within our counter. I'll simply say type, and this is going to be counter props. 
I do like to follow the convention of adding props at the end of whatever my component name is because it makes it very easy to see that this refers to the counter props, right? So if I add something else here, maybe a counter configuration or counter information or counter data that is harder to connect this to know that this is actually the props that are being used um, within our counter component. So what we would like to receive within the counter component is we would like to receive from the external world we would like to receive the value which is going to be a number and we would also like to receive what happens when we click on the button and this is going to be a function that returns nothing. So simply saying okay whatever function you pass to me that returns nothing it is fine I will be able to work with it and I'll be able to invoke it here within on click. Now how do we pass props to components? In function components very simple we can just add a parameter here to our function and this is going to be an object that is received by react and this is going to be counter props. Okay now here whenever we are using counter we will see that TypeScript starts complaining because it's saying that the type is missing the following properties from the counter props value and on click. So this is because we have defined these two properties here as being mandatory. For now let's mark them as optional and then we will step by step introduce these properties to the places where we use the component. The first thing that I would like to do here however is to just console log what we are receiving in the props on the screen. So I'm going to have something like this and then here I need to return instead of just having the, the parentheses and the div here that's because we are not directly returning we are now using curly brackets because we would like to console log our props here. I'm going to save this and let's come back to the browser. We will see within the browser if we open the console and refresh the page that we see two empty objects here. That is because we are not passing any props to our component right now. If we were to come back here to the IDE and here let's say we call we pass it here we're going to say value for example and this is going to be 10. Okay I'm going to save this now and back to the browser you will see that now the props contain an entry with a key of value and a value of 10. So the way that we pass props to React components is exactly the same way that we were already exploring in previous videos how we can pass information to JSX tags because React components work very similarly to JSX intrinsic tags then we can pass these components as we would pass attributes to an HTML element. Very similar perhaps a couple of a couple of uh, differences or exceptions the class name is one example and the events which should be camo case are other examples but here as you can see this looks very HTML-ish so that is a very nice very intuitive way of passing information to the React component. Once again here we can now make value mandatory now this is going to cause the one above to fail and we can then pass a value here. Now if we were to pass another value let's say 12 for example now this is not a value that gets updated with the on click function yeah the, the increment counter here it is incrementing this counter so if we were to reason about what's going to happen now we are going to render a counter with a value of 10 to begin with and here we would actually have to update the counter to use props.value so we will do that now actually so we'll say props.value like so and then the component is going to be rendered in the first case with 10 and as soon as we click on the button we're going to enter into the increment counter function and in the end we're going to return a counter with a value of 12. So it's going to be 10 always and then once we click on the button once it's going to be 12 and it will stay that way. Right, so back here you see that we have the 10. Once we click on increment it stays 12 and it will stay 12 forever. Very good here that's, that's fine we are able to now get information from the props but that's not really what we want right. We want here to actually pass the counter as our value and here we also want to pass the counter like so. So now that we pass the counter as a value then everything is going to be back to working here and whenever we click you will see that we are console we are printing here the, the props and then the increment here is also working on the screen.
I mentioned this later in the course as well, but if you are curious now and you cannot stop asking yourself, why do we have duplicated print statements here? And that is because of this tag react.strictMode. Okay, so react.strictMode renders everything twice. And this is very useful to understand or to identify whether there are any leaking information, any unclear state that should have been cleaned up between re-renders. That's very useful. And this is this is run only in development mode. So when we when you build the production mode, this is out. It's not going to run the the code twice. And one example that we can see or how we can visualize that this is not going to be the case, we can just uh, remove the react strict mode we're going to save this back here then you see that it has only one right so now just one print statement no big deal that's because of react strict mode and we will see throughout the course that is actually helping us um, identify a couple of bugs and actually uh, prevent a couple of unwanted behavior that would happen if we didn't clear our state properly that all comes later, don't worry about it. We will come back to, to all these things that I'm mentioning. Let's now continue with our refactoring. And the second element that I would like to pass as a prop here is the onClick function. So now I'm gonna make this mandatory that is going to break my counter component here and here as well. And the only thing that I have to do here is that I need to pass a reference to the function that we want to execute. And this is going to be a reference to the on uh, to the increment counter function both here and here and now we would actually use props dot increment counter increment counter is not the correct name we would actually use props dot on click so i'm going to save this now back to the browser once again we are we are printing stuff twice and when we click on the increment then everything is working as expected we can also use here so we can just remove this to avoid um polluting the, the console, we can also use the structuring in JavaScript and we can have here value and on click, right? So this um, is possible because we are defining the type here as being a counter props type. This is just, so this part here is TypeScript. This gets removed from your code once the project is built and the JavaScript code is generated. But during development time, this helps us understand that, okay, whatever I have on the left side here is of type counter props, so I can safely use the structuring and I have some nice autocomplete functionality as well. We can also remove props dot from here, since we are now declaring two variables value and on click by destructuring them from the props that we get. We save this, everything is still working just fine. Back to the IDE, let's take a moment to investigate what we have done, okay? Here in the end, you could argue, yeah, this is still using the counter from outside, or rather maybe here it's easier to visualize. This is still using the counter from outside and it's still using the increment counter here. So has this really solved any problem within our code? Like is the coupling gone? And no, the coupling is, is still there, but now the coupling is explicit. Now I know that my counter element depends on a value that needs to be provided and on a function that needs to be provided whenever we want to update that value. There isn't any, there aren't any hidden dependencies. Our component is really dependent on only the information that it receives as an input. And this is a standard pure functionality. It simply depends always on the input that it receives and on nothing else. Now, you may say that it still causes side effects and it does because the on click function here, it modifies external state. But this is something that we have to learn to be comfortable with to do it in a safe way because in any web application, you will trigger side effects. You will trigger network requests, for example, to update some value on the database, or you will download some file to the user system, or you will modify some other state that is used by multiple components. And this is, this is business as usual in web development. It's just very, very hard, if not impossible to get rid of it. The way that we can address it is by making this side effect behavior explicit. And that's exactly what we are doing with this on click property here and then passing it explicitly to the component because now we know, okay, when I click on the, count on the counter here, then it will 
execute this function. Before, there was no way of knowing if we were to just mount the counter or, or add the counter to our DOM, to our React application, we, would, we wouldn't know what happened. We would have to go into the counter code and then have a look at, ah, okay, it's executing this and it's executing that whenever we are clicking on the button, but we wouldn't have it clear and we also wouldn't have it customizable. Now, if we want to change the on click here, for example, and then simply console log a message and saying, I won't work anymore, right? So that, that is just, I'll just print this on the screen and, and that is fine. So now I come back here, I refresh it and it's gonna run once, but now I won't work anymore. So we can customize this and you can think from a testing perspective that's also very useful because it's often the case that when you are in a testing environment, you want to pass maybe a mock function uh, to, to verify that it was executed, for example, but you don't need anything else in addition to that. So and just a few comments and a few benefits of having it this way. The most important element is really, or the most important part is really that we we are making the dependencies of our component or the, the information that it works with, we are making it explicit. Perfect. So before we close this video, I just want to address a very little thing here. And perhaps you saw that there is this div, right? Um, this wrapper div here is simply grouping two elements together. So your question could be like, is this necessary? And the truth is that in React, we cannot return sibling JSX elements. We have to return only one top JSX element. So it says here JSX expressions must have one parent element. The best way here to actually address this whenever we just need to pass a um, or whenever we just need to return sibling JSX elements is to use an empty tag. Now this empty tag here is a React construct. It's called a fragment. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow us to return these elements, but it's not going to add any tag in the DOM. So let's have a look at what happens when we return a div. I'm just going to add it again here. Let's go back to the browser, go back to our elements. And you will see here that under our div with an ID of root, we have a div which has, is not doing anything. And then we have another div where our components are actually related. Now, if we repeat this pattern over and over and over again, we'll have a ton of divs which are not doing anything. They're just wrappers really. And this is not optimal from, from the perspective of managing and um, building your application. So what React provides us is actually an empty tag here. And this empty tag is just going to be the same thing, gonna do the same thing, but it's not gonna add anything to the DOM. If we come back here, now you see that we refresh this and our div is directly under the div with an ID of root. And these are the two siblings that we actually wanted to return. So that's what I wanted to explore with you in this video, how we can pass information from outside of the component to the component by using the concept of props. Let's now take a short break and we will come back in the next lecture. We are now starting with our project for this course and the first element, the first component that we want to implement for which we already have all the knowledge that we need is the card component. Before we implement this component, I would like to do a bit of cleanup on the code here. We will get rid of the counter and all of this code that we have here we used in the previous videos to illustrate a couple of fundamental concepts of React. I'm gonna remove everything because right now I just want under the root.render, we already know what it does. Now here, I just want to render my app component. So this is a good practice to have one component rendered here in the root level and then in a separate file, in a different file, in this case here, the app.tsx file. This is the component that will actually hold our application. So here we can see if there is anything we can remove. There is nothing that we can remove for now. Once we save this and come back to the browser, we should see again the old content, the content of the app.tsx file. We can also do a bit of cleanup here. We can remove the greeting component because we are not going to use that. We will also not use the type theme. And here we can simply return a div, an empty div for now. So I'm going to remove this and remove the two greeting components. Once I save this, we will see nothing on the screen. The errors are coming from the previous changes because the greeting component was not defined anymore, right? So once we removed it, we have these errors here. And because of the auto reload on the browser, then the errors are shown on the console. If I were to save this and then come back here and reload the page, we will see that the errors are gone. 
Now that we have a clean slate, a clean page, let's start by implementing the card component. So this is going to be a function component because it's a very simple component. We'll simply call it card and the card is going to be of type function component. Now this is, can be imported from React here on the top and this is a TypeScript function that simply allows us to have some nice features of static typing. So the function component is a, general, a generic type which can receive here between this less than and greater than sign it can receive the type of the props that are expected for the component we're going to define this in a little bit but for now let's just simply have a component that is going to return a div and here this div is going to have a certain class applied to it remember in react we use the class name and the class name property here is going to simply add the class card Let's now under app.css here, remove the unused classes and add a class called card so that we can add a bit of styling to our card component. The card component will have a display of flex so that we can position it properly on the screen. It will have a justify content of center so that all the content inside of the component is aligned in the center and then align items will make sure that, so whenever we combine justify content and align items center center, this makes sure that the content is centered both vertically and horizontally. We will set a width and the width is going to be, let's say 10 REM and a height of 16 REM. Let's set a border here and the border is going to be one pixel solid and we'll simply use a light gray here, hashtag DDD, a border radius, border radius of one pixel or rather we could say that's going to be one REM and we will have a slight box shadow just for sake of styling for looking or making things look a little bit better on the screen zero zero ten pixels zero and again a light gray hashtag eee -E -E. and we want to make sure that whatever overflows here is hidden and this is because otherwise the background of our component here would simply overflow the border radius and it wouldn't show the rounded border so we'll, we're going to make sure that the overflow is hidden and also that whenever we hover over the card we have a pointer as the cursor this gives us the basic styling for our card component and now if we were to come back here on our app.tsx or on our app uh, component and we were to render a card we should already see something on the screen i'm going to refresh this and we see at least the border here around so there is no background color nor anything but at least we see a sort of container for the card back in our app.tsx let's now define a couple of props to our card component so that we can define a little bit better the behavior of that card component so we will create a type here and i'll simply say card props and that's again a convention i like to follow and then this is going to be an object this object is going to have two properties the first one is a color which is a string and the second one is a boolean is flipped like so oops which is a boolean now the is flipped is going to indicate whether the card is flipped upside down or not and the color will simply define the color of the card now a way for us to pass the card props here and, and use this type card props to define the props is to simply say props card props, for example. However, this is not the, let's say, standard way because here we can use the facility of function component, which is to simply pass the card props as the generic element of this. And then this defines the props here or it indicates that this component is expecting these two props, these two attributes to be passed. Once we define this here and pass it to our function component, we immediately get a TypeScript error saying that, oops, you are not providing the props of color nor the prop of is flipped. So please do provide this information. Let's first fix the TypeScript error and then we come back and we start using the props object inside of our card component. So the first one, the color, we'll simply use a simple and here this we can actually pass just a string, a hashtag F00. And for the is flipped, we will use one of them is going to be true and the other one is going to be false. Now, 
Traditionally in HTML elements, you can simply add the is flipped like so, and then this will this will be taken as being set to true. But if we remove this actually, this TypeScript error is going to pop up again. So one way that we can simply be clear about which value we set is to just use the Boolean, right? So is flipped is set to true here. This is also necessary whenever we are using a variable to host the value of this attribute, the value of this prop. So I do find that it's easier to actually represent it like this. And of course, later on, we're gonna use variables. We're not gonna hard code the value here. So this will make the transition a little bit easier. We we can also create another card here and set this is flipped to false and maybe use 0f0 here just to differentiate the color. Once we save this, we'll see that there are no changes on the screen. However, the cards are actually stacked on top of each other. And ideally here, we would like to have them side by side. So let's add a couple of CSS styles to our wrapper div here to make sure that they get displayed nicely next to each other. We will do that in the next video. So let's take a quick break and continue in the next lecture. Let's now create the CSS style here to the wrapper div component, which will then allow us to align the card components much better. Again, class name, and here we will simply say that is going to be a row div. And that's again convention. I'm just gonna say this represents a row of cards. And now here in the app.css, we can create a new row class and start defining its style. For us to make the cards appear next to each other, we just simply need to set the display to flex here. And one important element is to set the flex, flex wrap to wrap. And this will make sure that whenever we have more cards than the width of the, of, of the horizontal width here, then this will wrap to the next line. Now you can see here that the cards are already displaying next to each other, but Actually, they don't really have um, any, any margin or anything here. So we can simply add a margin of, I don't know, one REM here. And let's see how this will display. display. Oh, that's looking much better. So we're gonna leave it like this for now. However, if we come back to the app.tsx file, we see that we have cards with different properties and the same behavior. And this is not really the best pattern to follow because it should be clear that whenever we have different values for our props, the behavior of our components is different. So let's now codify this behavior to use the color and to use the is flipped property to actually determine or change the behavior of the card. In our card component, inside of the div here, we are going to use something that we already saw regarding conditional rendering in React. And we will simply use the props.isFlipped to determine what we're gonna show on the screen. So if the props.isFlipped is true, then we're gonna return something, otherwise we're gonna return something else. And that should be a parenthesis rather than curly brackets, like so. So now here we could simply say, um, this is going to be a div which will indicate is flipped. And this here is going to be a div which will say that it's not flipped. All right, so once I have this and then here is not flipped and then I go back to the browser, then we will see that the first one, because it has the is flipped property set to true, it's displaying the text is flipped. And the second one, because it has the is flipped property to false, it's displaying the text is not flipped. That's a great start, but now we can actually change it, advance a little bit more the component to make sure that it renders either the color if it is flipped or if it is not flipped, it renders a nice React logo just to show that the card is not turned upside down. So once again here, I come back to our to our parenthesis and then here I also come back to our parenthesis and that's just complaining because there is nothing inside here. So we're gonna change that in a little bit. Here, I would like to then render a div which is going to have a class name and we're gonna implement this class names in a little bit. This div is going to have a width of 100 as well as a height of 100 and it's going to have a style. And this style here is a way that we can use to directly set some CSS styles without using classes or without setting an ID to the div. And this I'm using here because the style that I'm going to set depends on the props. 
As you may imagine, I want to use the color that is received by the card to determine the background color. So here, if we start typing, we already see that there is a lot of properties and all these are actually the equivalent of the CSS properties, except that they use camel case here. So once we set the background color to be props.color and we save this, now we will see that our component and here I apologize because I didn't change the text, so it should be is flipped. We will see that our component now contains the color that we receive via props. You may be wondering why the background color is just so contained to the text, and that's because we haven't yet implemented the W100 and H100 classes. That's exactly what we're gonna do now. And they can be, th this is another pattern, right? So here, my, my purpose is to show you different patterns that you can use in your code base. The first pattern that I showed you was to simply create a class that represents a certain entity in your code. So for example, the dot card here contains all the styles which are required by the card component. Now the other pattern that we are using here is to rather than create a, a class to a certain entity, to a certain element or to a certain component, we are creating multiple individual classes which have a single responsibility. In this case, the first one is going to set the width of our of our element to which uses this class to 100% and the height is gonna set the height to 100% and that's the only thing that these two classes are going to do and by combining them as a result here I will get a card or rather I will get a div which has a background color that is then going to cover the whole width and the whole height. Here very simple the width to be 100 we just need to say width is going to be a hundred percent and the height again is going to be a hundred percent and here once again these are different patterns so which one it's the most applicable or, or the, the most recommended for a certain use case it really varies from use case to use case however i do tend to prefer this modular approach and there is a very very a well-known library and very recommended it's called tailwind css they use this and they allow you to or as a result you can customize your components by combining different modular and and quote-unquote atomic classes so i do find that this is easier to work with if you have large projects because otherwise you would have a lot of individual classes and you may end up creating for example one class for the card component but then somewhere else you need a slight variation and you cannot change it here because that would impact already other parts of your code so it becomes harder to maintain all these individual element classes here or component classes as your application grows and then you may see yourself finding it much easier to work with modular modular css classes once again for our project here my goal is to show you the two variations that's why i'll be using both of them and then it's up to you and to your team to decide which one to use when working on other projects once we save this and come back to the browser, we will see that now we have a card which is flipped and has all this nice red background here. We see that the overflow is hidden. Now we can show here what happens once I remove the overflow hidden, then our border is simply gone. And because we wanna keep the border radius, that's why we use the overflow of hidden. We can also remove the is flipped text and simply make this a self-closing div. Once we do that, then we'll see a nice red background. And we're gonna take a quick pause now and in the next video, we're gonna implement the React logo in this order card. Welcome back, I just refreshed the browser to get rid of the, all the errors we had on the right side. Once again, these errors pop up because of the auto reloading every time we make a change on the code. So don't worry too much about them. If there is something which deserves our attention or doesn't go away once you refresh the page, then that's when you need to look a little bit more closely into this. So in this video, we're gonna change this is not flipped text to simply show an image of our React logo that comes by default, shipped by default whenever we use create React app. Let's go back to the IDE here and instead of using a div, all we're going to use is an IMG, an image tag. And the image tag is a self-closing tag as anything in React that doesn't have any content, we can directly self-close this, but this is also the case in HTML. And this is one of the few cases where we have self-closing tags in HTML.
If we scroll up here, we see that we are importing the logo from a logo.svg file. If I open the files here, then I open this logo.svg. It doesn't show me the image, but this is the React logo that we are interested in using. I'm gonna take this logo and I'm gonna set it here. And now we will also set an alt text and that's, we're gonna simply call this logo. Now, setting an alt text is always uh, accessibility best practice when working with images. So I do recommend that you actually, maybe we can be better here and say React logo. So to, be, to have the text as descriptive as possible. Once we save this and come back here to the browser, we'll see a very nice React logo which displays in the middle of, of our card component. If we click on the inspector here, then we can actually see what is the size, what is being displayed here, and uh, the different CSS properties that we are actually using. Once we click here, and we actually can expand this, and then we see that the card is set up here, and we can play with the different CSS elements, right? We see that if we remove the height here, then it's gonna follow the, the React height, and this is going to be, a, to be mirrored by the component here, but we're gonna keep the height as it is. And this gives us the two different components or the two different elements that we are interested in. That's it for our card component. If you want to see how this 0F0 looks like, you can simply set this to true. And once we save this, we see that this shows a, a green color, right? So zero, 0, or rather the three letters here stand for red, green, and blue. This is RGB color. And if you see three letters, this simply means please stay uh, three numbers or letters. So that's hexadecimal uh, encoding here. This simply means uh, that each of them will be doubled, right? So this is the equivalent of using the six digits in case you are using the full hexadecimal code. Otherwise, the, the three ones here are enough to define whenever they are the same, whenever doubling them would, would give us the desired color. We are now going to start implementing the board component in our project. But before we start with it, I want to do a bit of cleanup here. So we can see that we have a card component as well as an app component under this app.tsx file. And whenever you are working with, with a React component, the tendency is that you have a lot of components because you are encouraged to create smaller, more self-contained components. And it can become quite hard to find where the component is or to avoid coupling or to avoid populating a file with too much code if we start adding our components all in the same file. So let's create a couple of files here. The first one is going to be our card.tsx. And all we're going to do here is we're gonna move the card component from our app file to our card file. Once I save this, we're gonna have a couple of errors because we need to actually import a couple of things here. I'm gonna copy the import line I'm gonna put it here. And now we also need to move the type declaration to our card file because the type is used here in our card component. And the other thing we need to move is the logo, right? We also need to, to move the logo here to our, to our card.tsx file. Now, once I save this, we'll see that we still have a couple of errors because React doesn't know where, or rather JavaScript doesn't know where the card component now is defined. We are not importing it here. So what we need to do, first of all, is export the card component from here. We can export our constant as a named export if we simply add the export keyword before the const, or we can also export the whole card thing as the default export of the file. I particularly prefer to use the named export, like so, export const card, because then I also get a little nice, um, a little and very helpful type checking here when I want to implement or to import the card from card. We don't need the, the function component anymore. And once I save this, that should be enough to have our component running on the browser. So if I, if I come back here to the browser and clear the console by refreshing the page, we'll see that everything is working as expected. The next step we're going to do here is to create another file. And this file is going to be called board.tsx. And the board.tsx is gonna host our board for the game. The board is simply a collection of 
cards. What we see here now, this is what I would define as the board. So basically I'm going to copy this function here and I'm going to paste this here. We are however not going to use the function component to begin with because the board is going to store a couple of state elements and as we already saw we will start with a class component to store the state and to learn how to work with class components and later on in the course we're going to migrate the component to be a function component using hooks to store the state for us. For now we will simply create a class called app which extends here extends react.component like so. Now we need to import react from react and this will get rid of the error. Now here we cannot just return something from the class we actually need to have a render method and the render method is then going to return this for us. Once we save this we will still get an error with the card but we can quickly solve that by importing card from card. Now here in our app.tsx and rather the class here should not be app, it should be board and it's a, it's a good practice to name your main React component according to the file, right? So this just makes sure that when I read the file I know which component it refers to. It is not a bad practice to have more than one component in the same file if those components are supporting and used in this file. If those components are used throughout the application I would recommend to put them in their own files but if we have a couple of additional components here which are small helper components that's also fine. The last thing we want to do here is to simply change from returning something in the app to actually now using the board component. So all we're going to do is to return a board component. Now this can be self-closing, doesn't need to be like so. And then here we will need to export the class component as well. So we'll simply set an export here board and this will be enough for us to be able to import the board component here. So once I say import board from board that will then make sure that our, our elements or our React components and our board is displayed correctly on the screen. For now let's take a quick pause here and let's come back in the next video. Welcome back. Our board component is rendering two cards as we can see here on the screen. These two cards are hard coded here and as we can see the board component is very simple. There is no additional information, no additional variable stored inside of this board component and this is very rarely the case. It's, it's not always the case that we have a component which doesn't depend on any kind of state or internal value of variables. What we will start discussing now is how we can store state inside of class components. We will start with class components and later on in the course we're going to explore hooks and how they can be used, React hooks, to store state also in function components. This will allow us to migrate most of our class components to function components and have slightly cleaner and easier to maintain code. In this lecture I would like to show you that not every piece of variable, not, not every variable, not every piece of state that is stored inside of the class component is actually state from React's perspective. So to begin with let's suppose that we have a certain counter here and this counter is going to be a number and it's going to be initialized in the constructor. Okay, so the constructor in class components then it can simply come here and say this dot counter is equal to zero. For example, you see that we have a bunch of errors here and if we hover we will see that constructors from derived classes must contain a super call so we can simply say super like so and here inside of the super we actually need to provide an argument for props. This is a react thing and it, they, it expects simply a props component or a props parameter here. We can pass this maybe as null for example 
but this is not going to work. As you can see here, it simply says that the argument of type null is not assignable to parameter type this or this. And this is a bit confusing of a message, but the the most common way and the, the standard way of solving that is we simply pass a props here. If we are not expecting any props, we can type this as a never. If we are in TypeScript, if we are in JavaScript, we can simply remove this because JavaScript doesn't do type checking. So here we can simply say props never and then pass this props here to the super call. And in this way, then everything is going to be satisfied. Let's now suppose that we want to render this on the screen here. And if we were to come here and try to simply return a button, you see that we'll get an error because in React, we can only return a single top level element. It's possible to return, this could be an array, for example. And if we return an array here, like so, and pass a comma, then React is going to be satisfied with that. But this pattern, honestly, I find it not so clear, not so easy to understand. What is recommended here maybe is better to use a React fragment, which is represented by this empty open or less than and greater than signs here. So we can simply put something like this that will give us the, the top level component, the fragment here, and it will allow us to return also siblings. Now, the cool thing about fragments is that they are not added to the DOM tree, which means that they are not gonna deeply nest components as we need to return many siblings in different levels, for example. So when we have fragments, they are just a very nice way of allowing us to, returning to, to return more than one top level component. So let's suppose here that now we have a div and why am I doing this is simply not to put stuff inside of a div with a class name of row because that's flex and it's gonna just, things are just gonna look ugly. So I'm gonna return a div here and then the button inside of this div like so. And this button is going to be simply increment. Okay, so once I save this, then we see the button here on the top. Again, warnings here we can ignore. If we refresh, they will disappear. We have the button increment and we can click on the button. I'm just gonna add a few inline styles here just to make this a little bit easier to, to see. The margin is going to be, maybe let's keep the same margin as we have for our card component. The margin here is one REM. So we're gonna use the same margin is going to be one REM like so. And this is just gonna make sure that a component has some white space around it. Now that we have the component rendered, we can also render and show the value of the counter. So if we were to simply just use span or a paragraph, if you want to, we could simply say counter value colon and then interpolate this dot counter like so. Once I save this, we'll see it here. Doesn't have any, any spacing here between the two, but I think that's fine. We could also add here in our, in our button to add a margin Right, and if we say this one REM, that should also give us a bit of, of white space here, maybe 0 0.5. Anyway, we don't need to be too picky because this will disappear soon. But the point here is that we are rendering the value of the counter, right? So the counter here, this dot counter is rendering on the screen. Perfect, that works. The problem is when we want to update the value of this dot counter. If I were to then come here with the button, and like so, just to make it a bit easier to read. Then here I would say on click. And let's say that in um, on every click, I want to update the value of the counter. So we're gonna simply say this dot counter plus plus and console log this dot counter. Like so, I save this to format everything automatically. And I also want to console log here a rendering message. Right, so I just want to to render something on the screen and whenever I render, whenever the render method is executed, I then want to console log something that this is being um, re-rendered, right? So we could say like being re-rendered. Like so, once I save this and refresh the page, then we see that we have two here. The one that we are interested in is this one. And once we click on the increment, it's actually incrementing the value here. You can see that it's actually issuing the console log from line 22. And if I keep clicking, it 
keeps incrementing, which means it's saving the new value in this dot counter. This is correct, but this is not really causing a re-render of the component. This being re-rendered message is not being reprinted and the value here is not being updated. So it's very important to understand that not every piece of information, not every member variable of our class components can be used as state. And state here simply means something that we want to store, we want to be able to update, and that whenever it gets updated, it causes the component to re-render, to update, to be re-rendered in the DOM and to use the new, the updated values of that piece of information. Now that we understand that not every piece of information can be used here to, to hold and to update information in React components, let's take a short break and let's come back in the next video when we discuss how we store and how we update state in class components. Welcome back. Let's discuss how we can refactor the board component to actually use React state to store information and to update information so that the component is properly re-rendered in the DOM. The first thing that we want to remove here is to simply, or to, to refactor, is we don't want to store this information in any type of class variable. We want to store this information on what's called React state. So we we'll simply say this dot state is equal to, and the counter here is going to be zero. Now you see that we are moving the counter from this dot counter to actually being this dot state dot counter, right? So in the in in the future we will access this value or this this part of the state by saying this dot state dot counter. This will give us the value of zero. Now I'm going to remove this and I'm going to remove the comment here and later on here I will not update the counter for now. I will simply console log this.state.counter like so and here I will say this.state.counter. We are now seeing this message and if we hover over here you see that the property counter does not exist on the type read only and then an empty object here and that's because we are not passing TypeScript and, and this is a TypeScript thing, it's not a React thing. Uh, TypeScript is complaining that we are not defining how the state should look like. So if we hover over the react.component here, we will see that there are a couple of generics defined here. And the first one is the props and the second one is the state. So the props here will simply say never. We will never receive props. And for the state, we will say that this is a counter and counter is su supposed to be a number. Once we define this, then we will see that the error disappears and that here, for example, if I were to simply pass a different type of uh, a different property, right? So the counter here has a typo now. It will tell me that the object literal may only specify known properties, but count a does not exist on the type read only counter, right? So this even suggests our fix here. There is a typo and Another very interesting thing here is that if I wanted to say counter two and that's one, for example, this will also give me an error and it simply says counter two is not part of your state. So this is where um, static type checking starts to shine. I really like this feature and actually we can extract this and say this is a type and this type is going to be board state, for example and board state is going to contain a counter, which is going to be of type number. So now here we can say then board state like so. And if we want it to be 100% correct, we would also say board props and board props we would be never, right? So here we are just extracting the board props and board, board state to two type variables. This again, is TypeScript stuff. Once we compile the code and it outputs JavaScript, all this type stuff is gone, but here during development, this is very helpful. Later on, we could, for example, export these types and use it somewhere else. For example, a certain function that receives a part of the state. Anyway, I'm just here uh, digressing and thinking how we could reuse these things, best practices and also tips. But for us here, it's now just important that we know that we have defined the props, we have defined the state and all the errors are gone. Once I save this and I come back here to the screen, 
then oops you see that there is an error here and that's very interesting it's saying that this type here is not assignable to type never this was this is happening on the app.tsx file and that's interesting um, that uh, apparently the type never here is not compatible to this type one way of solving it would be to use this kind of of definition here but i personally don't like this because in typescript this has um, a very specific meaning and it can be tricky to do type checking with this um, a more robust solution is to simply use the unknown keyword and the unknown keyword in typescript is simply saying look i don't know how the props are going to look like so don't make any assumptions about it basically just assume that any property doesn't exist we cannot make any any check with certainty regarding the shape of our props then once we do that here, we see that the error is gone. The component is rendered again on the screen. Now, if I were to come back here and if I were to simply then evaluate the console log by clicking on the button, then you will see that it's going to render zero. Always is going to render zero because we are not incrementing it. Before incrementing it, I would like to just make one adjustment or rather let's, let's try to move gradually before incrementing the state by using the previous the, the the previous value of the state let's simply set the state to a certain random variable so we will say this dot and this is the important part we say this dot set state and then here we will pass the state that we want to set we'll say counter and counter here we could say math dot random for example so there's just going to be some random number and now the important part here this line this line here console log is not guaranteed to execute with the new value of our state this is extremely important and it, it like it, <laughs> it's hard for me to highlight how important this is because so many developers fall into this trap they make an update on the state and they assume that the next line is going to have the updated value this may be the case but this hardly ever is or or this doesn't really hold always. So let's see if that holds here. I'm just gonna press on the increment here and you will see that we are actually rendering the previous value. So always rendering the previous value. That's gonna be 0 0.1506 and that's gonna be 0 0.1506. However, the console log line is on the code after the state update and this is again very important you should never assume that after the call that this state update is synchronous this means this simply means that the on click function of our component here should be responsible for only updating the state but never working with the updated value directly after calling this dot set state maybe this is twisting a little bit our brains let's remove the console log here to keep it as simple as possible so basically i have a line being re-rendered and then here inside of the button component i want to update the value of our counter inside of our state our direct or perhaps our initial assumption is that we could simply say something like this this dot state dot counter is equal to math dot random but thankfully TypeScript is not going to let us do that because this it's, it's going to tell us that counter is a read only property. So TypeScript already prevents us from doing this and that's very good because this is not how React expects us to update state. This is bad practice, you should never do that. So the way that we update state is by issuing or by calling the method this.setState. The setState method is not declared anywhere here. It is inherited from the supper class react.component. This setState method, it can receive any piece of state and it will then update the state to the value that we pass here to that piece of state so if you want to update the counter then we should pass an object with counter and the new value of counter once we do that once this this dot set state line is executed then we will see here that the value of the counter is updated and once the value of the counter is updated we then re-execute we re-render the component that means our render method is re-executed and we will see that the counter value is then updated to the new value of our state. 
All right, we have talked about a lot of concepts, a lot of important elements of managing state in class components. Let's take a quick break for now and let's come back in the next lecture. Welcome back. In this video, we will see which changes are necessary to our set state function so that we can safely update the value of the counter based on the previous value of the counter state. We already know that set state updates the state asynchronously, which means that we cannot rely on the new value on, on the next lines of code here. And that means that we also cannot rely or it is not safe to assume that we can just reference this dot state dot counter here, for example. Maybe, maybe this will work, maybe it will not. And this kind of flaky behavior, it's the worst <laughs> when we are debugging. So React provides us a very nice way to, to update the state based on, on the previous value of the state in a safe way. And this is by instead of passing or instead of directly referencing the state here by using a function, by passing a function to the set state method. This function has the following signature. It receives the previous state, so it receives the previous state as a parameter. And then here it needs to return the new state. So it needs to return new state. Okay, I'm just simply writing it here because it is not that easy to express the return value of, of a function um, like so, but here we could simply say that the new state should then be board state, right? So the, the basically this would be the signature of this function. The, the, the function receives the previous state and then it should return again a board state. Whether this board state is going to be updated or not, it doesn't matter. React doesn't care. It only requires us to also return a valid board state. So let's try to implement that. We're going to have here the previous state. And now we could actually then add this as a body here and we will say that we'll simply we want to console log the previous state just for us to see what's happening and then here we want to return an object where the counter is going to be the previous state previous state dot counter plus one and it's important for us here to use plus one because plus plus does a reassignment as well and we will see that then we get a message saying that we cannot assign to counter because it is a read-only property okay this is again safety from react side and from typescript to prevent us from assigning directly to to the state so here we need to say previous state dot counter plus one once we save this and we come back here to the screen i'm just going to refresh it and then we press the increment, we will see that now this is the previous state, again, coming from the board here, and the value is updated on the screen. Once we click increment again, then we see that the previous value is printed, and once we click, then we would just simply see, again, this is incrementing the counter, this is incrementing the piece of state based on the previous piece of state. These are then the, the two patterns really, like the first pattern is the pattern where we simply have this dot state and we pass directly the new state, so this dot set state, right? This dot set state and we pass directly the new state that we would like to increment or that we would like to set. And the second pattern is when we have some dependency on the previous value of the state and then we need to pass a function to make sure that we make this update safely. Just out of curiosity, let's see what's going to happen when we place these two lines here. I'm curious about the previous state here. Let's see. So now I'm going to refresh the page and once I click on increment, then you will see that these two lines are actually executed one after the other properly. So React is prob probably or correctly batching these updates and this is basically one of the ways that React combines all the updates together within a single re-rendering. You see that we actually have here, we have re-rendered it only once, right? We have performed two states or two state updates, but we have re-rendered the component, we have updated the DOM only once. We have not executed the render method twice, even though we have updated the state twice. This is because React combines these updates 
and it properly it, it knows it uh, recognizes that it needs to bring these two updates together this is another very important piece of information because it also helps us to reason about state updates if we issue multiple multiple statements to update the state it may be the case that they will all get combined and then if we have dependencies between them they they may not hold in this combined version of the state update so again try to keep it simple try to keep it modular keep it atomic whenever we are updating the state it shouldn't be a very complex operation it should be easy to reason about because if there are any issues then they are also easy to debug if there are lots of dependencies and we are referencing variables and and pieces of information from all over the place then it becomes extremely hard to debug especially knowing that this set state method updates the state asynchronously behind the scenes in react so it may not be very easy to follow by just going through the the calls to the set state method that's it for now on the discussion of state we have used a temporary component here we can just remove all that we can also remove our fragment because now we will go back to returning a top level component which is our div we do not use state anymore so we can just remove the state here the constructor becomes obsolete because if it is just executing a call to the to the parent or to the superclass constructor then we can just remove it then again our board props and our board state become here obsolete for the sake of leaving it here because we will use in the future of our project I'll just simply say the board props will be unknown the board state will be unknown I'll pass them here and react is going to be happy as is we also don't need the being re-rendered for now once I save this then everything is out we are back to that previous state when we are just rendering two cards on the screen for now let's take a short break and let's come back in the next video Let's spend a couple of moments to understand the state visibility in React. In other words, which components can see the state of which other components? So if we were to take this question, which components can see component A's state? We have a component A here, and then as two child components, component B and component C. The question here is, can component B and component C directly see the state of component A? or that is not possible in React? The answer here is that by default, no other component can see A's state. As soon as we declare the state to a certain component or inside of a certain component, the state is scoped and visible only to that component. If we want to make the state visible to component B or component C, we need to actively pass it down via props this is how it looks like so we would have a component b component b would be declared inside of component a a child component of component a and let's say that b receives a certain prop which is called items maybe component b is an item list and it renders these items on the screen and here we are then passing a piece of state from the parent component this would be the component a's state and the piece of state that we are making visible to component B is the this.state.tasks. This allows component B to see A's state, but it still leaves one very important question unanswered. And the question is, what happens if component B needs to modify component A's state? What happens if by any chance component B needs, let's say once the user clicks on a certain row, rendering a certain item, uh, then component B would like to mark that item as highlighted or it would like to maybe complete that item if it is a, if it is a tasks list. It is bad practice, it's not recommended to directly modify the state variable, so this would be incorrect to simply take the items prop here and then modify it directly. Rather, it is much more recommended to pass functions down also as props to the component B, so that this function here can then be called from within the component B whenever the item is clicked, for example, and then this function here, which is passed down via props, will be executed in the context of component A. So this is important to highlight. So this function here is coming from component A. 
right? So here, um, this is inside of component A's scope. It's not inside of component B. The only thing that component B is going to do is it's going to take this on item clicked function and then inside of component B, it would say this dot on item clicked and then it would simply pass the index to this function. It's important to highlight that this function here is expecting an index and then it's executing another function that is defined in component A. This is a very good pattern to keep component B completely independent from component A. If we visualize component B as being a list item, um, a list of items, for example, then we can see here that component B has a generic interface. It has an interface that receives any types of items, and it has a function which is going to be executed when we click on an item. Now, what the exact behavior or of clicking on an item is, it actually depends on the parent component which is passing down the list of items. Maybe here we have tasks, but in another scenario it could be a list of employees and maybe the component or rather the behavior when clicking on an item is not going to be to complete the task, but it's going to be maybe to open a model with the details of the employee. Having such a general interface which is not bound to any behavior or to any specific behavior is very good practice to keep your code modular and also encapsulated. It's, it's best to simply define generic interfaces which completely abstract the behavior of component B and then make this component very general to be used in any case or in virtually any case where we need to read to, to render a list of items. This is how we can communicate state and alter, also modify state from component, from parent components. Here, the component A is the parent component down to child components. Here is the component B. So by passing the state via props and also by passing functions via props, which allow the child components to then have access or virtually to modify the state of the parent component without having to directly modify the this.state value. Variable. One last comment here is that we are passing in the items both here and here we are passing only a piece of the state. You see that we are not passing the whole this.state object. We are passing a specific part of it, the tasks part of it. And this is also good practice. We shouldn't really pass the whole state down via props from a parent to a child component because this increases the surface for coupling. It's always better to pass just as little state as you need from the parent to the child component so that the child component can function properly. Now that we know how we can communicate state between different components, let's take a quick break and come back in the next video. We have already discussed how we can pass a certain state from a parent component to a child component, but we haven't discussed yet how component B can access state from component C. This comes often when implementing components in React and as your React application evolves, it may turn out that a certain state, which is here nested under component C, needs to be accessed by component B. Now, it is fine to pass props from parent components to child components, but it is not fine, it is not possible to pass props from a sibling component to another sibling component. This pattern just doesn't work in React. It has to be from a parent to a child component. How can we solve that? And in React, uh, normally one of, one of the more common adopted solutions is what we call lifting up state. So when a component needs to access, let's say component B needed to access this, this state of component C, um, then what is often done, not always, but one of the patterns is that we remove the state from component C and we actually relocate this state to the parent component or rather to the most to, to the closest common parent component here so that it can then be passed down via props to both of the components to both b as well as to component c this pattern then allows the component b to also have access to this piece of state while also keeping the piece of state available to component c very important to highlight that in the previous slide, in this slide, we are talking about a single depth level. So basically we have component C state here directly under component C. And it's easy to make this kind of quote unquote state surgery where we take the state from component C, we relocate 
to the parent component A, and then we just need here inside of component C, instead of referencing this dot state, we just need to reference this dot props and then pass down all the elements for the state that we need that were previously that were previ previously stored here. Now, this is one single depth level, and it may happen that as the application evolves, component B actually needs to access certain state, which is very nested. It is nested in a lot of components, child components of component C. And in this case, this state lifting can lead to lots of confusion when maintaining component A, because it also holds, so component A ends up holding state that is completely unrelated to its original functionality. Basically, component A has to hold state of a certain deeply nested component from component C just because component B needs access to this piece of state. So in these cases, I would then recommend that we should either revisit and improve the component hierarchy, maybe there is a better way of distributing and structuring the components, or we could move this deeply nested state to a shared state store. And this shared state store could then be shared throughout all the components, independent of the depth of the components, throughout all the components that are children of component A, for example. And then this shared state store could then be accessed by both this nested component here, as well as by component B. We will talk about this and one, one pattern or one solution in React, which is called React Context, and it offers a simple API for implementing such a shared state pattern. This will be covered in detail later on in the course. For now, let's take a quick break and let's come back in the next video. Welcome back. Let's spend a couple of videos discussing events in React and some of the best practices in defining and handling events. Events in React are very similar to those in HTML, and here we can define an event in a certain React element by passing it as an attribute. A very common example is the onClick event. If we want to execute something whenever we click on this div here, we can pass an onClick event, and the onClick event receives as its first parameter an event, and this is a React synthetic event. We can explore this a little bit more soon, and then we can execute something here. We have already seen this when we use the counter, when we used an event on click on the button to update the counter. Once we save this and then we come back here to the screen and we click on the card, then we see clicked logged in the console. Events are a very important part of your application. They will be the things that will actually make it dynamic. And here we're just printing a message on the console, but later on we're gonna add some actual behavior whenever we are clicking on the card. And as you can see, the logic is quite straightforward. We simply define the event and then we pass a function, an event handler here that is going to be executed every time this specific event is fired. You can see that there are a few differences to HTML. So first of all, we pass a function, an actual function here. And the second one is that we use camel case. We don't use the traditional on click prop like so, or rather on click like so. This, this is not used in React. So React, because again, this is not HTML, this is JSX, then we have to follow this convention. I have mentioned that the first parameter here is a React synthetic event. And if we were to actually try to see how this event looks like, we can wrap this around curly brackets just so that we can use the E in here. And then you see that we have a lot of different properties here. A very interesting one is the target one because the target property contains the wrapper element that was actually clicked. If this is an input, for example, then this would have the value, right? So you could call, for example, you could retrieve the value of that input via e.target.value, or if it is a checkbox, you could say e.target.checked. So the e.target attribute or the property here is very important, very relevant whenever you are working with the element and whenever there is some value from within the element that you want to retrieve. One very common pattern in React is for child components to receive a certain function from parent components and to execute this function either whenever a component is clicked or whenever a component is hovered on mouse enter, on mouse leave. And this is what we will implement now. So instead of defining the function here, we will receive this function via props. How do we do that? Well, the first thing we need to look into the props of our component and we need to expand the props here. We need to define an on click 
and this click is going to be a function. Now, if we did not define on click, then let's comment out this line here. And we were to come here and try to pass an on click function to our card component. Doesn't matter if it is a super simple function, like so, for example, it is not accepted. And this is because the card component here, our child component, only accepts the props that are explicitly defined in this type props. This was not necessary for this div component here because this is an intrinsic component and it has all these events already declared. If we are defining custom components, which is the case with card, then we need to include them here or we need to go fetch some native type from React and then extend the card props with that type here. Since we want to be very explicit about which actions are necessary or mandatory for our card props, then we will define the onClick function here. And this function should then be passed from the parent component. Once we define this, we'll see that the first card, it the error goes away because we have the onClick function. But the second card here, it starts showing an error and that's because the on click is missing but it is required in the type card props. Let's then pass here a console log and we'll say clicked on card one and we will pass a similar function here and we'll say clicked on card two. Now executing this function from the child component is pretty much the same as we have done so far when we were accessing other properties or other props. We simply need to come here on the on click and we'll say props dot on click like so and if we declare it like this then the reference of the function is going to be passed here to the on click and once we save this and come back to the browser we'll refresh it then we will see that it will execute correctly the function that is passed from the parent component another possibility is to simply declare an arrow function here and then call the function props dot on click like so when we save this this will ex this will work exactly the same one important aspect to notice here is that whenever we are declaring the on click function here in our type card props, we are defining its signature, which means that it does not execute or it, it is not executed with any parameters and it doesn't return anything. If we were to try to execute this function with, for example, our event from React, we're going to get an error because our signature expects zero arguments. If we want to expect something here in our signature, then we should include maybe this would be some um, value, for example, and this could be a string, right? And this is not going to work here because this is a, a React mouse event. But if we were to simply switch this to a string, then everything is good. Since we are not interested in executing this with any string for now, we will simply remove this. We can actually just pass the reference here and we can also remove this like so. So once we do that, then all the errors are gone and we come back here. We just make sure that everything is working fine. Let's take a quick break and let's come back in the next video. Welcome back. Now I want to talk about a very specific topic, which is handling events in class components in React. If you're more familiar with JavaScript, you know that the this keyword can be very tricky to work with. And the purpose of this video is to explain how we can deal with it whenever we are using methods inside of class components in React. So let's just start with a dummy value here. And this is again just for demonstration purposes. We'll clean this up at the end of the video. And we'll simply have two keys or one key with a certain value, hello world. And now we have a function which accesses this. So let's say print value, which accesses this dummy value here. And this function is going to simply console log the dummy value or this dot dummy value dot hello. Once we have this, we could actually call this function inside of our on click. So a tendency could be that we simply want to pass this dot print value like so by reference. And then this gets passed to the on click of our card and it gets executed inside whenever we are clicking here on the div. Now, the problem is that this is not going to work because the meaning of the keyword this is going to be undefined whenever we are passing it by reference like so. Once we save the file and we come back to the browser, we can see that the second card works fine because here we are passing an arrow function, but the first card 
actually starts to throw an error. Whenever we click on it, we see an error on the console. And that's because it simply says again, cannot read properties of undefined. And it's trying to read the dummy value property. That is because the, this keyword here assumes a value of undefined. If I were to console log this, right? So like so, and save this, refresh this. And once I click on it, you see that it's printed as undefined. Working with the, this keyword is very tricky in JavaScript. I mean, of course it follows well-defined rules, but there are many rules that we need to keep in mind. So this is also one of the reasons why function components are easier to work with because we don't need to worry that much about the meaning of the this keyword whenever we are working with class components. One way of fixing this is by simply, instead of passing by reference, we simply pass an arrow function. So if we were to pass an arrow function like so, because the arrow function does not change the semantic value, value of the this keyword, then this is going to work as expected. We're gonna get the world string here printed on the console. This is a very clean method and personally I find this one the best one. But what you will also see very common in React is you will see that we have a constructor or we can come across, like you can come across uh, some code bases where you have a constructor with the board props. And here we need to call a super keyword. And then you'll see something like this. We'll see this dot print value is equal to this dot print value dot bind this. And this is a common pattern, perhaps in older code bases, where all this is doing is simply reassigning this method here, the this dot print value, to another method or the equivalent of this print value, but then we are binding the, the this keyword here inside of this print value to the actual class or to the actual instance of the class that we are working with. Once we do that, then we don't need to pass the arrow function anymore. If we were to remove this and save the code, come back here, refresh it, we are going to see the word world printed on the console. Personally, I find this solution here very tricky because if we forget to bind something, let's just revert a few things. We can actually just remove the constructor here. If by any chance we forget to bind something, there is no error in our, in our code. Basically, there is no error at the compile time. The error happens only in runtime. And this can be a very common source of bugs that are not discovered during static analysis or during compilation, but that end up breaking something in the web applications. My suggestion is whenever working with class components, try to stick as much as possible to arrow functions. They were created exactly for this purpose to actually behave like proper functions and they don't have the problems here or they don't change the meaning of the keyword this. So if you use an arrow function here, the keyword this inside of this function declaration will refer to the instance of the class that you are working with. It's not gonna change to undefined or to anything else. That being said, let's do a bit of cleanup here. We're gonna come back to the old value here clicked on card one and we can just remove everything that we have added for this demonstration video. And let's take a quick pause and let's come back in the next lecture. Let's have a quick look at how we have defined our props. Here in our card props, we have defined a function called onClick. And then here on our intrinsic element, the div element, we have passed this props.onClick to the onClick function. It is very common, and you will come across this very often, that we find this kind of mirror names, right? So if here, because of the, the event on the div is on click, then we are also defining our props as being called on click. From my perspective, this is a bad practice, or at least directly mirroring the name without really asking ourselves, does this really reflect the interface of my component? And what do I mean by interface? Well, interface is a very common concept in programming and it simply means us abstracting some of the internal behavior of our card component behind a more stable set of information and of properties that we require from the external world. Our card props here are simply saying, look, please provide me a color, provide me an is flipped value, which is a Boolean, and provide me a function that is called onClick, and I'm gonna execute this function 
whenever the card is clicked or wherever this is going to be defined within the card. This abstracts the internal behavior of the card of handling the is flipped and also positioning the on click function. Here, if the card were to move this on click function from the overall, the, the wrapper component here to inside to our, let's say to our React logo. For example, let's say that we wanted to, to simply move it here. We're going to save this and now back on our application, we will see that something is going to happen only when we click on the logo. If we have no logo, then nothing happens. Now the behavior has changed, but the interface has remained stable. We didn't have to change anything here from our or within our board component, which is using the card component. This is desirable meaning that we want to we want to be able to manage the card component without having to change all the places where it is used however this can also lead to confusion if how if the way that we define the interfaces is not clear here i have removed and returned the on click function to the wrapper component this is where we want it to be but now let's think about the name on click our intuition was to simply mirror the name of the on click prop here from our div intrinsic component but but this doesn't really reflect the behavior here what we are interested in or rather what the card is really interested in requiring from the external world is a callback function to be executed whenever that card is flipped and now here it comes a very small but very significant change which we are simply decoupling our interface here the on the the card props we are decoupling it from our internal implementation before we were just we were just mirroring the name and this was making the interface less straightforward. It was adding confusion regarding where that on click function was placed. But now once we do the on flip function, then we actually need to then change here because we have changed our props. But now it becomes very straightforward that this function here is going to be executed whenever the card is flipped. It doesn't matter if that comes via a hover on the card or if that comes via a click on the card. So here I could be on click or I could say on mouse enter, for example. And now this is going to be because I'm not using the on click here anymore. It's not going to be confusing, right? If we, we if we had an on click here in the name of our props and we wanted to change the trigger to actually being the mouse, the, the mouse entering, this would start being very confusing. We would have on mouse enter equals to props dot on click. And that doesn't really make sense from from a logic perspective. Now, if we were to simply come back here, we'll have the message printed on the console here whenever we are hovering over the cards. And let's fix now the message just to, because that's not, not um, correctly written, but card one flipped, for example. And then we'll say card two flipped as well. Right, so now here what happens is we have an, a we have a stable interface, which simply says whenever this card is flipped, whenever the behavior whenever the action the event of flipping happens this function is going to be executed now how this flipping happens doesn't matter to the external component we don't care about it here we know that and we want to go back to on click we want to trigger this function whenever we click on the card so for refresh now we see here that card two was flipped and then card one was flipped we want to keep the on click here, but this is not reflected in our interface anymore. Now we have added a layer of abstraction here, which makes reasoning about the component easier because we know which exact event is going to trigger this function. And it also makes maintaining the component less or more straightforward because the component is less coupled or rather because the components which use this card component are less coupled to the internal implementation of our card. This type of reasoning is not specific to React. This is about best practices for software development in general. It's, it's this idea of decoupling, of encapsulation, of abstraction. And I really recommend that whenever you are developing your code, you keep an eye open for these opportunities to improve the code quality. This also helps with maintainability and with keeping your code base clean and easy to work with. Let's take a quick pause and let's come back in the next video. 
Welcome back. In this video, we start exploring how we can add state to our board component so that we can track which cards are flipped and which cards are not. At the moment, we have it hard coded here and that's definitely not how it will look like in the end. So let's start working towards adding some dynamic state and also some functions to update this state. At the moment, we have two information, two pieces of information here in the card, which are important for us, the color and the is flipped property. So let's start by defining how our board state is going to look like. Our board state is going to have a certain, it's going to be an object. And this object is going to contain one property. This property is going to be a property called cards. And this cards here is simply going to be an array. And this array for the moment, we're going to say it's an, an array of a shape unknown. We don't know which kind of objects are going to be here, but we're going to define them right now. So here inside, we can say type card. And the card here, you can see that it's going to conflict here with the with the card that is imported. So we're going to say board card for now. Later on, we can change that. We can do some refactoring on the on the type names and even maybe move that to the card.tsx file. But for now, let's keep it simple. Let's try to make everything in the board file. So we know that our board card has a color and this color is a string and it also has a is flipped property, right? So is flipped like so, and this is a Boolean. Now we're going to try to represent, we're gonna just try to keep the same behavior, but without hard coding the values of our cards here or the values of the props of the cards in our board component. So we know that our board card contains a color and a is flipped. And here we can simply say that this is going to be of a board card like so. Now. One way for us, or actually the easiest way for us to add a state is to simply inside of the constructor and not the easiest, but actually the correct way to add it is to initialize it inside of our constructor. So simply say this dot state is equal to, and it requires, and here, if I don't add anything, you will see that it starts complaining because the property cards is missing in this empty object type and this property cards is coming because we are passing the state the board state here as the second element or the second generic type to react dot component and then it is inferring because we are passing this board state which has this certain shape here the cards which is an array it is saying please provide me an array of cards so here we'll simply provide an empty array of cards like so and here in the props, we can define this as board props. For example, that is enough. And this will continue to work as expected. Inside of our board component, our state.cards, now we can start adding our objects. The first object will correspond to the first card here. And we'll simply say this is a color. And this color is going to be the color that we have here. And then we have is flipped. And the is flipped is, will be set to true. And the second element is going to be like so the second element is going to be our second color and is flipped is set to false and now we actually have the exact same information that we have here so we have this first card and then the second card and we can then use our state this dot state here to actually render these two cards on the screen so if we were to come here and say this dot state dot cards and the first card like so dot color and then here we can do the same this dot state dot cards and then the first card dot is flipped and then we can actually do the same thing for the second card if we were to copy paste this here now all we are doing is we are accessing the state object the cards array inside of the state object and then the respective properties now we can see here that we are starting to see a pattern right here we are simply changing or the only thing that we are changing between these two cards is the index which means that perhaps we could use some list functions some array functions in javascript to render these cards without having to actually explicitly add them to the code, but rather iterate over a certain array, an array of cards, and then render each one of them accordingly. We will do that in a later video. For now, let's focus on building our state and making it work with our current setup. Once I save this and I return to, to, the, to the browser here, we will see that the same behavior is as before. We are rendering the first card here, uh, has the red color and it is flipped. And the second one has 
the green color and it's not flipped. Let's now try to define a small function here that we will call whenever we are flipping a card in each of these two cards. So now we have a simple function that prints something on the console, but we would actually like to have another function which would be flip card, for example. And this flip card can actually be a function which receives a certain card ID, for example. But for now, let's again keep it, or actually, I think it's better if we receive the, the card index like so, and the card index can be a number. And then based on this card index, we will then change our state here accordingly. Before we populate, or actually to be able to populate the flip card, the, the body of the flip card function, I want to digress a little bit to discuss one of the very important properties of the React state. And that is the assumption that this state object is immutable. That means once it is set via the this.set state, it is not modified. And also it is not modified after being initialized here. Now, what do I mean by that? Does it mean that we cannot modify state at all? No, it simply means that we should not directly modify this object or any of the properties of this object. If we were to come here and simply say this.state.cards and then here pass the card index and then simply say that is flipped here, for example, is set to true or to false, then we will see that we start getting a, a, a little error here. And this is an error that's coming from linting. And it indicates that we should not mutate state directly. So if we were to ever fall into this trap, we would get this very helpful error message here or rather warning message here. And this comes because the create react app already includes linting but this points to us violating one of the fundamental assumptions of of react and how we should manage state so this is a no-go for us we are not going to adopt this strategy so let's discuss how we can modify an object on immutable state Let's assume we have an array of seven objects or rather eight objects and we want to modify modify the third one, the one with um, an index of two. Perhaps the first intuition that we would have that was the one that we presented in the IDE is to define a function here which will then simply access the, the cards via the card index and then it would set them to a new value. As we have seen, this is not really encouraged and it should be avoided at all times because React once again assumes immutability of state once that state is set here or once it is updated with the set state function. The other possibility and the correct one is for us to actually call this set state function. And then here we are passing a function as we saw this allows us to access the state from the previous or rather the previous state here. So now we can use set state and we can return the new cards here. And these cards are going to be a new array. And this array is then going to contain and the first part here. It simply contains the elements that come before the index that we don't want to modify. Then the second part of this array here contains the new element. This is going to be the modified third element with the array of with the index of two. And then the third part here, which will also fill in the IDE, will contain the rest of the element. So basically what we are doing here is we are splitting this array into to three elements or rather three sub arrays. The first one contains all the elements that come before the element we want to modify and these we are just copying. This is what this spread operator is doing. We're also copying all the elements that come after the element we want to modify and this will come here later on. We'll see how this looks like in the IDE. And finally we are then here inside of this array in the third in in the third position in the second index we are then creating a new object that is going to again have the same shape that is flipped and the color properties but it's going to contain new values now that we understand this let's go back to the ide and let's implement all this this.set state function we now know that we want to call the this.setState and the setState here will receive a function. Actually, we could directly pass the new object that we want to set here with cards, for example. But since we need to access state still because we need to get the previous array of cards, 
then it is best practice. It is actually very much recommended to pass a function here so that we can access the previous value of the state. If we hover over here and we will see that previous is a read only board state. So now here we can simply return and now here we need to return the new state that is going to be an object. The object is going to contain a cards key and then this cards key is going to be an array and we will as discussed already spread the first here prev dot cards dot and here we will slice it and we oops we will simply slice this and we will say that this is going to be from zero up to card index now it's important to highlight here that the um, the slice method it includes the first index or rather it will start at zero but it will not include the element at card index so if card index here is two for example this will simply return elements zero and one now the second element that we want to pass here is the new card and the new card is simply going to be or is going to be an object of the shape is flipped and color like so and the color here is going to be again prepped cards at the position card index dot color right so I'm just copying basically copying this from the previous previous array to the new property or to the property of the new object and then the is flipped here the only difference is that I just want to toggle this value so I'm going to say is flipped here and all I'm going to do is I'm just going to toggle this value so if it was not flipped it will become flipped and if it was flipped it will not be flipped anymore once I save this just to to make sure that it looks a little bit better we can now populate the third part and this is going to be previews.cards.slice like so and it will start not at card index but it will start at card index plus one remember that whenever we are modifying a certain object or a certain element in a certain index of an array whenever we are slicing the 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 after the part that comes after that element we start on that element index plus one here for example if we are modifying the element with an index of two we are starting at the index three right so just keep that in mind this is helpful whenever you are working with this pattern here then we start at card index plus one and then we go all the way until previous.cards.length right so basically here if we have 10 then we're going to go until theoretically a length of 10 but since the length itself or rather the the last element here is not included then we will just go up to the index of nine let's now save this and let's see if that is going to work properly on our browser i'm just going to come back here and now we don't have the the console log anymore so if we were to simply reset or refresh this page now we can click on the cards and as you can see whenever we click on them it doesn't really matter where we click but we are simply we are definitely and and here very nicely flipping only the respective card now it could be the case that we want to for example do not allow to um, unflip the card right so this is a memory game which means it doesn't really make sense if you if you flip one card it should stay flipped and you should just flip another one but this small adjustments in logic so that it it is a more realistic game we're going to do more towards the end of the course once we have covered all the theoretical parts and then we focus only on the code to make sure that all the behavior is as we want let's now take a quick pause and let's come back in the next video Welcome back. Before we advance to the next topics, I want to spend a bit, just a few minutes here to, for us to address this issue of repetition here. As you can see, we have two cards which are exactly the same. They are, they have the same shape. The only difference here is that we are changing the index. Now, it is not a good practice to have this kind of code repetition on your components because if you were to change something here for example you would have to go and change in every component and it's very easy to forget a component in this sense and you can very easily introduce bugs so what we want to do here is we want to get rid of this card and we actually want to use a very nice feature of react which is the rendering of lists now here we have a list and this list is already our this.state.cards and all we have to do here is to use a traditional JavaScript function, which is called, and let's have a look here, this.state.cards, and it is the map function. Now the map function, all it does is it takes, it iterates over a certain array and it applies a certain function to this array. 
the function is going to be applied to each element. And all we have to do here, let's say we're gonna say this is a card, right? And we could say console log, for example, the card dot color, right? So this is not typically uh, the use of map. Perhaps here you would use a for each. So maybe we can actually do a little bit different. Let's say we just want to map the card and return the card color, right? So like so, and then here we want to console log this. So we will console log this information here. And here this is going to complain because the, the we cannot really pass a void expression here as a React child. So we're just gonna remove that from here and we're gonna do that on the line before above the return here. That is fine because we are not including this in our component. So once we save this and we go back to the browser, then we will see that we have all the colors here and these are the, the actual colors of the card. So basically what map is doing in this case, it is taking a card and it is returning its color, right? So this pattern here that we can, that we can already observe, it can be very useful to render lists of components. For us to render lists of components, all we have to do is instead of returning a certain string or a property of the card here, is simply to return a React element. So what we will do is inside of our div, now we will use here this dot state dot cards dot map, and then instead of returning card dot color, we will simply return our card like so. So now here we can return it like this. And once we remove this card here, we can now spend a few minutes to discuss this. So now basically what we are doing, and I know we are not using the card yet, but just for us to understand, basically we have here an array of cards, right? So this is our array of cards. We have two cards, let's say card one and two. And then what map is doing is it is taking this first element and it is making this a full react element and it is taking the second element and it's also making it a full React element and this will be rendered on the screen. Now what we want to do is we want to take the actual element here and we could even, for the sake of demonstration, we can remove that afterwards. So I'm just gonna do that, return here and then we can console log rendering, let's put it with backticks so that we can format it, rendering card with color and then we'll say card dot color. So now what we have here is we are rendering this card and the only difference that the only thing we need to change is now we can actually use the card itself like so and we can check whether the card is flipped. We don't need to add the, we, we don't need to access the original array and try to find the card by its index. However, we still need the index for the this dot flip card. So a nice feature of map is that it gives us the index here in the second element and then we can simply pass the index here. I'm going to save this and I'll go back to the browser. We will see a small error or warning from React and we will address this afterwards. I just want to show you that here we are now able to render the card with the color with the red one and then with the green one. And whenever we click, we see that the messages keep showing up here. But whenever we click, we are able to actually address the cards by their indexes and we have removed the code duplication. I mentioned that there was an error here. If I scroll up, we will still see this error. It's actually a warning and it's saying that each child in a list should have a unique key property. This is specific to React. This is not a JavaScript thing. And this is because React uses the key property. So basically key property simply means key like so the key property. React uses this key property between re-renders to do an optimization and to avoid re-rendering, re-executing components which have not changed. Or basically it also uses this to, to match the components or the elements from a previous array to a new array based on the key. If the key is the same, it means the component is stable and it should be, it doesn't need to be fully destroyed and re-rendered between re-renders. So this is again used by React behind the scenes to make some optimizations and avoid wasting computational power on doing re-rendering calculations. It is not recommended or rather 
it's not that it's not recommended, but the index should be your last resource here. Normally you should have an ID that would uniquely identify the element within the array. This is not the case for us here. We actually don't have any ID. And if we were to use the color, this later on would actually cause some problems because the, the whole point here is to have two cards with the same color, right? That means the color is not a unique property. And then we cannot just use colors here. So we cannot use a combination of color and is flipped either so there is no unique identifier for each of our elements we could add one but here for the sake of simplicity for us to really not to to waste time with something that is not adding value right now we're just going to use the index and the index is going to be fine if we save this and we refresh the page then we will see that the warning is gone once again, if you were or whenever you are working with such arrays and you have a unique stable identifier that is part of the object, then by all means use that. Only in a last scenario, as a last resort, you should use the index. That is simply because the index can also change, right? So elements can change their order, order on the array, depending maybe you delete a certain element or the array is it doesn't maintain the order between re-renders or there are some operations that change the order. So the index is not a guarantee that the element stays the same. Basically, we can have a different element on the same index in the next re-rendering. And that's why the index is not very much encouraged to be used. But here, since we know the cards are stable and they are not going to be deleted or we're not going to add any other card dynamically, then we can simply use the index for now. Last but not least, before we close the video, let's remove this console log here. We don't need this console log. And the last thing I want to show you, one of the benefits of having this pattern is that now we don't need to copy paste the card component to add a new card. We can actually just come here to our cards element on the state or to our cards array on the state. And then we can simply add a blue card here. Once we were to save this and come back to the browser, we'll see already the blue card. Once we click on it, it works just as the other. So behavior stays exactly the same. And we have added a new card just by appending a new element to our initial state. We could also have a button to add more cards if we want more cards if we wanted to. The whole point here is that we don't need to come here and copy paste. And this is also a very good advantage because depending on how you are working with your component, probably you're going to load the data via network request, via JSON object, for example. And then you want to have the possibility of setting this to a certain variable in memory and then simply using this variable to render it on the screen. This is definitely possible with this pattern and it's much easier to work with for us that are used to working with JSON objects, arrays and objects in JavaScript. That's it for this video. Let's take a quick pause and let's come back in the next one. Let's spend a couple of lectures to understand the component life cycle in React. Then we'll start with the mounting phase. The mounting phase is the first phase whenever a component is added and, and manipulated by React in the DOM. The first step is to mount that component. Mounting refers to inserting the component in the DOM tree. Whenever we mount a component, there are three things which happen. The first one is the constructor function is called. The constructor function, it will not always be there. It is needed whenever we need to start or to initialize local state, as well as to bind any event handlers so that we avoid the, um, the issues with the this keyword in class components. After the constructor, the next function to be executed is the render method. And the render method is the only required method in the class. We don't need to provide a constructor. We don't need to provide a component did mount. We don't need to provide a component will unmount, nor a component did update, nor any of the other lifecycle methods, which are more advanced methods. The only one that we need to provide and it's only required, it's always required is the render method. And the render method should either return a JSX or null. Additionally, it is always best practice to keep the render method pure. What does that mean? Pure means that the render method is not going to start any network request, is not going to save or persist anything 
outside of the component. It's not going to alter the, the state of the component. It's not going to trigger any function that can alter the state of the component. So the render method should be simply based on, on, on the current state, on the current props, and it should return predictably a certain piece of JSX or no. Once the render method completes, then the next method that will be executed whenever we are mounting is the component did mount method. The component did mount is going to be called as, as long as it is defined and it's going to be invoked directly after the component is mounted in the DOM, after the render method finishes executing. And the component did mount is the recommended place to trigger data fetching and start subscription. So let's say that we need to, to load some data inside of our component here. This would be triggered inside of the component did mount. So we would probably have a certain state variable that would say, okay, we are loading the data. Then we render here with that loading variable set or with that loading state set to true. Inside of the component did mount, we trigger the data fetching. And once the data fetching is completed, we would then change the state of loading to false, save whatever data we need to save, and then this would re-trigger the render method here because a change in state is going to re-trigger, is going to update the component. This might have been a bit too much to take in all at once, but let's then take a quick break and in the next lecture, let's discuss the updating or the re-rendering lifecycle of React components. Let's now talk about what happens when a component updates in the DOM. And here, the term updating means, or often called re-rendering, you will also hear this term quite a lot. It refers to updating a component that is already mounted in the DOM. So here we are not adding the component for the first time. The component is already there, but there were some changes in the component and the component needs to update. In fact, we will see updates happening in React always when state updates happen, when prop updates happen, when the parent re-renders for whatever reason, it can be due to, again, state updates or prop updates, or whenever we have forced updates. Now, forced updates are much less common and I would suggest to stay away from them as much as possible because they make reasoning about the application, reasoning about the components slightly harder because we're simply forcing re-renders on the screen. They basically, they don't happen naturally because normally a re-render should be a result of some change in state or some change in props in the component. But if we are forcing it due to whatever other reason, it becomes just harder to reason about it. So component updates are normally triggered by state updates, prop updates, and parent re-renders. Whenever one of these three things happen, then the component is going to go through the updating lifecycle. In the re-rendering, the first thing that's going to happen is the render method is going to be called with the updated props and the updated state in case any were updated. So if the parent re-renders but nothing in the child changes, then the child is just going to be re-rendered with the same state and props as before. But if something changed, for example, if the parent had some update and that changed the props of the child component, then the render method is going to be invoked with the updated props. After the render method is called, the component did update method is going to be called and it's invoked directly after the render method returns. So once the render method completes, then the component did update is going to be called. And it receives here, if needed, it receives the previous props and the previous state as parameters in case you want to do some operation with them. 99% of the cases this will not be necessary and maybe here inside of the component did update now one of the things that could happen is that let's say that one of the one of the props of the components a certain ID and and the component then this ID is used inside of the component did mount to fetch some data for that specific ID and let's say that the ID changes so the ID is a prop and then once that changes we want to re-trigger the data fetching API call and this re-triggering can happen then inside of the component did update once this component did update is executed then we could place it here inside of the, the the method body could place that api call that is going to then refresh the data for the new id 
that is just one example, one use case for component did update. There are others and you will come across them as you work with React components and React applications. Just keep in mind that it's best practice to place this kind of updating logic inside of component did update. Because as we discussed in, in previous lectures, the render component should be kept pure. That's it. This is the, the, the basics of updating. There are other lifecycle methods. For example, there is a lifecycle method called the should component update, which if you return false, it's going to prevent the component from updating. And this can make the component a little bit more performant by avoiding unnecessary re-renders. However, these more advanced methods, I'm not going to touch them right now because they can make the whole understanding of, of React components a little bit harder. It's just important for us to understand what happens most of the times. So what is the, let's say, quote unquote, the default flow when a React component is updating. That's what we have discussed here. There are ways that we can direct this flow. There are ways that we can we can manipulate it by using a few other more advanced um, lifecycle methods, but we're gonna skip them for now. And this is basically the overall updating flow for React components. One very important warning here, it's actually a very, a fairly common source of bugs that we execute some logic inside of component did mount, which then modifies the state. And as you can imagine here, um, modifying the state causes a re-render, an update of the component, which will eventually trigger the component did update method. If the component did update method modifies the state, then this is gonna enter more like most likely into an infinite loop and this is an error that you will if you haven't come across yet you will with a hundred percent certainty because it happens to every react developer eventually we will render or we will enter into this infinite re-rendering loop and then we need to figure out where the logic is inside of the component did update that we are actually causing a state update as well which is then re-rendering and rerunning the component did update which then updates the state again and causes another another updating loop and as the as the process goes and it evolves then you see your application is going to freeze on the screen most likely and then you will see an error in the console saying that that the rendering depth has been exceeded and and the application basically broke so that's the that's a very important warning this is very important for us to keep in mind and avoid state updates inside of component did update because this can very quickly lead to this sort of bugs. Let's take a quick break now and let's come back in the next lecture. Welcome back. Let's discuss what happens when a component is removed from the DOM. This means the component is unmounted. So the term unmounting refers to removing a component from the DOM tree. What happens when a component is removed? The first thing or the first method that is going to be executed, and actually the only method from this listed here, is the component will unmount method. The component will unmount method, it, it has this will here because it's called before the component is removed from the DOM and destroyed by React. The component's state will also be deleted after the component is removed from the DOM and the component will unmount method is the recommended place for executing cleanup work. For example, let's say that you have a certain timeout in the clock here, you could have a timeout that updates the, the clock at every minute. You set this timeout up inside of the component did mount method and then inside of the component will unmount you are going to clear this timeout. We can also cancel network requests in case they are still in progress, or maybe you have a certain web socket connection that needs to be closed before the component is unmounted. The component will unmount method is the best place to do that. There is a very common pattern in React and I wanna issue a word of caution here because if you haven't, you will definitely see such a type of pattern in React applications where we use a certain Boolean value to decide whether we are going to render one component or another component. Here, let's say that we have some part in the header component and the user component is just gonna render that, that profile picture. And if the user is not logged in, then we are going to render the login button. This pattern here, it causes 
whichever component is not rendered as a result of this of this boolean flag here this component is going to be completely removed from the DOM and the other component will be completely mounted in the DOM. This means that this will trigger all the life cycle methods and reset the state of the component whenever the component is unmounted and remounted. That means if we had some kind of persistent state inside of the user or inside of login button component that we would need to keep alternating between these two components, then this pattern cannot be used because it's going to reset the internal state of the components and will always execute all the lifecycle methods once the component is mounted in the DOM. So this is just a word of caution. This is not a bad practice to use. Okay, this is a very common pattern and you should use it for rendering conditional logic. It's, for example, if something is loading here, you can render a loader. And if it is not loading, then you can actually render a component. It's a very common, very common pattern to have and I'm not against it at all. Just be aware that this causes the component to be removed from the DOM and added again whenever the value of this Boolean flag changes. Once again, this causes all the lifecycle methods to be triggered and the state to be reset. So if you observe the component coming back to its initial state, that is because we are probably removing it from the DOM and adding it again. Time for a quick break and we'll come back in the next video. Let's spend a couple of minutes to explore how the different lifecycle methods we just explored work in class components. And let's try to visualize them here in the code. So the first method that we have discussed was the component did mount. And for us to implement any functionality here, and whenever we mount the component in the DOM, we can simply add a component did mount here component did mount and then this will allow us to do whatever logic we want to whenever the component is mounted in the DOM. So I was just added to the DOM like so. Once I save this and I come back to the browser then you see a couple of renders here and then this happens in very interesting this happens twice. This is because we have react.strict mode here. This is purely a development feature or that is used in development environments. This is not going to be the case in production environments and if we were to remove this from here come back to our browser then we will see that this will be printed only once. So the duplicated logs here are because the react.strict mode it executes everything twice to detect for example unwanted or dangerous quote unquote side effects and due to this duplicated execution which happens only in development once again just to highlight this is then printed twice in the console. I'm gonna leave it as it is printing twice nonetheless now we know that this is expected and we can confirm that our component did mount executes only once when the component is added to the DOM. Let's come back here to the browser and let's click on the cards. Here we are changing the state of our component, of our board component. Every time here we are changing, we are resetting the cards property of our state. And as you can see, by clicking here, nothing gets printed on the console. So that once again points to the fact that the component did mount method is executed only once at the beginning of the component's life cycle. Let's take a short break and let's come back in the next video. Let's now explore the component did update method. So the component did update, it receives two parameters. If we want to use them here, we could actually, actually it receives more. There is also a snapshot here, but this is normally not used. I'm just gonna remove it here and we will just play around with the component did update. So once I remove this, um, and then here we see we have the previous props and the previous state. This is relevant whenever we want to do some logic with the previous values of our props or state. Perhaps we want to do some cleanup or we want to yeah, cancel some timeouts that we had running or cancel some interval that we had running. So it's always useful to have the previous props and the previous state. Here we could say, for example, console log. I'll print every time a card flips, right? So now here 
um, we have basically this is going to be printed every time we we change the state of our component which then as we saw triggers a re-render which then runs the component did update you see that now we have here just two once again and once we click here we see that this gets printed every time our card flips every time we change the state of the component then we have this printed in the DOM we could also visualize the previous state compared with the current state and we could simply console log for example uh, we can say this dot state dot cards dot filter and we will simply say here for each card I just want to return in this case the card dot is flipped right so now here all I'm doing is I'm just saying um, there are something like this and then here we want to filter then we want to get the length so there are um, x cards fil uh, flipped right there are x cards flipped here and then here we will also say previously previously there were and then instead of using our this dot state here we can say the previous state and then we can do the exact same operation i'm gonna save this and now let's go back to the browser to visualize this behavior we are again refreshing the page and then we'll say now there are zero cards flipped previously there were one cards flipped right so again once here there are one cards flipped previously there were zero and then we'll see that now here we have the different values the current value of the state under this dot state and the previous value of the state under prev state this here can be any name that we want so this was just auto completed by by my ide here but we could say anything else so the basics or the principle of component did update is that it will run every time the state changes every time the props change the component did update method can be very useful for example if we want to execute a certain network request that depends on the value of our state if we have some user id or maybe some project id a task id that we store in our state and every time the user changes it we want to load the details of the selected task or the selected project or the selected value with that id then we can run within our component did update we can run a network request and we can then display this information so whenever we need to react to some change in our state or props component did update would be the recommended place to do it before we close the video let's just do the cleanup let's remove these two here we don't really need them for the current functionality we will just remove them from here and let's take a short break and let's come back in the next video welcome back for us to visualize the component will unmount in action let's use our card component and instead of using a function component here we will refactor this very quickly we'll undo that at the end of the video but it's a good exercise here also for us to see how to change a function component into a class component and what we'll do here is we will say class card extends react dot component where we do have a type of props which is going to be our card props and then here for our state we have something unknown because we don't really have a state in our component we instead of having the return here we need to wrap this in a render method and now here if we were to select all of it and then put around curly brackets that is going to be everything that we need now we also need to have a constructor here or rather we don't need the constructor directly but we can say this dot props here and then once we use the this dot props here and here and here then our component should actually stays the same except that we need to export this class right so once we save this and we come here to the board component we see that everything stays the same we come back to the browser we refresh to get rid of the warnings that happened due to the refactoring and our functions or rather our uh, small application is still working as expected now that we have our card component as a function or rather as a class component we could implement the component will unmount here but we don't really have anything to do right now because cards are not removed from the DOM anywhere so in our board let's add a little button here on the top 
we're going to wrap this around the React fragment so that we can return more than one uh, sibling element here. And then on the top, we're going to simply have a button. And this button is going to be remove last card. Like so. Let's see how this is going to look on the screen. We could add a little bit of styling here, but once again, since we remove all of this from our code at the end of this video, then let's not spend a lot of time here. The only thing I want to do is the on click of the button. All I want to do here, again, wrap this in curly brackets. And there are a few things here. Okay. And now I simply want to remove the last card. How do we do that? Well, very simple. This dot set state where we will have our cards to be and then here we need to access the previous state again previous and then here i can wrap this so that we return it directly and the cards are going to be previous dot cards dot slice and here we have from zero up to previous dot cards dot length minus one right so basically here all we are doing is we are just slicing it and then um up to rather the length minus one we are removing the last one if we want to be fully correct about what we are doing here we will use the spread operator to make sure we are making a shallow copy of these cards again this is um, a shallow copy that means that this is not going to to make a deep copy of the objects that we have here and this is not a fully fully immutable operation but we at least stay on the safe side regarding shallow copies since the object uh, the objective here is not to do a deep copy of the of of the of our cards property it is to visualize how we can work with the component will unmount then we're going to take this as good enough for now so if we were to come here refresh everything and then click on remove the last card then the cards will start to disappear i'm going to refresh the the browser for them to come back and inside of our cards here let's simply add a component oops inside of our class a component will unmount right like so so now here we'll simply say console log I will be removed from the DOM. An important thing here is that it the the the, the lifecycle method is about component will unmount, not did unmount, right? If we were to have a component did unmount, we we see that this doesn't exist, right? So the the only one is the will unmount, and this will be executed before the component gets removed from the DOM. Let's save this, come back to the browser, and then once we click on remove the last card, we will see that this will be printed on the screen. I will be removed from the DOM. Component will unmount is the place where we want to execute cleanup functions so that whenever we remove our component from the DOM and the component is not used anymore, it's not displayed anymore, then we don't have anything hanging, any intervals, any timeouts that we need to clean up, any hanging network requests or open socket connections. So just make sure to do the cleanup in here. Otherwise, I don't see uh, that many applications for the unmount hook. Cleaning up is definitely something that we need to keep in mind. So this is an important part of our application. Before we take a short break, let's clean up this very quick here. We just need to remove the button. And once we save this, everything is back on the screen. I'm going to leave the component wheel unmount here because in the next video, we are going to explore what happens when we conditionally render components in the DOM or rather when we conditionally render components in React. Let's take a short break and I'll see you in the next video. Welcome back. Let's have a look at what happens when we conditionally render components in React. And what I want to explore here is I want to explore what happens to our lifecycle methods. We're going to say here, we're going to have all of them. Okay, so we're going to say component did mount. And the component did mount method is going to say console log, I have been added to the DOM. And here, maybe we can also use our, our props here to at least identify the color of the card. We're going to add a new card here uh, with a different color so that we can identify what happened. So we we'll say color, and that is going to be our this.props.color. I have been, right, I have been added to the DOM. And then we will also say, um, I will be removed from the DOM. I will be removed from from the DOM, like so. Now, if we come back here to the browser, then we will see that we will actually 
have a couple of things. So these first logs here are because of our strict mode and then we should actually keep these in mind here at the bottom. So for us to actually avoid a lot of additional logs here, let's remove them from our from our um, index.tsx file, at least for now. At the end of the video, we're gonna re-add them. Once we save this, come back here, then we see only the, um, the component did mount execution. Back in our board component, let's create a new card. And this card is going to be simply a card that will be here at the bottom. Okay, so that's going to be outside of our uh, list because we want to have a bit better control over this card. It's going to have a color and the color here can be, let's say, uh, hashtag FF0 and the is flipped is going to be set to true. Okay, just like so. And then the on flip here, once again, we can, we don't need to, to have this this.flip card because this doesn't really work on, on elements which are not part of the, of the state here because here we are basically modifying the state, right? So if we want to flip this card, we would have to have a separate state that would store this Boolean value here and then we are gonna pass this Boolean value. So for us, for now, with the on flip can just be an undefined function like so. It doesn't do anything special. Once we look here on the screen, we have a card which is yellow. That's a very strong yellow color, but let's leave it as it is for now. And what we are interested in is in rendering this card conditionally. So now we're gonna add a button here as well, another button. And this button is going to have an on click function. And then this button is simply say toggle yellow card. Okay, so very simple, very straightforward. Here we have for now an undefined. And we're gonna in we're gonna add this property to our state. We're gonna add a property here which is going to be uh, show yellow card. Like so, that is going to be set to true to begin with. And this is not part of our state here. So we will simply do it here, edit show yellow card. This is a Boolean and then everything is fine. And then here at the bottom, what we want to do is we want to say this dot set state. Once again, we need the previous state because we want to toggle the yellow card and then we need to return something here, right? We're gonna return this and then we'll simply say, please spread the previous dot, um, or rather we could spread previous and then say um, show yellow card by being not previous dot show yellow card. Okay, this is one way of doing it, but actually with the set state, we don't need to return the whole thing. We can actually return parts of the state. If we just return it like so, that's gonna be fine for React. I will refresh this page. So now we can see it a bit better. And once we click on the toggle the yellow card, nothing happens here because we are not conditionally rendering it, but we could actually see if this value is updated here by having a component, component did update. Right, so if we have a component did update here, then we could simply say console log this dot state dot show yellow card. Once we save this and refresh the page, then we see that this is actually alternating as expected. And now we can use this piece of state to conditionally render the card. So if we were to come here and remember the conditional rendering is when we wrap things around curly brackets and we use the, a, a certain Boolean condition here and then either the end operator or the, the, the ternary operator to render two different components here. We just want to add a component to the DOM if the show yellow card is set to true. I'm gonna save this. I'm gonna come back here, refresh it. And now you see that once I click on toggle yellow card, we actually got a new line here. And this new line is saying that the yellow card is going to be removed from the DOM. Once we click on the toggle yellow card again, we will see that we have another log line which says that the yellow card has been added to the DOM. So as you can see, by conditionally rendering the yellow card on the DOM, we are actually causing all the lifecycle methods to re-trigger once again. Another very important aspect here is that if we have a certain state in our card component, this state is going to be reset between these re-renders. Let's give it a little try. And here that's a very simple example, but we'll say that we have some props which are of type card props. And we're gonna call this super with props. 
and then we'll say this dot state is equal to counter or re um, rather let's say a timer or something timer starts at zero and then within our component did mount and we can actually have also a timer id here and it's going to be null right so now this is one way that we can visualize how we can use all the methods here for us inside of our component did mount what we will do is we will say this dot set state and here we will actually first of all set the timer so we will say now const timer id is equal to set interval set interval and then within our interval we are going then to let's say every half a second 500 for example and then within our interval we will say this dot set state with a new timer and here we actually need to have the previous value as well previous value and this here we are going to return timer colon is equal to previous dot timer plus one okay so once i wrap this around here and i pass the type of being and actually here i do need to to define the state i haven't defined the state yet so let's make a, a type card state and the card state is going to have a timer and a timer id the timer is going to be a number and the timer id is going to be for now unknown for us i'm just going to leave it as it is uh, then here we need to have a card state once we set the card state then we will see that the the warning that we had here disappears okay so basically what i want to do is now i want to set an interval this returns an id um, this is going to be of type nodejs.timer so then here i can set the state to actually be the timer id timer id to be our timer id like so okay so now all that i'm doing is within my component did mount i am starting something that is going to be triggered every 500 milliseconds or half a second and then this is going to update our state and it's going to increment this timer by one once i save this and perhaps we could also add a component just for us to visual visualize your component did update right so component did update we could console log our this.state.timer like so so once i save this come back to the application then we will see that this is actually being up updated every time and because each card has its own state here then this is going to be printed four times on the screen okay so let let it happen um there is no problem here we could actually for that matter simply render this here within our div in our in our background color right so we could simply say something like this and then here we could say this dot state dot timer okay if i save this then now we are going to see actually the value here being printed on the cards that are um, mounted in the dom if you want to make this um, a little bit centered well we could do that but for now let's just add a little bit of padding we're going to say that that's going to be maybe two rem just so that the the card the numbers are a little bit centered on the screen so again since we're going to remove this at the end of this lecture then we don't need to worry too much about styling let's then focus on the discussion of what happens with the state of our component once it is once it gets conditionally rendered on the screen but before we jump there let's just here within our component will on mount if we know that the state dot the timer id is um truthy value so for to to make it more explicit i always like to surround this with a boolean if this is the case then we want to clear the interval with this dot state dot timer id probably there will be uh, some type mismatch but uh, no that's fine for clear interval so what clear interval is going to do is it will simply clear up the interval that keeps running here once we fire it up so when the, once the component gets unmounted then this gets removed from the dom so now let's see what happens once we render the yellow card conditionally remember that the timer starts at zero right so now here we have a, a little fail and that is exactly what we are getting here the type unknown so basically this is not caught up by the ide ah, now it is caught up here once i save this so there it is no overload matches this time so here we could actually maybe try to set this timer ID the type here node.js dot 
timer like so. Once we have this, then here this is going to say that null is not allowed. So we can simply say either node.js.timer or null. Okay, so this allows us to have the null to begin with. And then here inside of our of our component wheel and mount then we have here that this is not allowed but then we know that this is defined so if we remove the boolean here then this is everything that it takes to actually remove this warning everything will be working here on the screen since i like to have the boolean we could actually do it like so or we can say as node.js dot timer okay so um like so. But here we can just use the exclamation mark. The exclamation mark simply says, okay, I know this value is optional, but I am also convinced that this value is going to be defined here because we are just checking it on the top. Since TypeScript is not able yet to identify that whenever we wrap with a Boolean here, this means that this is defined. We're gonna use the exclamation mark just to, to prevent TypeScript from complaining. Once we save this and we're back here, then now we can see everything on the screen. And finally, we can explore what happens once we remove our yellow card. And then we re-add the yellow card. And as you can see, the state got reset. Now, this is a very, very, very important behavior because it's a fairly common source of bugs to assume that the state of our components gets persisted even if the components are removed from the DOM by being or, or by not being rendered if the condition here evaluates to false. It's a, it's a fairly common source of bugs and I would um, highlight this for you to keep in mind that whenever we are doing such, such a pattern, whenever we are conditionally rendering something and the component is not rendered, then everything is destroyed we are going to run the component will mount lifecycle method and we're going to reset the state and once this component gets rendered again then we are going to run the component did mount and the state will start fresh here from the beginning all right these were a lot of changes just for us to visualize this behavior but i think it was a nice exercise as well for us to see for example a certain pattern uh, working with intervals can be a fairly common thing maybe you want to pull something from the back end or you want to update something regularly on the screen on the ui so intervals will definitely be there whenever you are working with react now we can actually undo everything here we can remove all our hooks or rather not hooks not yet we can rem remove the component lifecycle methods and then we can also revert back from being a class component to being a function component that's going to be a function component with our card props and this is going then to be something like this we're going to have the props here now we don't have constructor anymore we don't have the render method anymore and here we don't use the this.props, we just use props like so. Here as well, here it goes away as well. And we don't need to render anything else here. We're just gonna close this div. And then also here we do have an additional curly brackets. Now we don't have a card state anymore. We don't need this. And then within our board, we can also get rid of this yellow card like so and we can also get rid of this button and doing cleanup is very very pleasant so that, that's why I'm doing it here with you whenever we are removing code that's perhaps one of my favorite parts of being a developer is whenever we are removing stuff so I'm going to remove everything that we have here and we don't need this state anymore we don't need the show yellow card anymore and we don't need this here anymore and the last thing is we can re-add this um, strict mode here from React. I'm gonna save this and I'm just gonna double check that everything is working still as expected. Cards are being flipped on the screen and we can then take a quick pause and come back in the next video. We have mentioned hooks several times during this course, so now it's time for us to take a few lectures to explore them and see how we can use them to write more function components, to write better function components, and to start making our code easier to work with. Hooks allow us to extend, to enrich the functionality of function components. While previously function components were considered only to be stateless components, which would have some logic that would be fully dependent on the props. Now function components can have an internal state and they can also have behavior which is similar 
to those lifecycle methods of class components. There are a couple of features from React that hooks enable for function components. The first one is persisting state between re-renders. The second one is that we can execute this component lifecycle methods when the component mounts, updates or before it unmounts. And the third one, which is also a very useful one, is that we can share logic across different function components by defining custom hooks. These custom hooks can also use other features of React, for example, accessing the context API or extending the usage of other React hooks. And this can be very useful when sharing logic between function components. The hooks make function components very powerful and flexible and allow the developers to benefit from virtually every feature of traditional class components. Now, there are a couple of exceptions, and one of them is that there is no equivalent hook to the component did catch lifecycle method of class components. Component did catch is used together with error boundaries in React to make sure that if something goes wrong inside of a component, the error stays contained within that error boundary. If we are working with error boundaries, then we will have to work with class components because they are the only ones that offer the component did catch lifecycle method. Another lifecycle method that has no hooks equivalent is the should component update method. And this is a method in class components that allows us to fine tune, to very precisely define whether a class component should update or not, whether it should be re-rendered in the DOM. If we return false for this lifecycle method, then the component would not be re-rendered. However, there is no direct equivalent to this in the hooks world. So these are two examples of functionalities of class components that if you need them at some specific cases, you might have to use the class components, the traditional React class components. On the left here, I have provided a couple of examples of how the hooks look like. You can see here this use state and two instances of use effect. We can have more than a single hook of a certain type within function components. If we wanted to have, for example, 10 different pieces of state and we have 10 different instances of the use state hook, that is perfectly fine. We can repeat them, it's not a problem. However, there are a couple of rules that we need to follow and we will explore them in the next video after we take a short break. Welcome back. Let's cover a couple of the rules of hooks which are required by React or let's say React enforces these rules so that hooks can work properly. There are three rules here that we need to keep in mind. The first one is that hooks can only be called at the top level, not inside any if statements or loops. The second one is that hooks can only be called from within function components or from within other hooks. We cannot call hooks from inside class components nor from inside standard JavaScript functions. This is very important because it is a fairly common source of errors to try to mix up JavaScript standard functions and React hooks and expect that all the functionality of the hooks are also available within standard functions. This is not the case. They can only be called either from within other function components or from within hooks, from within other hooks. And the third rule is that custom hooks must start with the keyword use. Okay, if, if a certain function in JavaScript does not start with the keyword use, then it cannot be used as a hook. However, if any function starts with the keyword use, then for React, this function is going to be considered a hook. I have a couple of examples that we can explore together here. The first one is this hook and let's have a look at whether this is a valid hook or not. As you can see here, the use is the keyword on the top or on the front. That is correct. Uh, however, within this hook, we have another hook being called inside of an if condition. This is not allowed by React because React relies on the fact that hooks are called unconditionally to make them work properly. This depends on the internal implementation of React and this is something that we cannot influence. So we have to follow this rule that we cannot place hooks inside of if statements or for loops or anything that is not top level. Best practice is to define the hooks always at the top right after opening the curly brackets so that we also have a good overview of all the hooks of a certain component. Unfortunately, this pattern here is then not possible. It's not allowed by React. 
The second piece of code that I have here is a standard function in JavaScript and then we use a hook from within this standard function. As we know here in rule number two, this is not allowed. We cannot call hooks in from within functions which are not hooks nor function components. Bottom line is whenever you're working with standard functions in JavaScript, don't call hooks. Whenever you are working with hooks, make sure that they are called only from within function components or other custom hooks. So this pattern is also not allowed. The third example that I have here is an example where we have use standard function. So it starts with the keyword use and we call the hook here on the top level. This, because this hook is not called inside of any conditional statements, rule number one passes. Because this hook is called from within another hook in React, then the second rule passes. And because the name of the function starts with the keyword use, then the third rule also passes. So this is a pattern which is allowed. The fourth example that I have here is we have a simple component and whenever we define a component by just assigning a an arrow function or, or a JavaScript function, doesn't matter, whenever we define a component by assigning a function to it, this is a function component. So calling the hook from within this function component, that is perfectly allowed and this is also a valid pattern. Let's take a short break and let's come back in the next video to continue discussing hooks in React. In this video, we'll discuss two fundamental hooks in React. They are very important. We use them in many places and they are the use state and the use effect hooks. The use state hook makes it possible to persist pieces of information between component re-renders. Previously, this was possible only by having a class component and by using a specific, a special property called this.state. Now, this is not anymore the case. We can use the use state hook in function components, and then this use state hook is going to return an array containing two elements. And the first element of this array is going to be the state itself, the piece of information that we are persisting. And the second element of this array is going to be a setter function. This setter function should always be used whenever we are trying to update the value which is stored inside of our use state. Whenever we call the setter function, this, is, this will trigger a re-render of the component. And in the next render, this state variable here is going to hold the updated information. This is a very straightforward hook to work with. So we can think like this, state piece here substitutes whatever property we were holding inside of the this.state property and the setter function simply replaces the this.setState but this is only applicable to the state that we are storing via this hook. If we have two hooks on top of each other, one, two here for example, then calling the setter of the first is not going to update the second they have to be called independently and then both states are going to be updated independently. This is very good because then it enables us to split up pieces of information rather to split up a more complex state into smaller pieces and then we can more precisely manage them by updating only the necessary ones as we interact with our application. The second hook that we cover now is the use effect hook. And the use effect hook, it makes it possible to execute side effects whenever the component is mounted in the DOM, whenever the state is updated or right before the component is unmounted. As if you remember, this is very similar to what we had regarding the component lifecycle methods. So the use effect hook, it takes two parameters. The first one is the effect that we want to run. And the second one is an array of dependencies. Now, the, let's start with the second element here, the second parameter, the second argument. The array of dependencies is going to specify all the variables that will trigger this use effect in case their value changes. This could be a piece of state, this could be a reference to a function, this could be any piece of information that if changed and we want to trigger some side effect, then it is going to run the function that we define on the left side as the first argument here. This is a simple function in JavaScript and there is one restriction that this function should not be an async function 
But apart from that, pretty much every function that we will come across is allowed within our use effect hook. In this first case here, when we pass an empty array of dependencies, this is going to be executed whenever the component is mounted in the DOM. This is equivalent to the component did mount lifecycle method. We can have more than one use effect if we want to call more than one side effects whenever the component is mounted. This is no problem. Maybe we want to start loading two pieces of information. I'm not sure what would be a use case that we cannot combine the functions all within a single function, but it is possible. The second use case is when we have an array of dependencies. And here, for example, we could have a dependency to our use state hook, or rather to the state that is returned from our use state. And maybe when this state changes, then we want to run this side effect here. So this is also possible. And then we would specify the state here within our dependency array. Whenever the state changes, this would trigger this function within our use effect with the updated value of the state. The third use case is when we need to run, for example, some cleanup, something that we would run inside of our component will unmount lifecycle method. This is defined by the function that is returned from our use effect whenever we have a use effect that runs when the component mounts. Basically, this is a little bit um, more cryptic or less straightforward to, to visualize. Basically, for us to define a function that will run right before the component unmounts from the DOM, we need to return it from within our use effect. So for example, let's say that within the use effect here, we set up a timer or set up an interval. Then if we want to clean it up, we would return the cleanup function here. And then this function will be executed before the component is unmounted from the DOM. For all these cases here, we will see some practical examples later on in the code exercises. But for now, let's take a short break and let's come back in the next video. Welcome back. Let's briefly cover two more advanced hooks. And React has many hooks. It has a use ref hook, use context hook, use reducer hook, use state, use effect, use memo, use callback, and many others. Here we are covering the basic ones and the most important ones. And the principle is definitely transferable to the other one. So you can explore them also on your own. For the use context hook, what this allows us to do is to use within or to use this hook within a React context provider to retrieve the value of the respective context. We will discuss React context and this hook in more details in an upcoming section in the course. So you don't need to rush if this is not clear to you, if you're not familiar with what React context is, everything will become clear afterwards. The important thing here is that we should keep in mind that there is a possibility of retrieving a React context value by using the use context hook. And the last hook I want to mention here is the use reducer hook, which is normally used to manage pieces of state of more complex natures. So it returns two values. The first one is this more complex, maybe an object with several properties. So the, the more complex piece of state. And the second one is a dispatch function, which we can use, we can call it. If you have come across Redux or you have read about these reducer functions or the dispatch functions, this is here, this one that we can call to update parts of this more complex state. Since the use reducer is applicable to very specific cases and in 95% of the cases the use state hook is actually used, then we're going to skip the use reducer for now and we will focus on the hooks that are more widely used. Let's take a short pause and let's come back in the next video. Welcome back. In this video, we refactor the board component into a function component and we will leverage hooks to store the pieces of state that we were storing previously in our state property. The first step is to define this as a constant. This is going to be a function component now. So this will simply be a function like so. And then we don't have a constructor anymore. This doesn't make sense. The keyword this doesn't exist anymore. So here we can start using our hooks or rather let's simply remove this and let's define as a constant here. We're going to say constant cards like so just for us not to introduce too much for now. 
So the constant cards is going to be of this type. Then we can remove this element here and also this one because constant cards is a simple array. And then here we have a flip card which needs to be defined with a const keyword in front. There is no problem here that we have a definition of a function inside of a function. That is that is not uh, a big deal. And but however here we cannot really use the set state hook. So for now we'll simply comment out this block here because we just want to oops and that should be like so because we just want to make this code render or rather make this not break the the our application then we can after we add the hook we can then migrate this to be in the function that will update the hook so now here we have a return and this we cannot use the this dot state anymore so we can simply say cards dot map and then here we would simply call flip card like so. So these are the changes and then here we don't have this last one. These are the little changes that we need to do when we are migrating from a class and again this is a simple class component doesn't have a lot of logic but now here we have a clean ground that we can start working with. Let's start introducing the state with use state hook and the first thing we want to to save here in our state is our cards component or rather our cards array that we then render on the screen. If I were to save this and come back here to the browser, we'll see that everything is rendered correctly. However, the behavior is gone because the flip card function has basically nothing inside. So we're gonna add the functionality now. The first part that we need to, in to implement here is the use state hook. Now the use state hook will receive an initial value and this value is going to be this array of cards. So once I place it here and I then assign this here, we will have our cards and we have a set cards function. And now we can import use state from react here on the top, like so, use state. And once we have this, we already have our cards stored in a state variable. This does not add the behavior because we still need to update this via the flip card function but we already have this marked as a persistent piece of information between re-renders. Now as you can see here on the top we have our board props and we have our board state and the board state is a type here that would house all of our state in a single object. This is not the case anymore with hooks. So with hooks what it happens is that each of these keys here would become its own use state hook. So all we need to do is to take the type of this state and then pass here to our use state. This is not strictly necessary. TypeScript can infer the type based on what is defined here but for the sake of completeness and also for those who are just maybe reading the code afterwards it is always good to give some hints regarding what exactly what which exact piece of information is stored in this use state here so it's always good to use the type and make it clear this is a board card so now we can remove our type board state from from here and because we have no props really we can just remove this also from here so now at the bottom let's start working with our flip card and this here doesn't really have we, we don't have such a possibility this dot set state anymore but all we are going to do is we will simply work with this array here and we will call this or we will pass this to our set cards function let's then call the set cards function and here we will pass an array and this is going to be exactly the same as we have here so i will simply copy paste this the only difference is that here we do not have a previous object right we don't have a previous parameter that is passed so we need to remove this prev from here we also need to remove it from here, from here, from here, and from here. Once we do that and we save the application and go back to the browser, we will see that the behavior is exactly the same as before. Once we click on a card, this gets flipped and we can flip and unflip cards. We can remove this deprecated code and let's see if there is anything else that we should remove from here. But I believe that's it. We have a flip card function 
This is just calling the set cards function here. And we have our additional or our initial piece of state stored here in our use state. Let's take a quick break and let's come back in the next video. Welcome back. In this video, we will explore the different patterns of the use effect hook and how they correspond to the different moments of our component lifecycle. We'll import the use effect hook here on the top. And let's start with the first one, which is the component did mount lifecycle method. This is the equivalent of creating a hook which has an empty array of dependencies. This will only be run once and we'll simply say here console log. I will be run when component is mounted. Right? I will be run when the component is mounted. Once I save this and we come back to the browser, we refresh this. We see this is printed twice and that's because again we are in strict mode. But this is not reprinted. It's not constantly shown in the console whenever we are changing the state of our component. For us to better visualize how this would look like in a component did update method, we could pass a use effect here. And as a dependency, we will pass our cards array. Now this hook here or this side effect, this function is going to be run every time our cards state changes. It is important to highlight that this will trigger a change only if the cards, the reference that is stored in our cards state here changes. We'll see that in a little bit. We'll see what I mean by this, but I will say console log here. I will run whenever a card is flipped. Right, so this here is a more high level comment. So basically this will run whenever the cards variable, the card state is updated. But if we save this and then we come back here on the screen, we will see that we have, we are printing this four times on the screen. Every time we click it, then we see that the number is increasing. So this is running whenever our cards state is being updated. We can also see that this runs once here. So it's, it's run twice because of the strict mode, but it's run once nonetheless, whenever the component is mounted for the first time. So this is one thing to keep in mind. Now, what, do, what did I mean when I say that we need to change the reference here in the cards? For that, we're just going to quickly comment out the, the set cards function here. Okay, I'm just going to comment it out like so. And instead of calling set cards, what I will do is I'll simply say cards and I will try to find the card index here. And we will say dot is flipped is equal to not the card dot is flipped like so. We have this, we are modifying the cards here. Once I come back to the browser, I'm going to refresh this. But whenever I click, nothing is happening. The component is not updating. Things are not moving around on the screen. The cards are not being flipped. And this use effect here is not running. So it's a fairly common source of bugs to assume that changing something within our cards here is going to trigger an update to our use effect. But this is not the case. The cards reference has to change for this side effect to trigger. And this is another important aspect here. And it means also the quote unquote negative side, which is not really a negative side, but it, it is just a, the way that it works, that whenever this cards reference changes, then the use effect hook, this use side effect is going to be triggered. If this cards here is a property of a type object, maybe an array or an object or something which is of a complex type, whenever this, this dependency is a prop that is coming via the parent component and the parent component is re-rendered and the reference changes, then the use effect, this side effect here will also run. This is a little bit more complex pattern. We're not going to enter into the details in this video, but just keep in mind that whenever you're passing a dependency to, a, to the use effect, whenever this reference changes, the side effect will be triggered. This can be either intentionally via the set cards function, or it can be unintentionally via a change in the reference that is coming via a prop. So this is again, a fairly common source of bugs, triggering functions multiple times because we are not aware of what is changing which piece of state. So 
Keep that in mind, it's always good to be able to fully trace where the changes to a certain piece of state or to a certain prop that is a dependency of a use effect hook to trace where these things happen. Let's now go back to the previous state here where we have our set cards working. I'm just going to remove the comments here. And now what we can try to do is to set up a very simple here. We are going to set up a very simple use effect. And before we set this up, let's just add a use effect here on our card component. All we want to do here is to visualize our component will unmount use effect. So I will simply write it like so. And remember the component will unmount will be or it has the shape of a function that we return from the use effect here. And all I'm going to do is I'll simply console log I will be removed from the DOM. OK, so that's the first thing. So now we have a component will unmount equivalent here. This is, will be executed whenever the card component will be removed from the DOM. And now in the board component, we can set another use effect which is going to be a timeout. And this timeout will simply remove the last element of our cards array. So here we again have no dependencies because we want to execute this whenever the board component mounts. And we'll say console log setting timeout to remove last card. And then we'll simply say set timeout. And here within the set timeout function, we will say set cards to, and this is going to be not an object, but rather an array and then here we'll say cards dot slice and this is going to be from zero up to the cards dot length minus two okay so this will just remove the last card here a small typo here this should be minus one since the final boundary is not included in our slice and then let's set the timeout for a thousand milliseconds this is going to be a whole one second once we come back here to the screen and we come we refresh the page then we will see that we have this here i will be removed from the dom right so this console log statement is coming from within our card component i will be removed from the dom and this is returned from our use effect whenever this component is mounted so whenever it is mounted for the first time we are returning a function and this function is executed whenever the component is unmounted. Here, as you can see, there is a, a small warning from our linting system, and it says that the React hook use effect has a missing dependency of cards. Now, there is a rule, or rather a suggestion in React, which says that we should always mention in our array of dependencies here, all the pieces of state or all the variable parts of information, pieces of information that are referenced within our side effect. So it suggests for us to either include it or remove the dependency array. If we were to add it here, we will actually enter into what we have already discussed of an infinite loop because this use effect is going to be triggered whenever there is a change in cards. But from within this use effect, we are changing the cards variable. So this is an infinite loop. If I were to save this, we will quickly see this on the screen. There we go. We start an infinite loop and this will always be triggered here on, on the side. So this is definitely not what we want. We don't want to trigger this hook whenever we change the cards variable. So we will remove this array here of dependencies from our use effect. I'm going to save this. And as we will see on the screen, this doesn't really solve the problem. After every second, we are still remove, removing cards from, from the screen. And this is not what we want. So as it turns out, it's not that simple to, to do such kind of update. But what we can do here on React is if we hover over again this message, we'll see that there is a second alternative. You can also do a functional update with the set cards like so if you only need cards in the set cards call. So if we don't need anything else within the set cards call, then we can just pass a function here. And once we pass this function and we save it like so, we refresh the page 
then we will see that this is removed twice and that is very interesting um, this is again because of the strict mode and this is actually due to an incorrect setup on our end because we are not doing any cleanups here you see that we have this on the screen here we are setting up the timeout but we are not cleaning it up so because the strict mode runs twice then or rather it runs everything twice then this set timeout is being set twice and this is updated the state twice it's updating the state the state twice so this is a, a good thing from from the strict mode it is simply pointing us towards hey you may have some timeout which is not cleaned properly when you are returning the function or rather when you are setting up your use effect hook so let's go and let's set up this cleanup function we will simply say const timeout id this is going to be like so and then we'll simply return a function that is going to be a clear timeout and this clear timeout function will receive our timeout id now if this component gets unmounted from the dom this last part here is going to run and it is going to clear the timeout so we're going to save this come back here to the browser and as you can see now we correctly remove only one card now this is a, a very subtle very subtle behavior but that it makes this strict mode actually quite useful so when you are in development mode strict mode runs everything twice when you are in production mode this is not going to be the case but by running everything twice the strict mode makes it clear that hey wait you are actually triggering this twice and you are not cleaning it up properly it could also be the case with network requests maybe you load the data here and you end up with a double list or a duplicated list because you are triggering the network request twice and you are not cleaning it up correctly whenever you are returning the function here or you are not returning any function at all the bottom line is whenever we are setting up a timeout an interval or network request we should do always the cleanup in the component will unmount function which is this returned function from our use effect all right a little bit of um, mind twisting again here a lot of different patterns i know this is perhaps a little bit different than what we were used to with class components but this is becoming and it's actually already pretty much the standard now using function components which are cleaner easier to maintain easier to work with and then leveraging hooks so we're going to clean up now we're just going to remove the things that we don't need all these hooks are not necessary and here on the top we can remove the import and then within our card component we can just remove this hook save everything remove the import again save everything come back to the screen and just make sure that everything is properly rendered and still working as expected with all working fine let's take a quick break and let's come back in the next video We will now spend a couple of videos in our code and in our application to add some of the missing logic. So far we can just play around with the cards here, we can flip all of them. But in a more realistic memory game we could actually flip up to two cards and once we flip them we should see some message that this, if they have the same color that we have one, or if they don't have the same color they should eventually be unflipped so all of the cards are facing downwards. This is still not implemented in our code let's see how we can do how can we implement this logic in the next couple of videos in this video we will continue with the logic of our memory card game and so far we can actually just flip and unflip cards at will but in a more realistic memory game this wouldn't be the case in a more realistic memory game we should be able to flip up to two cards and if their colors are different they should be unflipped so they should go back here to being unflipped and if their colors are the same, then we should see some sign that we have won the game. In our code here, let's add an additional card. And this is just for the sake of making sure that we have, or rather we don't even need an additional card. We can just change the color of the last one. This is going to be also red, like so. So we can have a situation where we have two cards of the same color. We can now within our flip cards, add some logic. So here we can simply say, let's say the flipped cards. Right, so flipped cards here is going to be nothing more than cards dot filter and then this is going to receive a card 
and we are interested in returning whether the card is flipped. If the card is flipped, it will remain here in this array. If the card is not flipped, then this is not going to be, so this card here is not going to be maintained in the flipped cards array. So let's just console log this on the screen, flipped cards like so, and then we'll be able to see whether this is going to be, this is going to indicate all the correct version. So here, when we flip the card, because we are printing this before we actually update the cards here, then we are seeing the two previous ones. These are going to be the two red ones that are flipped here. So this is okay. Once we unflip this, the flip cards is going, or the flip card is going to be again executed. The flipped cards at this point here will have the old value of the cards element or the card state. And in this old value, also the green card was flipped. So we are able to identify which cards are flipped and now we can start adding a few conditions here to make sure that we indicate or that rather we implement that business logic that we are interested in. So if the length of the flipped cards is zero, then we will simply proceed here with the set cards behavior. So if there are no flipped cards whatsoever, we will simply flip whatever card we are flipping, okay? So here, once I come back here and you will see that this is not going to be executed because these two cards are set, they are already flipped. So the length of the array here is already two. But if I were to come back here and then set this to false and then save this and come back to the, to the application, reload this, then we'll see that we'll be able to flip a card only once, okay? So once we flip a card, then when we try to flip another card, we'll see that the flipped cards dot length is not going to be equal to zero. So this set cards is not going to be executed. And the second condition here within the else condition is that if the flipped cards, if the flipped cards dot length is equal to one, then we have to decide whether the card that was clicked on has the same color as the already flipped card or whether it is has it, it has a different color. So let's write this in a more informal comment here. So if the cards with the index or the card index that we receive here, if this has the same color as our flipped cards in the zeroth position, right? So if they have the same colors, then game one, right? Otherwise, otherwise we flip the card, we flip the second card and we set a timer of say two seconds, two seconds to unflip the cards. Okay, so this simply means that the cards have different colors and we want to flip all of them downwards once again. The first condition here is quite easy for us to implement. We can simply copy paste this because we already wrote this as, as JavaScript. So if the cards with the card index is the same color as the first flipped card, then we will simply Let's say here window.alert, like so, you won, just like so, right? So let's save this now and let's see what happens once we click on the second card. I'm gonna refresh this. And as we will observe, we still cannot really flip the cards, but we start getting some weird message here. You see that we have won, so you won here. And that's basically because I clicked twice on the same card. So this, this code is a little bit buggy and, and I, don't particularly like this code like this. So let's change a little bit because this condition here, we could actually, we don't need to add this within our flip card, but we can add this as a use effect hook. Remember, we are interested in running an effect whenever a certain piece of state changes. And for that, we can use the use effect hook. Now the use effect hook is going to have as a dependency, the cards array. And then within our use effect hooks, we will also compute the flipped cards. And then we will execute this condition here, or rather all of these conditions here inside of our use effect hook. I'm going to edit here for now. And then we'll simply say it like so. If flipped cards dot length is equal to two, then we are going to now fall under here, either this first condition or the second. The problem here is that in the first condition, we don't really have the new card index for us to compare. 
So we need to find another way. And basically here, the only thing that we need to do is we need to compare the first with the second flipped card. So instead of using the cards and the card index, then we'll simply say flipped cards one dot color, or rather let's start with the zero one here is equal to flipped cards one dot color. Then we will simply alert you have one. Otherwise here, else we simply want to set a timeout and then within this timeout we want to set the cards all upside down and for us to do that we'll simply do it like so we'll say set cards with cards dot map and then here we need to basically change whatever we are getting or we need to set all the is flipped properties of our cards to false how do we do that one possibility is to have a map which means we are going to iterate over the cards and we're gonna return a new card for each of the cards. So now here I take our card, I will spread all of its properties so that we keep all the properties and then I'll simply say is flipped, I'm gonna set it to false. And our set timeout here is going to be executed after, let's say two seconds, like so. So now once I save this, we see that formatted this may be a little bit easier to see. Let's go over once again the logic here and see if everything is clear. First, within this use effect hook, we again calculate the flipped cards by simply keeping only the cards which have the is flipped property set to true. And then we evaluate. If we have two flipped cards and the first flipped card has the same color as the second flipped card, then we simply alert a U1 on the screen. Otherwise, if they have different colors, we're gonna set a timeout here. And after this timeout, we're gonna set the cards to a new array, which is going to be calculated based on the previous cards. Here, what we are doing is we are just iterating over our cards. And for each card here, we return a new card, but this new card has the is flipped property set to false. And here I can see that the, the timeout time here is actually misplaced. It is within the map function. This should actually be here more outside. So we have this closes the first, the inner function, then this closes the map, then this closes the set cards. This should be actually after this here, it should be like so. So now this is going to then make sure that we actually have this aligned here. Uh, this will be triggered after two seconds or 2000 milliseconds. Let's go back to the browser here and let's see if the behavior is as we want. And oops, we can we, we still cannot turn another card here and this is because we did not update the length here. That means that we are flipping cards only when we don't have any flipped cards. So here the case should be if it is less than two, then I'm going to allow to, to flip a card, right? So if it is, if it has, if there are no flipped cards or if there is only one flipped card, then I want to flip one more card. Otherwise I want to prevent any further action. Let's save this. Let's go back to the browser, refresh it here. And as you can see, we are able to flip two cards. Now, are we able to flip three cards? No, we are not able to flip three cards because once we have two here, then this condition evaluates to false and then it does not allow to flip any additional cards. Now, if we flip two identical cards, we see the message U1 here and once we press OK, only then the card is flipped. This is a little bit of a weird behavior and for us to fix that, what we can do is we can set a timeout here, a very small timeout, okay? So like so and let's say maybe 50 milliseconds or something so that this quickly appears on the screen after the card is flipped like so and this makes sure that this function here is added to the callback queue in JavaScript after 50 milliseconds. This means that this function will not be immediately executed. It's not going to block the current thread and wait for a response from the user because previously this was being immediately executed before the render function was actually returned. So we were executing the window.alert call here before we actually finished returning all this. That's why we didn't have the updated cards on the screen. That's why the red card was not showing. It was because this was being executed before the whole rendering process was done. By adding a timeout like so, 
this is going to be removed this is going to be postponed a little bit from the main thread and it's going to be added afterwards to our callback queue and it's going to be executed only after our render process is completed for us to see this we could actually put a zero timeout here and the only thing that the timeout is going to do now is it is going to simply not execute this function directly it will wait until the the whole render processing is done and only then it's going to pick the next function from the callback queue which is going to be this one here so the zero here doesn't really mean time to execution this is something which is also I, I i come very often across a confusions here so the zero here or rather whatever timeout we put for example 50 here this simply indicates the time that javascript will wait until it adds this function to the callback queue now there is a difference between being added to the callback queue and being executed so even if this function is added to the callback queue, if the current stack is actually taking a long time to complete, this function will take more than 50 milliseconds to execute. Since we are in a simple application here, this is not the case. So this gets executed pretty much after 50 milliseconds. I believe that our game is now much more solid. Let's, refle uh, let's refresh here the browser and let's see if we flip two cards which are not equal, then they get unflipped. If we flip two cards that are equal, then we print U1 on the screen. So we can take this moment here since we have implemented the functionality as we wanted. We can make a short pause and we'll come back in the next video. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to start implementing a small header here on the top that we want to use to have a button to actually reset our game. So once we win the game, we don't, we cannot really do anything additionally here because we prevent any further card flipping once the length is equal to two. And another thing is that the cards are always on the same order. We would like to have a bit of a random behavior where we have cards in different orders every time we restart the game. So in this video, we'll start with the implementation of the header component. Within our IDE, let's create a new file here. And this file is going to be header tsx like so header.tsx and then we will once again use our function components export const header which is going to be something like this and we will have a certain function here so we we'll say header props and we would like within our header props or rather we would like our header props to receive a on restart game prop right so this is just going to be a function that we will execute from within our header props whenever the restart button is clicked so we will say that our header is of type function component with the header props type and then here we can say either directly props or we can use destructuring destructuring in javascript to say on restart game directly so we don't need to to say props dot on restart game now here, all we want to do is we want to return a button and this button is going to have an on click function. And this on click function is going to be our on restart game. And this button is just going to have the restart text like so. I'm going to save this and we can already include this here within our app component. I will simply add a react fragment here. We're going to have the board on top. And then we will also have the header here. Now the header is going to be imported from header and then we need to pass an on click function or rather on restart game function. And this here for us is going to be console log restart button clicked like so. So now if I come back to the browser, we will see that we'll have the restart button here. And every time I click on it, then we can see the message on the console log here. Let's add a little bit of styling to our header component so that we can use the so that we can display it a little bit better. So inside of our app.css, I'm going to add a couple of new classes. The first one is going to be header container and the header container is going to have a display of flex. It will have a justify content with a space in between. That means it is going to place the content. It's going to try to put it 
close to the borders and fill the space in between the content with a white space. If we have three elements, then it will try to distribute them equally. And this is just a good, good way of making sure that whenever we need to have one component to the leftmost side of the container and the other one to the rightmost side, then the space between often does this job for us. And then we will use the align center or align items here to center, to center the elements vertically. Now we will also have a height and the height is just going to be 5 REM and we have a padding of 1 REM like so. And now we need to add this header container here to our header within our header file. Now that instead of directly returning the button, I want to return a div component with a class name of header container. And then this will also be a div. So that's the closing div. And then the button is going to be within our div like so. Now, once I save this, we come back to the screen. We see that we have a little bit more spacing. We also would like to have a little bit better styling in our button components. So I'll simply say reshuffle or reset game, reset button. Let's do it just like so. Reset button and within our app.tsx, I'll say dot reset button. And here we can add a couple of things. Let's add a background color. The background color is going to be something a little bit bluish. So let's say something like this. And the color of the text is going to be white and the, the text is going to be bold. So font weight bold for us. Then we also want to have a little bit of padding inside to make sure that we have a bit of spacing. We want to have a border radius of eight pixels and we would like to have no border. So even though we pass a border radius here, if we don't want any border, we just pass a border of none and the radius will still be applied. And then we want to, whenever someone is hovering over our button to have a cursor of pointer like so. Now we can see that our button is a little bit better. Maybe we could have a um, padding here of 0.5 REM on the vertical padding and one REM on the horizontal padding. And that's maybe a little bit better. I'm thinking that the white space here is a little bit too much. Let's go back this height and let's try three, three REM. That's fine. Looks a little bit better. So now we also want to have a hover effect in our reset button just to make it a little bit more interactive. And we will set the background color to something a little bit lighter. So we'll say for 277 FF like so. So now if I save this and I come back to the screen, then we see that the hover here gives a slightly lighter background and there is some interaction effect whenever the user is hovering over the button. Before we take a short break, let's just understand a little bit better the design here that I have chose for the header component. As you can see, we have a certain function, a certain callback function being passed here via props. And this is executed from within our header component. So the header component itself doesn't really know what's going to happen once the user clicks on the button. The user, or rather us as the developers, we have to provide which behavior we want to execute once the user clicks on the button. This is because we will need to access from within this function here. We need to somehow access the cards state, which is then going to be moved to this app component so that we can restart it. We need, we want to maybe reshuffle the cards. We want to render a different set of colors and then we want to pass the cards down to the board component. Now, as it is here, this is not the final state. I'm just providing a little bit of an explanation why we have added the on restart game prop already. So now let's take a short break and let's continue with the game development in the next video. Let's now move the cards state from within our board component up one level to within our app component so that we can reset the cards whenever we click on the restart button. Within our board component, what we will do is instead of having the cards here initialized within the state, we will receive them via a prop. So let's define here type board props. And what we would like to receive here is an array of cards. This array of cards is going to be of type board card or rather even better because we do not need to keep the state is flipped outside of the board component. We are just interested in receiving an initial array of colors. We will simply say cards. It is going to be an array of strings. And then within our board component, we will then set the use state to rather instead of being 
directly initialized here we are going to map over the cards and then we will initialize the board card so here what we will do is we will retrieve the props let's first define them here function component which then receives the board props and then here within we can say cards and this could actually be initial cards to avoid conflicting the name here with our state so let's call this initial cards and then once we retrieve this we can actually here within the next line let's go to the next line here so i'm going to just delete this and then here we'll simply say initial cards dot map and then for each card that i receive here we will return an object which will contain the information of that card and it will contain also or rather here we need to improve this a little bit because this is just an array of strings so basically we just say the color here the color is going to be our card and the is flipped is going to be set to false right so this is just going to be the first initialization here once we render the board component on the screen now our app.tsx is requiring a property here which is the initial card so now we will define this as being a state we'll say const cards or card colors maybe card colors or let's just start with cards and then set cards and this is going to be a use state like so and this here will contain an array of hexadecimal colors we'll say f00 for example then we can say here 0f0 and then f00 as well just so that we can visualize what's going to happen once we click on two cards with the same color now we'll simply pass initial colors or initial cards here to be our cards we're going to save this and we'll go back to the browser to see whether everything is working as expected we are now here on the browser and we have everything flipped down so now once we click on two cards then we see that they got flipped up and because they are different they get again unflipped and once i click on two cards of the same color we print the message u1 on the screen so the behavior is still the same everything is working as expected and here let's just revise before we make a short pause now instead of hard coding the cards here within our state in the board we allow the the application to provide the card colors that we want to play with and then within our board component we do map this initial cards here to our internal representation where we have a color and a is flipped property but we don't require this card to actually provide this information this is very important because from the app perspective from the app component perspective everything that is interesting for the board is just to provide an array of colors that we want to play with we don't need to know at the app level how the board is internally storing these cards and how it is managing the logic to actually flip the cards and check whether someone has won so we should not actually expose this information from the board component we should not let it leak outside of the board component and that's why we have a clean interface where we just receive an array of strings and then these strings here represent the colors of the card we will play with let's take a short pause and come back in the next lecture welcome back in this video we will work towards removing this hard-coded array of colors here so how we will do that we'll do that in a few steps so i'm going to write them here just for the sake of understanding everything better before we start implementation the first step is to generate a random color okay so we we just in the hexadecimal hexadecimal format so that's the first step we want to have a function which generates a random color in the hexadecimal format then we want to be able to generate an array of random colors okay we'll just generate an array of random colors and then we will pass this array to the board component and we need to duplicate the array within the board component or rather not just duplicate but also shuffle this array right because if we duplicate it it simply means that we will have always a color at a position zero for example and then another color the same color the position n plus one where n is the is the number of colors that we have so here we'll simply say we pass this array to the board component and within the board component we are going to do two operations here we'll say 3.1 duplicate the colors 
and then 3.2 shuffle the resulting array right the resulting array so as you can see we have a lot of things to do let's just get right away to to working here so the first one is we need to have a generate random colors right generate random color and this is going to take no parameters and all this is going to do is it will return a math.floor here and we'll say math.random math.random this is going to generate a random number and we're going to multiply this with the decimal value or the decimal equivalent of the maximum hexadecimal color and that is 16777215 and if you are curious at how i got to this number then you can just google it hexadecimal to decimal converter and then we have from hexadecimal to decimal and we're going to enter here the white color that's the highest hexadecimal value for colors in in css and javascript and in, in general front end once we click on convert then you see that we actually get this number 16777215 so this is how i got the number we're going to come back here and now back to the code what we will do is we take the floor so that we ensure we take always the lower the lower value here and because math.random varies between 0 and 1 then whenever we multiply by the max value we get a number that's going to vary between 0 and 16 million 700 and blah 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 thousand and so on and then here we just want to make sure we round it towards the lower value and now here we can translate this to a string to string and then here we can pass the radix the radix parameter simply says convert this number to the following base and the base here is going to be base 16 that's the hexadecimal base if we pass this to 10 then this would just be the decimal base if we pass this to 2 this is going to be the binary base so we're going to just simply say 16 here to get the hexadecimal code of whatever color we are generating so now here we have a function to generate a random color and then what we can do is we can also have another function generate random color array and this generate random color array is going to receive the array length and then here let me just stop this because once i save this gets run again so i'm just going to refresh this and now we we can prevent that that window.alert coming up so now we have an n here the n is going to be or the length maybe it's going to be a number and this is going to return me an array of strings right so now here this receives no parameter it returns me a string and then here all I can all I need to do is to simply return array dot from and then here I can pass an object which is going to be an array like object the length is enough for us here and then on the uh, as a second parameter I can actually pass a function that is going to be used to map this first object to the resulting objects in the array and then here all I want to do is to simply call the generate random color function like so so once I pass once I use this structure here we can actually test this at the bottom let's see once we once we first render the app we we'll simply say console log generate random color array and this is going to be let's say an array of length 10 once I save this and come back to the browser then we will see that we have the arrays printed here or rather the array printed here so how does that work let's spend just a few minutes in our generate random colors array let's rename this random colors um, and here what it does is it creates an array from what is called an array like object okay so if i hover over the from here you will see that it has a fairly complicated signature but the first one here is an iterable and this iterable can be an array like object now an array like object is any object which contains the length key and this key is of type a number so this is what we are doing here we simply say please generate an array from an array like object this will generate an array with a length set to len if i were to remove the second parameter here save this come back to the browser and refresh it we'll see that we will get a bunch of undefined so javascript generates an array with length 10 and it fills it up with undefined now i don't want to have to fill it up with undefined values so what we can do here is to pass a second parameter and this parameter if we hover again over from this is a map function right and the map function here is going to receive a tuple as the parameters these are the value and the index 
of that of that value and this is useful if we have an actual an array like or an iterable here but the point is that this map function will be applied to every value from our array before actually returning the final array and all we are doing here is we are mapping over each of the elements each of the elements is undefined so we don't care about it and we are just applying this function and returning a random color here so bottom line is we are generating an array with length 10 and then for each of the elements we are actually returning the color that we want to 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 generate here now there is one small thing that i have just noticed when we go back to the browser we see that we don't have the hashtag here so let's add the hashtag and we can simply say here random hex color and here we'll simply return like so with back ticks so that we can we can interpolate values we are going to pass curly brackets we're going to pass a dollar sign and then the hashtag here once we save this then we should see now the values with hashtag and every time this gets re-rendered on the screen the values are different if we now look at our our to do's here we can see that the first one is done so we're going to mark this as done and the second one is also done so just copy this paste it here and let's then go to the third one the third one is we want to pass this array to the board component so all we have to do here is to simply call this function generate the color arrays here or rather the color array and then pass this down as the state once we save this then we will see that we actually have 10 cards the problem here is that the cards are going to have all different colors, right? So there is no duplicated color here, or rather the probability of him having a duplicated color is very small. It still exists because this is randomly generated, but it is very small. So as you can see here, the colors are pretty much all different. So what we want to do now as a next step is to go back to the board. And here within, of our, within our board component, we will implement what is missing here the two the two steps we want to duplicate the colors and then we want to shuffle the resulting array for us to have a little bit more space let's just collapse the sidebar and within the board we can actually then duplicating the the initial cards is actually fairly straightforward what we can do is we can just do it like this we will spread the initial cards and then we will spread it once again so we are just spreading it twice and simply here making sure that these two or rather the initial cards are duplicated once we save this now we should see 20 cards and then it should be the case that this first card is actually equal to this card that's correct and if we were to refresh this we would see that the second card that we have here should be equal to the second card here and that's also correct so as you can see it's fairly predictable the cards are different between themselves and that's a very very close to white color here um, but they are actually equal to each other in a predictable manner so if we have 10 cards we have the first equal to the 11th we have the second equal to the 12th card and so on and so forth so we definitely don't want to have this on our game because otherwise the game would be too easy let's then implement a shuffling function so that we can shuffle this resulting array let's do a little bit of a typescript exercise here and let's work with generics now i'm using function shuffle like so and we'll then receive our generic here and then the function all it does it receives an array which has this generic type and then it returns another array which has the same type so bottom line here is that all we need and then here we could just directly return array for example we get rid of all the errors so the bottom line here is we are defining a generic type this t capital t here it simply says look i don't know what this array is going to contain but i know it's going to contain elements of this type so in the end i just want to return another array which also contains the elements of this type so this shuffle function could work with numbers it could work with strings it could work with booleans or even with more complex objects the first thing we want to do here is we want to copy the array so we'll say copy here and this is going to be a shallow copy we are just copying this to prevent modifying the original array okay because here we're going to do some flipping around we're going to change some indexes then if we don't copy this we will end up modifying the original the input array so here we are creating a shallow copy and then we're going to start working with this copy so let's say that our current index is going to be our our length of our copy array copy.length and then we also want to have a random index right so this random index here is going to be used within our loop now we're going to iterate backwards we're going to start at the current index and we will keep running the loop while the current index is different than zero 
okay so here and then for, for us to already make sure that we that we exit the loop or that we exit the while loop then we can subtract the current index here or decrement the current index by one so this will run a number of times that is the same as the length of our array from within here we will then calculate our random index so we'll say random index is equal to math.floor same reasoning as we did for generating a random color math.random and then here the only thing that we want to do is to multiply by the current index right so now we can use this and we can also leave the current index here and now we can use this array copy or the copy rather copy at the current index and the copy at the random index are going to be equal to and then here we are going to do the flipping then we'll say the copy at the random index and the copy at the current index so basically what we all we are doing here is we're just flipping stuff around right so we are um, making sure that here we can flip the random index with the current index and because the random index is actually random then this will make sure that we add some random elements to our array now instead of returning the array what we want to do is return the copy and once we save this now we can use the shuffle function here shuffle our copy of a race and once we do that and come back to the board and maybe here we could actually remove this or reduce this let's make it two so that we can finish the game a little bit faster let's now come back to the board and once we click on it we will see that we already have this shuffled because this color here initially is placed on this position and so maybe we can increase the difficulty a little bit more let's put four and now here we can we have then four eight cards and now we can start playing a little bit so it after two seconds it flips and then here you can see that we already won so the logic is pretty much done actually now if we think about it we have a logic which allows us to provide a random array of colors we don't need to hard code them anymore once we have this random array of colors the board itself is going to take care of duplicating and shuffling everything so whatever parent component works with this board it doesn't need to worry about this internal logic it will simply pass the initial cards and the board component will take care of setting everything up just for the sake of completion let's mark everything as done here so we have also done the third part and once everything is completed or since everything is completed let's remove this and let's take a quick pause and come back in the next video Welcome back. In this video, we will implement the behavior of restarting the game. We have a function set cards here, and we want to restart the game whenever we click on the button on the header here. So if, I, if I'm here and I click on restart, we would like to, instead of printing a message, actually restart the game. The first thing is for us to implement the functionality in our app component. We're gonna wrap this around curly brackets so we can have multiple lines. And we're going to have an if condition just to make sure that the user confirms that they want to to actually restart the game so we'll say window.confirm and we'll say restart game and then if this is true and here the result of window.confirm is going to be true or false depending on what the user does or rather true if the user confirms and a false C value if the user does not cons does not confirm so we see that it returns a boolean here and then what we want to do is if this is true then we want to set the cards with a generate random colors array once again here we'll simply do it like so and then we'll save this and we will see if that is going to work i can tell you beforehand this is not going to work as expected but let's see at least whether we have some behavior here if we click on a card let's just refresh this make sure we have a clean updated application if we click on the card here and then we click on restart and then we click on okay we confirm it oops we see that actually nothing really changes so let's refresh this again and let's try we're going to click on two of them they have exactly the same colors let's now click on this click on restart click on ok and if you look at it they still have the same color so what actually happens here is that within our board component this initial or this initialization of our state is run only when the component is mounted in the DOM this is not run when the initial cards property is changed now what we want to do here is just let's just confirm 
and that whenever we change this prop here this is actually or this is reflected within our board component so we'll simply say console log changed initial cards like so now once we go back to the browser we refresh this and we click on restart and we press ok then we see that the initial cards are actually being changed every time we click on this if we cancel it then nothing gets printed on the screen or on the console and once we confirm it we can confirm that the initial cards prop is being changed is being updated but this is not reflected here because once again the initialization of the use state or rather this value here this initial value that we pass is considered only at the time of mounting what we will do here instead is then we will define a function we'll simply say or rather we can define this function outside it's even better so we will say here const init board cards and this init board cards is going to receive an array of cards or card colors it is going to be an array of strings and it will return an array of board cards like so so now here we can work with the card colors also here card colors and then we can use this function in both places we will say here init board cards with our initial cards initial cards like so and then here we can also call the set cards with the same behavior so we will then update our cards variable by again initializing the board cards every time the initial cards change now we see that is a small error here and i just forgot to return this and once we have all this let's save this here and let's see if the behavior is as expected now we have a pink and a orange color here once we click on restart restart the game okay and now we see that we have different colors perfect so that's exactly what we want let's see if we can finish the game and the colors are different here so by chance and uh, no they are they are actually randomized so just so happens that this one the first one here is equal to this one once we win the game press on restart restart the game then we get different colors perfect so very important detail small but very important is that the function within use state is run or rather this initialization value here this initial value is used only when the board is mounted for the first time if the prop changes and by any chance we depend on the props here to calculate the initial value then our value our cards value is not going to change if we don't change it on purpose or rather if we don't change it intentionally that's why we have a specific use effect that watches these initial cards here and whenever they change we will also make sure that our cards state within our board is updated with the proper board cards since we are here let's just do a bit of cleanup we'll just remove these comments here because we have already implemented this functionality let's then quickly go through our board component as you can see over the videos it grows to be a slightly complex component a very interesting one because it has different applications of different hooks we have the use effect hook we have actually two use effects we have the use state and we also have a function here that is not really a hook but is defined within of our component what is the difference then between this function defined within our component and the function that we define outside of the component i also find this to be a fairly common source of of, of doubts and also of bugs because every time we define a function within the component the reference to this function that's very important every time we define a function inside of the component the reference of flip card is going to change with every re-render this will be initialized with every re-rendered and the reference to the flip card is going to change that means if we play if we pass flip card as a prop to any of the children components of our of our board component then this flip card is going to change with every re-render and if we use it inside of the card we have maybe a use effect or something that depends on this flip card this will be triggered at every re-render there is a way for us to have a stable reference here and this is to be the this is to leverage the use callback hook but we're not going to go into the details of it now the important thing 
and uh, very, very relevant to avoid bugs is to understand that this reference can change much more often than the reference of something that is defined outside. Okay, so the init board cards is defined only once. This is defined at, let's say, quote unquote, build time because there isn't really a build time JavaScript for that matter, because we just load the JavaScript and we execute it in, in the JavaScript interpreter. But the bottom line is this, this is defined only once and this does not change with re-renders. So why do we sometimes need to define functions inside of the components? Well, that is only when, or rather, I would say this is a rule of thumb that I like to follow, is that whenever we need to use, for example, a variable that is returned from a hook, so the set cards, or whenever we need to use the cards variable here, then I define the function inside of the component so that every time the component gets re-rendered, then we get a, a new function defined with the updated value of our cards variable. It's also possible to have this function defined outside and then receive everything as parameters. This would be more in the direction of having truly pure functions but I do find that for the most cases, it is a quite common practice to define a function inside of our function component if that function depends on some other variable that is also defined and managed inside of the function component. So quick summary of the board component, it receives initial cards. It then, when it's mounted on the first, uh, for the first time in the DOM, it initializes the state of cards with our initial cards here. And then every time they update, we use this use effect hook to update also the value of our internal cards here. We then have another use effect here, which depends on our internal cards. And this use effect is responsible for checking whether we have won the game or whether we need to unflip the cards. If there are two flipped cards, then we're gonna do this check. Otherwise, this use effect is just not gonna do anything. Then we have a function defined within our function component, flip card, which depends on our internal cards as well as on the set cards function. And what this function does, it, it, it just flips a card on the screen. It receives an index. And if there are less than two flipped cards, it's going to flip that card. And then we return here in the end, we simply map over the cards and we return a card component. Now here, perhaps we could do a little bit of an improvement. If we come back to the board, we can see that we can flip the cards face up, face down as we please in a more realistic memory game, we should not be able to unflip the card. So here, all we will do is we don't need to worry too much about it. We'll simply say that is flipped is set to true, right? So we're not gonna toggle it. We'll simply say, okay, is flipped is set to true. So if now we refresh this, we cannot really unflip a card. The card will always be upside. So now if we click on the second one and it's not the same color, that is fine, right? So here we cannot really flip anything else. And this is perhaps a little bit more realistic game. Once the two of them are, are of the same color, we still win. But now we are not able to unflip cards. And this is perhaps, again, increases a little bit the, the, the fun here. But anyway, this was just a small behavior that I observed we could update. So now let's take a short break and let's come back in the next video. React Context provides a way for us to access information from a certain place, from a certain provider, without having to pass it directly via props. The value contained in a React Context is available to every child component of the respective provider. So on the left example here, we have a context.provider. This is what is meant by provider. And this is referring to this context here on the top. Now, every child at any depth within this context.provider can retrieve eventually the value that is stored here. This can be very useful when sharing state between components or when providing a single instance of an object for the whole application. One example of this pattern is the React Query Library. The React Query Library is a library which allows us to make HTTP requests or actually any type of requests. And then here we define a query client provider. We wrap our application or part of it in a query provider. And then we pass a client to this query provider. The client is initialized here on the top, right? This is the query client here. This refers to this one. And then whenever we are within this provider within this query client provider, we can retrieve this query client to make network requests. 
To go a little bit more into details here, we initialize a single instance of the query client, right, under this here, under this call. And then we pass this to our provider, to our query client provider. And then in any child component under this query client provider, we can use a custom hook called use query client to then retrieve this client here and make our network requests. This is very useful because it may be the case that this app is very complex with a lot of children and we don't want to have always to pass things explicitly via props and be careful regarding how to properly define these props in TypeScript and pass them downwards and maybe if something changes on the signature we would need to update the, the signature, the types in multiple places. So providing this kind of provider here which then enables us to access the value at any depth directly via a custom hook or via our own hooks or via the hooks that are provided by React, this can be very useful. Let's take a short pause and then let's switch to the IDE where we will implement our own instance of the React context with our own custom hook for us to explore all the details of how this works in React. Welcome back. In this video, we start implementation of our React context example. And for us here, it will be about storing some statistics of our game. We are interested in storing, for example, how much time does each game last, as well as how many card clicks happen within each game. For that, we're gonna leverage React context and we will explore the details of how it works. Within our application, the first thing that we will do is to set up or create a statistics provider. This statistics provider is going to be that context provider which wraps all the relevant components and makes its value available to any child component. Within our files, let's create a new file here and we'll simply call this statistics statistics like so and I define this as being a TSX file because we will export some React components here even though this is not explicitly a single component file. So the first thing let's just provide an empty export so that TypeScript stops complaining and then here we will create our context. So we will say statistics context is going to be equal to react.create context like so. Now we need to import, we can either import the React global here at the top or we can also just import create context from React and then we could simply use create context here like so. And we need to pass a value to an initial, a default value to the create context. This is going to be for us for now undefined. We can now here also export or rather export the first element for us here, the statistics provider. The statistics provider is going to be a function component here which will simply return a statistics context dot provider. And then here it is important for us to two things. First one is to pass a value to this provider. We will see that this is missing the property value is missing in this type but it is required in our prop provider props and we also need to pass the children components which will be rendered here. So for us we will define this as a function component and then here we define the type statistics provider props and the statistics provider props will have one prop which is going to be called children and this children is going to be a react node or an array of react nodes. Okay so we will just start like this and then we can simply here define this as being our function component function component like so, which has the following props. Now we receive the children here, and then we can pass the children here within our provider like so. Now this children props is a specific, it's, it's a very special props in React in a way that we don't need to pass it explicitly. So we don't need to pass it as a traditional prop. I will show you just in a bit how what this means for whenever we are working with a component which has the children props. For, for, for now, let's also pass here the value as undefined so that TypeScript stops complaining. Once we save this, then we see it gets better to visualize and we are exporting now this statistics provider. We can remove the empty export and within our app, we will import here, import statistics provider from statistics. And now here, if we simply pass the statistics provider as wrapping everything here, you will see that it doesn't really require us to pass the children props. This is because React interprets this children props in a specific way and it will consider every component here under the statistics provider as being 
part of this children or is being collected is in this children props. If we were to simply have react node here, let's see if this impacts our application. No, that is also fine. So we could just have react node here and everything should be working still as expected. If we come back to the browser and we refresh this, the application is working just fine. So just for us here, we can use react node. That is good enough. And then whenever we pass any child component to the statistic to the statistics provider this child component is going to be added to the children props if we were to console log here just for us to to visualize this a bit better let's console log children and once we save this and come back then you see that it gets really wrapped up in an array and then an array here is also a react node so this is an array of two elements first element is our header the second element is our board so if we were to expand this let's see if we have any any mention yes we have a props here which is on restart on restart game and this is the props that we have for our header component and similarly here to the board we should have the initial cards prop and then this is also this allows to visualize the initial colors that we use this is the only prop in react which doesn't require us to explicitly define it if we had any other prop here let's say another which is a string for example then we see that we already get an error in the app.tsx and this simply means that the property another is missing in in the type that is provided by this but it is required in the signature statistics provider prop and once again this is just because react interprets these children props in a specific way so we don't need no, we don't need to specifically pass it if we wanted to we could do so we could actually just simply here instead of having an open close here we could have children and then this could be for example an array and then within our array we have it like so we pass our components here we close this and then we simply mark this with a comma and then here we need to wrap this around curly brackets so that um so that jsx is happy once we save this stuff is going to continue working just fine and then you see here that we start getting a little error because we are handling a race and remember from our lists video we would need to pass a specific key here so that react doesn't or rather is able to match the components between different re-renders so as you can see this is also fine this would be the more traditional or not the more traditional but this would be the explicit way of providing children here we're going to stick to the react way which i do find easier to understand so we'll just have it like so now that we have wrapped the statistics provider here or now that we have wrapped everything with the statistics provider this value that is passed to our statistics provider is available to every component which is a child of this provider so if we were to come here to the card and for that we will temporarily expose our statistics context let's just export this here like so later on we will change this because we don't want to export this implementation details here we will discuss this in more details in a later video and within our card we can now retrieve this by using the use context hook so if we were to say here const context or statistics value is equal to use context with our statistics context like so and then we can console log the statistics value now i'm going to save this and for the sake of demonstration let's use an array or rather a string here so our value is going to be from the statistics context and now back in our application i'm just going to refresh this and then you will see that we have a bunch of console logs here and this is because each card is retrieving this from the context from from the context provider or it is retrieving this from our statistics context and then it is printing on the screen so with very little effort we were now able to within our card retrieve the value from within this provider here and we didn't have to add any prop we didn't have to change any signature of course this adds up a level of indirect coupling right the moment that we add this line here to our card this makes our card actually coupled to the statistics context so here we have we are referencing something that is coming from another module and this is not explicitly mentioned in the props which means that if by any chance 
we change the value from within the statistics or we try to use this card without using without wrapping it in a provider we will get a couple of errors so the trade-off is there right we can remove some props we can have a cleaner code but at the same time we are adding a level or a layer of indirect coupling that's why i'm also always careful regarding using the context API in React and I have to have a good use case to use it instead of using the props directly because the props allow us to actually see the information that a component is dependent on. The React context makes this information less straightforward to see so it's perhaps a little bit more complex to maintain. That being said, there are use cases for React context and the one that we are implementing here is one of them where we want to have a statistics provider that wraps the whole application and then we want to collect information at the different levels of the application and then aggregate everything in one place. For now, let's clean up here, let's remove this. We are gonna later on access this context in another way. So we will remove this as well. And then here we don't want to export our statistics context because this is once again implementation details right this holds here the internal data representation or the internal data structure that we are storing in our context so once we have this now we can here within our um, statistics we can remove the children or the console log for the children as well once we save this our, our application is back to not printing anything on the screen and it is working as expected and now we have a nice statistics provider that we can use later on. Let's take a quick break and let's come back in the next video. Welcome back. Let's now implement a custom hook that allows us to retrieve the statistics context value without actually exposing the implementation details, the internal data structure of our context. For that, we will export here a custom hook and this is going to be called use statistics like so and remember in the hooks we have to follow a couple of rules it has to start with the keyword use and within this hook I can then use other hooks but this hook needs to be called or it can only be called from within other hooks or from within function or function components within this hook we can then access statistics value that is going to be the use context with our statistics context like so statistics context and then here we can return something so we can return anything from the hook for now we will we will simply return the statistics value so even though here we are directly passing the value down to our statistics value or as a return of our hook this is very important because now we have a point of customization where we can define how we want to process this information with of our internal data structure before making it available to the external world for now let's leave this as it is we're going to save this and within our card component we will use here let's remove this unused import and we will use the use statistics from our statistics file and then we'll simply say here console log or rather use statistics so const value is equal to use statistics and then here we'll simply say console log the value once I save this and come back to the, to, to the application, then we will see that we are printing the same thing as above. So this use statistics here is very similar to the um, use query client hook that we saw before. This is a custom hook which enables us to access the value of a certain context without really having to use the use context directly. This provides a layer of abstraction and of encapsulation, which is very important for us to be able to maintain this application more consistently and without so many breaking changes. This allows us to change the internal implementation here or the internal data structure without necessarily breaking any component that is dependent on it. Of course, if we change this and we return it directly here, then we would eventually break the components. But if we have some logic here in the middle that makes sure that the new data structure is transformed into the old 
or rather into the into the signature but if we have some logic here in the middle between retrieving the value and returning it which transforms this internal data structure into a stable interface then we will not break any component that is dependent on it so always recommendable to have this layer of abstraction and encapsulation by defining a custom hook which retrieves the value of the context for us and if necessary does some processing and then it returns a stable interface for any component that want to use it let's take a quick pause and let's come back in the next video welcome back let's now provide the users a way to toggle between showing the board and showing the statistics of the game so here we're gonna set the logic at the app component level and within the app component level we're gonna have a certain state which will host whether we are showing the board or the statistics and then here at the bottom we will render either the board or the statistics screen conditionally we still don't have a statistics screen so maybe here we can just for the sake of at least rendering something on the screen we can export here statistics and the statistics is going to be just a component and this for now is going to return statistics okay just like this later on we will customize the behavior but for now let's just return something simple within our app component here we can say const screen set screen and this is going to be use state and this use state is going to have two options okay this is again typescript so here we can say it's gonna be it's gonna host the value either of board or of statistics and we will initialize this with board okay so now if i try to set anything other than board or statistics you will see that we start getting an error this or here allows us to specify all the values that this use state can ever assume so it has to assume either one of these either board or statistics we're gonna hold it we're, we're gonna set it to board for now and then here we will say if the screen right if the screen is board so screen is equal to board and the board component like so and now here if the screen is equal to if the screen is equal to statistics we'll simply render the statistics component like so we are getting an error here because we are actually returning a string so let's just wrap this in a div for now so that we return a valid react node if we use it like so then the the typescript error here should go and we should here still see our board component so these are the console logs from our card component and now let's provide a way here on the on the header to actually alternate between the board and the statistics screen within our header.tsx let's extend this to being a um, something or let's add another prop here that's going to be on select screen and the on select screen is going to be a function that will receive the screen here the screen is again either board or it's either board or it is um, statistics and this will return void right so now here we have a we have a header and then within the header we would like to put um, another here another element on the other side of the screen so let's just write here i'm on the other side and see how this looks like oops and see how this looks like on the screen so now if i come back to the to the application you see that we are getting some errors here that is because we are not passing this function here so we will say on select screen and that will just be nothing right we do nothing here we just return undefined we save this we come back and then we see that the text here is on the other side that's how we intended here when we earlier on we selected here in our header container to have a display of flex and to justify the content with a space in between now here the only thing that we need to do at the header level is to receive here the screen and then we will simply call set screen for the screen that we receive okay now this is already fine here if we hover over you see that this is already correctly identifying that the screen is going to be either of top bo type board or statistics and this is coming from the type definition here in our header props if we were to say for example 
BOAD here, then you will see that we get an error in our app component because the screen here is going to be is, is not going to match the type that we are defining here in our use state. So we cannot really use this function here. You will see that this argument of this type is not assignable to the parameter of the type set state action with statistics or board. So that's again, another very nice way of using TypeScript to make sure that we are matching the types here between the components. That is all we need to do for the app level or for the app component. The rest of the logic is going to be within our header. Now here, let's again, within this div, let's create two buttons. The first button is going to be for our board component and the second button is going to be for our statistics screen. So now if we were to say here on click, we will then simply call this um, on and then here we need to actually access the, the prop here, the on select screen. And then we'll say here simply on select screen with the board value. Now here you see that we also get a nice um, auto completion, which comes from the fact that we have defined these two variants or these two possibilities here on the top. So this is going to be the on select screen for the board. And the one at the bottom is going to be the on select screen for the statistics screen, like so. Now, once we save this and come back to the browser, we should see a button here that allows us to alternate between the board and the statistics component. Very important here, the moment that we are alternating between these components, the board and the statistics components, we are causing a full mount and unmount of these components because we are mounting only the one component that matches the screen. So if the screen is board, we are mounting only the board component. Otherwise we are mounting only the statistics component. Then when we select statistics here, we are unmounting the board component from the screen. If we were to come to the board component here and add a lifecycle method, let's use here within our board, I'm going to simply say use effect and we will directly return a function here like so. So we return a function that simply says console log unmounting and we can pass an empty array here of dependencies and we save this. Now we will see that once we refresh this, we start with the board, but once we click on the statistics, we actually print the unmounting on the console, which means that the board component is being unmounted every time we toggle between our board and our statistics. And the same thing for the statistics component. Why is this important? We can remove this here, but this is important because every time a component gets unmounted and remounted to the DOM, the state is going to be reset. Okay. So here, if we have a board and we turn a couple of cards, we go to the statistics and we come back to the board, you will see that these cards are different. So it is very important for us to actually be aware of this behavior here. We will simply prevent or rather let's give a, a little warning to the user here. Okay, so we'll say within our on select screen, we'll say if window.confirm. Right, so we could say here screen is the board. So if our screen is equal to board, then we want to confirm whether the user wants to, to switch the screen, because this is where the danger is that the user may lose their state. So this will reset the game. Okay. And then if the user confirms this, then we will set the screen to the new screen. So I'm going to save this. And now back here, let's have a look again. We have blue and, and purple here. We come to the statistics and nothing happens because this is the, shouldn't be the board. It should be the statistics here because we are on the board screen and we are trying to set the screen to statistics. So if we click on statistics here, it will say this will reset the game. If we cancel it, it stays on the board. So let's revisit this. Okay. We have again, blue and purple. We go to statistics, we cancel it. We still have blue and purple. So nothing changes, but now if we want to come to statistics, we press okay. And then we come back to the board here. And we just need to have here else set screen to make sure that everything works fine, right? Otherwise we will set the screen only when the screen is statistics. So now when we come back to the board, we will see that we have a different state here. We still have the same colors. Yeah. This is important for us to realize we still have the same colors. This is our blue 
and let's see if we can find our purple maybe this is purple okay here is our purple so we still have our blue and purple here the colors are the same because they are set at the parent component the app component but they are getting reshuffled every time we render the board component because we are entering into this initial state setting here very nice way of visualizing the effects of rendering things conditionally. This is not a bug, this is not a problem, this is the intended behavior of React. You just need to be aware of it and be careful whether this will generate any side effects in your application that you are trying to avoid. For us, this is fine for now as a behavior, so let's take a short break and let's come back in the next video. Welcome back. Let's just start working towards storing some actual statistics about our game here. We will start by returning a couple of functions from our use statistics hook. So instead of directly returning the value, let's come back to the card here. Before we do that, let's remove this again so that we don't have any problems with the signature. Let's return here an object. This object is going to contain three keys. The first key is statistics. And this is going to be just an empty object for now. And then the second key is going to be start new game. And this is going to be a function. This will for now simply return starting new game. And the third value here, the third element of our object is going to be end current game. Okay, like so. And then here we'll simply say ending current game. Now the start a new game function is going to be called from within our app.tsx or rather from within our on restart game function. This start a new game here, what it will do is it will, so let's say start new game, will one close current game and current game and start and two start new game. And the end current game will simply end current game will simply end the current game. Okay. And the statistics here is going to contain a bunch of information about our individual games. Once we return this, we can actually access the start new game and the end current game functions from again, every child component from within our um, from within our statistics provider. So here within the header, we can actually come here and we can say here const and then we can use an object to say use statistics and then we need to import this, I believe. We will import use statistics from our statistics file and now here we'll simply say start new game like so and then the start new game function is going to be called here together with the on restart game like so and then here we call this function and we also call here start new game now if we save this and come back to the to the application let's click on the restart here restart game and nothing prints on the console because of course we are not printing anything we're just returning a string so now here let's wrap this up in a console log right so now if we save this and we come back here and click on the restart then you will see that we get this starting new game here. Now, as you can see here, once we click on the restart, we are actually triggering this console log before we actually restart the game. And I'm not really satisfied with this. So let's change a bit the behavior here. We are not gonna use this inside of the header. We will actually use this inside of our app.tsx. And we will see what we need to change here to actually be able to use this. So now if we were to try to simply import this here and use it here and then call the start new game here because that's what we want, right? Now we want to start the new game if the user confirms that's the only place, that's the only moment we want to restart the game. We can remove this from here. We can undo all our changes. Let's just pass again as we had before here on restart game. And we will see that even though this works, this is kind of breaking our, our definition that we should be able to retrieve the value only from within a statistics provider. Right here, we are actually, our app component is not within the provider. So let's change a bit the logic here. And now let's, instead of directly defining the function here, let's actually store this function within our context. Okay, this is in the end how we want to have the the setup, we don't want to simply define the function here. 
we want to pass a couple of methods from our context, from our provider, retrieve them via our use context hook, and then use these methods to update the state within our provider here. So let's go a little bit more into um, deeper implementation levels here. And we will say const, just for the sake of having, of having a certain, um, let's say game ID here and set game ID. For example, this is going to be a use state with uh, just a math dot random. Okay, so for now, we're just going to generate something random here. Let's import the use state from our react here, use state. And then here from within our provider, we actually want to provide the value that is going to provide a couple of functions that we want to retrieve here. So this is getting a little bit complicated in terms of uh, the flow of the program. Hold on and we will then revise everything once again, once it's completed so that we fully understand it. Now here we want to define a function, start new game, for example. And all this function is going to do is it will say set game ID to math.random. Okay, so basically here we are just changing the game ID and we will pass this function here via the value. Now our value here is going to be something a little bit more complex. Now it's going to be an object. We will update the types in a bit. And then this will have start new game like so. And this is going to be our function referenced here. And for now, we also want to have maybe some statistics or rather let's say the game ID. And the game ID is going to be our game ID state. Okay, so now we need to update our value here because this is not compatible with the type that we are passing here. You will see that React is trying to infer the type from our first call to the create context. This is not possible because the types are not the same. So we are going to define the type here. We will say type statistics context value. This is going to be an object which will have a game ID that is going to be a number and a start new game which is going to be a function that doesn't return anything. And now we, when we pass this here, statistics context value, then we need to change the default, the default value here. It needs to match this stati statistics context value. The game ID is going to be, let's say, default one is zero and start new game is just going to be an empty function like so. Now, if we come back here to our to our um, context component, then we see that we have we are passing the value here. It has the game ID that's coming from this place and it has the start new game that is coming from this place. So every child of this provider should be able to retrieve this value by using our use statistics hook. Now we can do that here. We can do is this via the use context hook and we will retrieve our game ID and our start new game like so. So now the start new game will come here. And for the statistics, we'll simply give back the game ID. Just for now, that is going to be the behavior that we have. Once we come back to the browser, then everything is still working or at least there are no errors here on the console. But if we were to get the game ID here as well, which we can do so, or rather the statistics, which we can do so, and console log the statistics, we will see that what we get here is actually zero. Okay, now this is, a, this is a very subtle, but again, very important behavior here, because what we are returning is not the actual value of our React context. What we are returning here is the default value that we are passing here. If we were to say this start new game, it's just going to console log. I'm the default function. Okay, then you see that once we click on restart here and we press OK, we are printing the default function. We are not printing the start new game that we have here. We are not executing this behavior of changing the game ID. Very important realization here. That's why this was a, a lengthier path for us to walk, but to realize that we are using this use statistics outside of our provider. Our provider is actually within the app component. So the app component itself does not have access to the use statistics or to the statistics context. 
Very important here is that we need to move this statistics provider one level up. This is here to our index.tsx and we will wrap our app component in our statistics provider so that the use statistics can also retrieve the value from the provider. I'm gonna cut this and remove this from here. And within our app, or rather within our index.tsx, we're gonna wrap the app component with our statistics provider. Now, if we cut this and paste it in here, let's import now, import statistics provider. Once we save this and come back to the screen, ah, perfect. Now we see that we have some actual random ID generated. Once we click on restart and we restart the game, then we have another ID, perfect. So now we are able to retrieve the value from within our app component. And we are able to also start a new game from the perspective of the statistics context. We can remove this for now. I think this video was also quite a bit heavy in terms of uh, theory and a little bit, may maybe a bit mind bending for, for the context. But the important thing here is two things, okay? So th there are two things that we need to keep in mind. The first one is that whatever value that we provide here, whenever we create the context, whatever value we provide is going to be the default value. This value will be returned whenever we try to access the value of our context outside of that context provider. Okay, this is very important. This value will always be provided whenever we try to access the, the context value outside of the provider. Then within the provider, we have started storing some state. We have the game ID and we have also a function to update this game ID. We then pass as a value to this provider an object which contains the game ID and the function to reset this game ID. Now this value here is accessible to every child component of this provider. These values can be retrieved via the use context hook. And this is, what, this is what we are doing inside of the custom hook use statistics. We are calling the use context. We are retrieving the value from this statistics context here on the top. And this value now is going to have this shape. It has a game ID and a function called start new game. And then we are simply returning this for the moment so that whatever component calls this use statistics hook, it then can access these methods here. Then within our app component, we are using the hook and we are getting an access to the start new game method. We are calling the start new game whenever the user is resetting the game. And this is in turn here from within our context provider, it is calling this start new game function. That was a lot for now. So let's take a quick pause and let's come back in the next video where we continue implementing the actual logic to store the statistics within our statistics provider. Welcome back. Let's continue with the implementation of our statistics provider. The first thing that we want to do here is to generate a unique ID. For now, we are simply using math.random, but maybe we can do something a little bit better. We can actually use a UUID, which is a universally unique identifier. And for that, we will install a small library. It's called npm install UUID, and we're going to install the version 9.0.0. I will also write here save exact so that we save the exact version in our package.json file. And this is then, we make sure that we all have exactly the same setup. Once we install this, we can import it here. We we'll do it like so, import v4 as uuid v4 from uuid. And then we can simply use this. And if there are no types here, then exactly. So we could not find the declaration file for the module UUID. We can simply install this as NPM suggests. We can install the types UUID. So we would just install it. It is a dev dependency. It is used only by TypeScript. And now once we install it, then this message should go away. Perfect. So now we can actually generate here a V4 or UUID V4 like so, and then we can also use it here. Now this is a string, it is not a number. So we need to update here on the top our declaration, which says that the game ID is a number. So that should be a string. And now here, if we flip back to zero, then everything should be working fine. 
what we will now do is start storing information about different games here. So basically now we can install only one game ID, but actually as we would like to store it, the, the object has the following shape. So we will simply create a type here again, just for us to understand, this is going to be games and the games is going to be a record where the key is going to be a string and the right side is going to be an object. We don't know yet how this object is going to look like, but we will define this in a bit. So the games here is simply a map. It is an object where we have a string as a key and then on the right side we have an unknown or a value of an unknown type. Now we can say here that our use state is going to have the type or is going to have the shape of games. Then UUID is not good enough anymore. So we will remove this from here. And then here we cannot set the game ID. So we will change a few things. We'll say this is going to be games and we will say set games. And then we will start here with nothing. So basically we'll start with an empty object. And then here um, what we will do is we will say set games where we will use the old games, we will simply spread them here and then we will include a new game where we will have the key here, the key is going to be UUID before and then on the right side we'll simply have an empty object for now. Okay, so now here we don't have game ID anymore, we actually have a games information or a games key. So let's bring this type up so that we can have a better visibility. I do like to keep the types always together on the top makes it easier to see all the types of the file, but if you prefer to keep them closer to where they are used, that is also fine. Now here I also bring this type here on the top, and then we can see here, this is going to be the statistics context value, we'll not have game ID anymore, we'll have games, which is going to have a shape of games. And then here we can simply return an empty object for the default value, this is not used anywhere anyways, and then here we can have our games and our statistics here is just for now return our games like so. Now here at the bottom you see that we have game ID, we should change this to games here so that it complies with our type. Once we save this and come back here we'll see that everything is still the same, everything is working fine, but now we are storing some information in a slightly more complex object type, this is of type games. Let's now set up here within our app component a use effect for us to print our statistics on the screen. So we'll simply say statistics like so, and then we will say use effect, and we will print our statistics, console log statistics. This should depend only on the statistics. We're gonna save this. Once we come back to the browser, let's refresh. We see we have an empty statistics here when we change nothing changes. But when we click on restart and we press okay, then we actually get a new game added here. Now this game is the game that is created from within our from within our statistics file here, from within our statistics provider where the game is initialized. The only problem here is that we don't really have a way of initializing the first game. So perhaps what we could do here is to have a use effect and the use effect is going to run only when the app component is mounted and then we will simply say start new game whenever the component is mounted. Once we come back here to the browser and we refresh it, we will see that we get populated here with one UUID. So this is our first game and we can then come back to our statistics component and here now we can start adding a bit more information to our game. The first thing that we are interested in is the start time and this, is can, just, this, this can just be calculated by calling the new date dot get time. Now this is going to return the epoch in milliseconds um, and this will then be a, this will then be shown here once we expand we have the start time this is just going to be the number the the timestamp in milliseconds. Let's check again here if we press on restart and we press ok then we get two, two entries with each of them having a different timestamp. Now we see that the first one is actually the same as here and the second one has a start time which is slightly higher, right? We see that the, the latter part here is slightly higher. What we are also interested in storing or rather what we would like to do here is to instead of creating a new object with a, with a start time and then having multiple objects with a start time and perhaps multiple objects without an end time, 
we also would like to set the end time whenever we are starting a new game we want to finish the previous one with that end time and then we want to start a new one so here let's wrap this up around some curly brackets so we can do a little bit better logic we will simply save this for now just to get a bit better formatting and we say here then const time is equal to new date dot get time and now what we will do here the start time is of this one is going to be time for us to define or for us to set the end time of the currently existing game we first need to identify this game here by finding whatever game within our object that does not have an end time for us to work a little bit better here let's define these types instead of using unknown at the top otherwise when we start using the the filter functions the map functions and so on they will get pretty confusing so it's better if we just define a type here we'll simply say um, single game is going to have or rather we could say like game statistics is going to have a start time which is of type number it's going to have an end time which is of type number and here maybe we could also use date right so we could also use date here if we would like to could be of type date this can be of type date as well and the other property that we want to store is here number of card flips this number of card flips here is going to be a number okay so now we can use this game statistics within our record here and now we know that here on the right side we have a start time we have an end time and we have a number of card flips and here you see that this is not assignable because the time is in is in numbers here so let's just remove this and now the problem is that it's missing a couple of information it's missing a couple of keys here for us so the first one is the end time which we want to make alternative so or not alternative but not mandatory and the second one is the number of card flips so now we'll simply say number of card flips is set to zero whenever we are starting a new game we have no card flips so we just set this to zero now here we are better equipped to actually check within our array of games which array or which object and that's not really an array so within our games object which of the objects does not have an end time for that we're going to do a little bit of javascript here and we'll say open game and the open game for us to identify it we will iterate over the entries of our games object and the entries they return here for us so here let me just write a comment the dot entries they return an array of tuples where the first element of the tuple or of each tuple is the key of our object and the second is the value so we would have an array of key value pairs here like so so we would say key one value one for example key two value two and so on and so forth so here after we call the entries we can actually iterate over this and we can filter based on either the key or the value for us here the interesting part is the value so we we'll simply say key value we will ignore the key for now and then we will say no v dot end time okay so if there is no end time this will be kept here in our array otherwise it will be simply removed from the filtered array and then we want to return only the key of this object so now we will look only at the key and then here we'll simply return the key the key is going to be a string and as a result here if we look over the map we see that we get in the end an array of strings so if there is an open game meaning if this filter here keeps one element for us then we want to take the first of this if there is no open game then this open game is going to be set to undefined now what we want to do is we also want to copy our games object so we'll say games copy and then this is simply the spread operator for the games object that we currently have now if open games is or rather if open game is defined meaning if open game is truthy here it's not undefined we could also say boolean for the sake of of being a bit more clear then we want to set our games copy at the open game to be equal to spreading of the games at the open game and then here in the end the end time is going to be set to our time okay so now we have here 
and this could also be like so that is not an issue okay we're just spreading it and then making a shallow copy and then setting the end time here now we use the games copy here for us and then once we save this we should be able to see this working on the screen so now we have an object here an entry which does not have an end time it has a start time and a number of card flips as soon as we click on race start and confirm then we can see an additional entry and when we look at the previous one we see that it now has an end time a little bit of uh, javascript intensive computations here hopefully everything is clear uh, I do find that object.entries and filter and map, it's sometimes a bit confusing to understand, but basically the idea here is that object.entries transforms an object into an array of key value tuples. Okay, so it takes the object and then each key becomes the first entry in a tuple and the value of that key becomes the second entry. And then we have an array that we can use to operate on and then use the filter method, map method for each method if we want to and so on and so forth. So this is quite useful for us. There are also other object methods here, the object.values, for example, it will simply return an array with the values and it will not include any of the keys. And if we were to say object.keys, that's exactly the opposite. It's going to return an array of keys and it's not going to include any of the values. Quite a heavy computational video, so let's take a short pause and let's come back in the next lecture. Welcome back. Let's continue with the implementation of our statistics provider. And what we would like to use now or what we would like to work with now is that we would like to have a way for us to increment the number of card flips. Now we have it set to zero. And whenever we click on a card, we would actually like to see this number of card flips incrementing by one. So let's start by creating a method here. We will say const increment card flips and this is going to be just a function where we will also have here we will identify what is the open game okay so so the idea is that we will not require any index here we will simply within our provider we will look for the open game and for that open game we will simply increment the number of card flips so all we have to do now is to simply set the games and we could actually make the same logic here let's copy paste this at the bottom later on we can also refactor to remove the duplicated code and 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 make sure that our components or our functions are better designed but for now let's just copy paste and then we do the refactoring so the game's copy is here if there is an open game all we want to do is here we want to copy the game's copy and then the number of card flips is going to be equal to or rather let's say colon the games copy open game dot number of card flips plus one okay and then here we can simply set the games to the games copy we don't need to spread this here once more because we did the spreading here at the top but just for the sake of being on the safe side we're gonna do it like this once we save this and come back to the screen let's now press here we see that nothing is happening because we actually are not triggering this function from within the card component. So what we will do now is we will expose this here via our interface. Our interface is here, the statistics context value, and this is going to contain another one, which is going to be increment card or increment number of flips. Is that the name of the function? Let's get the same exact name here, increment card flips, right? Increment card flips, which doesn't receive any parameter and it also doesn't return anything. Now we need to add once again here. And just for the sake of being a bit cleaner, I'll just return an undefined and I will also return an undefined here. Now at the bottom, we can use the same function here, increment card flips. We can provide it here via the value. And then from within our context here, use statistics, we can also return this increment card flips, and then we can also return it here. Okay, we still have the end current game that we would like to implement. We will implement that in a later lecture. For now, let's just have the increment card flips. And then we can retrieve this increment card flips from within our card component, because that is where we want to actually 
flip the card. So, or rather we could also do this on the board whenever we have on the flipped cards here, right? Because it's actually a bit better to do it from within the board because the board has a bit more validation logic here. Uh, if we were to do from within the card every time we click on it, then even when we are not allowed to flip, this would increment the number of card flips. So maybe it's better to do from within the board. Let's use the hook here, const, and then we will just destructure the, the increment function here. So we'll say use statistics like so, and then we can access here increment card flips. Now here we will simply say um, from within our flip card, we will say here, whenever we are setting the cards afterwards, we will simply call the function increment card flips. Let's see if this is working. I'm gonna save it. We will refresh the page. And then once we click here, we can see that we get a new object, which then in turn has a number of card flips set to one. Now let's play a little bit more. Uh, let's test what happens here when I click and the cards are flipped, then nothing happens on the console. So now we have one and let's see how many card flips we got. I'm just gonna confirm it. And then you see that we got actually a total of six card flips. So this is working as expected. And the last thing that it's pending for us is whenever we win, we would like to set the end time here for this game as well. This will also be done from within the board component because the board component is the place where we, def where we decide when a game is won. Um, but first we need to expose this function here. We need to expose a function called end game. Right, so I'm gonna scroll down a little bit here, const end game. And the end game is going to again do exactly the same thing. So as you can see here, we are using this open game for quite a few cases. We will extract this in an upcoming lecture to a common function. We'll do a bit of refactoring on the statistics here and we'll make it much easier to work with. So the first thing is we get the open game and then here we get the games copy, right? We get the games copy here and here we get exactly the same thing. If there is an open game, if there is an open game, then what we want to do is here we want to set want to make a copy of it and then we want to set the end time to be new date. Okay, so just a basic one here. We're just storing the date in the end time and then we want to call again the set games with the games copy. So within our end game function here. Let's now save this and let's expose this function as well. We will need to add it here. Once again, start new game and then we'll say end game that is the same. We will use again uh, a default function which just has the, so let's respect the order here. It just has an, a return of undefined so it doesn't do anything in practice. And then here we can expose the end game function here. End game like so. We can then retrieve this function from within our, our use statistic hooks and then return it here as well with the end game. Okay, so once we have this, now we can remove the comments here. Once we have this, we can then go back to our board. We can access this end game here, end game, and then we can use it whenever we call the timeout. Here we'll transform this into two lines. We will then here simply call the end game, and then we want to alert that we have one. Let's see if this is working as expected here. Let's go back to the browser and let's try to win this game. So now you see that every time we click on something, it prints again. And then here, once we press OK, we have a last print here, which is going to show that we have an end time, right? So now here we are at the state that if we click on restart, we then should see it printed again. We have the previous one with the end time still equal to what we had above. And then a different start time here, which has a date that is slightly, slightly in the future. Let me increase this a little bit and we can see the difference. And sorry, we, we should compare the start time of the second object because of course the start time of the first one is in the uh, is, is less than the end time, right? Uh, but here we should compare with the start time of the second object. So now we have uh, quite a few interesting things here. We are storing the number of card flips. We are storing the start time. We're storing the end time and we are storing each game in its own key. The last thing I would like to do here is for us to move from the app.tsx file this start new game call here to within 
our board component. Why am I doing this? It is basically because if we let's let's leave this as it was before, right? So I'm just going to leave it here with the use effect like so. Let's come back here. Let's refresh. Let's switch to the statistics. Once we switch to statistics and we switch back to the board, um, this resets the game or rather it restarts the game because we have the message here also that this will reset the game, right? Um, and when we come back to the board, this resets the game, but because the overall, the wrapping app component is not re-rendered, we are not triggering that use effect that we would like to trigger. So, and actually here we are triggering the use effect on the app component only on the first render of the whole thing. So this will also not help us even if the app component were to re-render. So here we want to switch back to the board component or rather we want to move this use effect to the board component so that we can call this from within the board component. And then we know that it's going to render the, the component, the, the mount lifecycle method or the use effect without any dependencies every time that it is rendered on the screen. That means every time we also switch back to board. So here let's have the use effect like so and let's access the start new game here. Let's save this and let's see whether this solves our problem. So now we refresh this, we come to statistics, we leave the game. Once we come back to the board, then we start a new game. And then we can see also here that the previous game is closed with a defined end time. Maybe the best way here would be to actually from within our, from within our header component, right? We could also use here the end game and then we could also, or rather it's not in the header, but it's within the app.tsx here where we do the on select screen, right? So here we would actually end the game. Let's then access this here and game like so. And then whenever we select the screen, if the screen is equal to statistics and the user confirms, then we will end the game. Otherwise we will let the game continue. Okay. So now let's see if this can be a little bit better. Um, uh, behavior is going to be a little bit more realistic. So we have the start time of 21:45:30. Once we switch to statistics, and we cancel it, then nothing happens. But once we switch again to statistics here, then we immediately get the, the updated object, which then has an end time, which is slightly further into the future. Now, when we come back to the board, we get the updated object, which contains a new entry, this 6C1 here. And this has, again, just the start time. So this is the behavior that we want. It's a little bit better in terms of computing the actual start and end time of the game. So let's take a quick pause now and come back in the next lecture. Welcome back. In this video, we will fix this warning here, which says that we are not passing the start new game as a depends, dependency to this hook. As it turns out, this change here will actually require quite a bit of effort from our side, but it's a very valid one and in a very useful one to understand how React works behind the scenes whenever we are adding some dependencies to this dependencies array. Our first thought could be to just add the start new game here as a dependency. However, the moment we do that, we can see we start getting a lot of errors on the, not errors, but a lot of prints here on the console. And they're actually, um, basically we are stuck in an infinite loop here. I have mentioned this previously in the course this is very common source for bugs. And sometimes we see this message here, the maximum update depth exceeded. This means that we are just in an infinite loop. And in our case here, it's the last one, the cause that one of the dependencies changes on every render. Let's understand what is actually happening here. Once we pass the start new game as a dependency, okay, this is a function. It's a reference to a function which is defined inside of our use statistics hook. If we come here to our use statistics hook on the top, it simply takes the reference from our context, the function start new game, and the function is here then defined inside of our context. Now this is a reference which is assigned to this start new game variable. From within our start new game variable, we are setting the game's state. There is this games here and there's set games. And then we are setting the state here for a new object, which means that the games object here, the reference, its value and its reference changes, which triggers a re-render of this entire component here. Remember, 
changes in state are one of the reasons for components to re-render. To re now once this re-renders, the start new game function is redefined here. This, this function is defined once again and the reference stored in the start new game variable changes as well. That means that this start new game here, it's actually triggering a function within our statistics context which changes the start new game itself. This might sound a little bit crazy at, at, at first but it's actually very common behavior here because it's a very common use case to set the state from within a certain function in the component. And once we have this, that the state is set here, this will trigger a re-render, an update of this component which will then redefine the reference to this, to this function here. So how do we fix that? Well, one possible solution would be for us to really try to do a lot of work here to keep this reference outside of the component so that the reference doesn't change itself. But honestly, I find it, it, it will lead to a much harder to understand code. So what we will do here instead is we will create a function or rather we will use another hook that is provided by React for us to be able to have a stable reference here for our start new game. And this hook is called use callback. Okay, so use callback is another hook from React. And what use callback does is it provides a stable reference for a certain function. So the use callback here, it takes as a first argument the function and as a second argument, an array of dependencies. Okay, so here, once we use the use callback like so, it will provide a stable reference to this function here defined on inside as a first parameter. And it will change the reference only when the dependency array changes. Or rather not when the dependency array changes, but when any of the dependencies mentioned inside of the dependency array change. Here we will not have to define any dependency. You see that it says that React hook callback has a missing dependency games. But instead of actually passing the game's dependency here, because this would even this would also create an infinite loop if we just pass the games here and we come back, we see that we still have the infinite loop because the games also changes with this call to the set games, right? So instead of passing games here as a reference or as a dependency, we will use the version that we have already seen that we pass a function here to our set games function call. So we will pass a function where the first element is the games element and this is the previous games state and then here we will return a new object. We simply return a new object here which is going to be our new games value like so. So now we need to do a few changes here to make sure that we have everything in order. So let's keep it like so and now we need to move the things from within our and I just saved this to, to format it a little bit better, but now we need to move the logic here from outside of the set games function to within the function. So I'll just copy paste this here like so. And then I don't need to define, you can see that the warning here simply disappears and I don't need to define the games dependency anymore. This is because games is coming here from the first parameter of this function that we are passing to set games. You might be asking yourself, why don't we need to pass the set games here as a dependency to the dependencies array? And this is because dispatcher functions, if we hover here over the set games, we can see react.dispatch. So functions or values of this type of react.dispatch, they are by default stable, so they don't change between re-renders. We could still add this to our, to our array here. And this is not going to make any difference. We could also remove it and then that would be already good enough. Once we save this and come back to the browser, then we can see that the infinite loop actually stopped. So we were able to address this problem of infinite loop here or the, or the constant re-rendering by instead of redefining the function in every render or in every re-render, in every update of our component, by using the use callback hook, which then provides a stable reference, this start new game is going to have a stable reference, except when any of its dependencies change. Since there are no dependencies here and the set state we don't need to pass as a dependency because it is stable by default. So since there are no dependencies here, then this reference to this function will not change. 
For the sake of consistency we will use the same principle here for end game and also for increment the card flips, right? Since because they all work with the game's object and they don't depend on anything else other than the game's object. We will use the same principle to make sure that these functions here don't eventually lead to unwanted infinite loops. So we will use the use callback and here we will pass again no dependencies. We will then within our set games pass the games object here as the first parameter and now here we can return again our games copy like so and now we can copy and paste this logic here or rather cut and paste inside the, of the function that we pass to the set games function the same thing for the increment card flips use callback and here we will now instead of having directly a function we will wrap it on the use callback hook and then inside of set games once again games we will cut and paste this code inside like so and then here we will return the games copy okay so once we do that then we are good to go here i can remove this and we are missing just one curly brackets once i save this then the code gets a little bit better formatted and we are safe now that our functions will not re-trigger or they will not be redefined they are, their references will not change between re-renders which means they will not lead to this infinite loops i would now like to extract this into its own function so that because since we use this in several places let's just extract this it, it is written three times so we'll simply say const get open game key right and this is then uh, the function which will receive all our all our games here the games and this is going to be of a shape games like so and then we are simply returning object.entry so it's the same thing we are just iterating over a games object and then we are returning the key of the first open game we can now use this here within our first function so we'll simply say get open game key with our games array like so and then here i want to change a little bit the logic because uh, let me save this and come back to the browser you will see that we actually have two games here one of them is open and close at the same time so the same second just a few milliseconds in between and the second one is open and this is because um, remember the strict mode of react and this renders twice which means that our games are actually there isn't yet enough time here or rather actually there is a react or, or our application is initializing the game it gets immediately re-rendered once it gets re-rendered immediately it closes that open game this is the first one here and then it creates a second one this means that although this is acceptable i wouldn't say that this is a bad thing we have always this game here that doesn't really add any value and in other applications more complex applications this could actually be okay this could be a problem so one way for or rather this is a sign that perhaps we can improve our code we can improve our design a little bit and that's what we're gonna do here instead of closing the game directly with every start a new game what we will do is we will ignore the 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 function here to the function call to start a new game if there is an open game right so we'll just say here if there is an open game then we will simply return games like so so we're just going to return the same thing if there is an open game that is already good for us here um, and we don't need to start another game that's the logic here so basically if we want to start something and there is something already running then it doesn't make sense to stop what we are running so we will assume that the call to the start new game is not responsible for closing any of the open games and then whoever is using this function call here to start a new game has to first close the previous game if they want to okay so this is going to reduce a little bit the scope of this function even though this has some advantages for example now when we are re-rendering our our application it's not going to open and close a game immediately this also has the disadvantage that other parts of the code need to be aware that they should close a game before starting a new one 
if they want to. It may be the case that they don't want to, that they just want to call this function here and they should they, they rely on the fact that this function is smart enough not to start a new game if there is one already running. But anyway, this here we are entering into what we would call like business logic decisions is like how should how should the user experience be like for us here. The important thing is that we just want to have a clean code working here in a clean state and we don't want to have this kind of uh, very small minor deviations on behavior. So um, here instead of games copy we don't need to make a games copy we can just simply return a spread of games this is already enough here and then we will add a new one. Now once we save this and we come back to the screen and we refresh it then we will see that we have just one here which is already open, right? So this now prevents us from closing this game and adding a new one. And this just leads to a slightly cleaner state. Once again, we had to do this just because of React strict mode, which was indicating that we were executing this extra, or we were adding this extra game to our game's state. We could also have other logic, which would say, ah, if a game duration is less than a second, do not include it, remove from the game's state. So that would be another way of keeping our state cleaner. So there are different possibilities here. I'm just choosing one of them, the simplest one but this will depend on, a, on the use case. Now that we have done this and we just return the games here, then this function is pretty clean. I would say that it's good enough to leave it like this. And let's then use here also this one, get open game key for our games. And then we'll simply say if there is an open and then here we would preferably make the copy of the games object already beforehand because we will change some of the things here. But in the end, we are actually changing still the original object that is stored in our games array, uh, in our games object. And that's because we are making a shallow copy of games here. That means that the reference is going to change but um, or rather that the game's copy reference will point will be different than the game's reference but still this is an object of objects so this is basically an object like so right so i'm just writing it here it is an object which has a key and say abc and this key is another object and this other object has a start time key for example I don't need to put it like this. It has a start time in, and which has some value and it has an end time or rather here not no but number for example of card flipped and flipped and so on. So um, when we do a shallow copy like this then the reference that is stored by games copy is different than the one that games is pointing to but the underlying references so the reference to this object here is still the same. So in the end if we are modifying a certain object that is stored in games copy we are also modifying the underlying games object. So here it wouldn't make a lot of difference, it wouldn't make a big difference here if we were to make this copy. We can just remove this and then here we could say games, open games and then games like so. And then here we would also say and here it is important that we return a shallow copy that the reference changes. Here on the top you see that we just return the traditional games and this is going to point to the same, still to the same reference. This is not going to update the value of games. It's not going to trigger a re-render here due to the update of the value games. So this here, this copy, this shallow copy will cause an update because here we will return a new reference. So we can make the copy here or we can make the copy on the top. Bottom line here is that if we want it to be 100% immutable, we would have to go beyond only, only making this game's copy object here on the top. And the same thing here, we would say get open game key with our games object. Then here we are not gonna make a copy. And then here we will just say games with an open game that would be a games with the open game then here that will be games and then here we will return our games or a copy our games of our games object let's save this let's go back to the code to the to the application 
and let's see if everything is working fine. Let's go back to our application and we'll see that we have introduced a small bug. Now, once we click on restart here and we press OK, then nothing happens. And this is because we have removed the logic of start new game of closing any open game. So now when we are in our app.tsx file here, then within our on restart game, we will first need to end our current game and then start a new game. I'm gonna save this. And then once we come back here, I refresh it, I click on restart, I press okay. And then you will see that we have completed our first game and that we have started a new one. Now, once we click on a card, then we see that the value here, the new object at the bottom has a new number of card flips. And once we click on the second one, then we can just finish playing the game here. And we will see that this will eventually lead to a lot of changes on the state, right? So here now we have one, that's great. And then here we see that in the end, we have 12 card flips until we have won the game. And we have again here roughly 25 seconds, 24, a little bit less. That's it for this video. We now have a couple of stable functions that we can use within our statistics provider. And this is something which is particularly important when we are working with React context. That is because once a certain context gets re-rendered, then every child of that context will go through the update lifecycle. This can be quite heavy computationally if you're not careful regarding what you put inside of the context. At the same time, it is also the responsibility of the context not to provide functions or references which change very often. The context should not be used to store application-wide state that changes very often because any change to these states will trigger a re-render of a big part of the application. So the, the context here, the React context, is really very useful whenever we need to provide some business logic that is related to different components or that is triggered by different components, but that we don't want to pass everything always explicitly down via props. Let's take a quick pause now and let's come back in the next lecture. Welcome back. In this video, we're gonna finish the implementation of the statistics screen. That's gonna be a very straightforward one. I just want to show you how we can use, once again, the values that we are storing inside of our React context. But first here, if we look at our output of our compilation from, from the terminal, we see that we have a warning saying that the hook here in, in line 68 of our board component has a missing, depend, missing dependency to end game. So we need to include it. And we always want to be, a, it, it's always recommendable to stick to the, to the rules here. Really, there are reasons, there are, there are motives, there, are, there is a motivation behind each of these rules. They are not without any point or without any purpose. So let's just simply add our end game here. And if it is hard to add these dependencies without really tr triggering infinite re-renderers or without leading to bugs in the application, then it, the problem is not in the rule, really. The problem is on the design of the application. There is something there that needs to be fixed, okay? So the rules are here to help us. And as long as we comply to them, then we can really work with the expected behavior from React. Yeah, as soon as we deviate from the rules, then there is no guarantee from the React side that the application will behave according to what we expect it will do. If we abide by the rule here, if we keep all the dependencies inside of our dependencies array, then it is guaranteed that this use effect here is gonna run as expected, okay? So as long as we add this here, there is no problem to our game. So there are no warnings anymore. And if we come back to the browser here, and then everything is still working as expected. Now on to our statistics screen and here we will simply retrieve the value. This is at the very bottom here. We'll simply retrieve the value of our statistics and this will use our use statistics hook. And then here all we will do is we'll simply return a div with an inline styling here with an inline styling of a padding of one rem. And then inside here we will say a block of preformatted code and we will use json.stringify whatever component here. So the statistics, and this is just for us to print it a little bit nicer on the screen. Okay, so now we'll say then completed games, like so. Once I save this and I come back to the browser, 
let's play a little bit i'm just gonna go ahead and here i will edit this out but i just want to play a few games uh, before showing you the statistics screen okay great so i played a few games you can see here there are a couple of console log statements once i click on statistics and i press ok this will reset the game then we can see that everything is stored in a nice object that we can use later on for further calculations if we wanted to for example calculate the average duration of the game or the average number of card flips and all, all these little things we could definitely do that and here I'm just showing you how we could retrieve this value that is stored inside of our React context, inside of our statistics provider for usage in any other components that are under our statistics provider wrapper component. Great, so this wraps up our discussion on React context. This was a long one, but very, very important one because this is something, this, this touches on a lot of different things, a lot of different behaviors of React, especially regarding what happens when state changes and also when function references or when object references change during re-renders. Let's take a quick pause now and let's come back in the next lecture. Up until now, we worked with a React application that was scaffolded, that was generated from our npx create react app script. This does a lot behind the scenes, but I also think it's very important that you know how to set up a React project from scratch, supporting the most important elements like TypeScript, just and a testing setup with React testing library and also supporting static files such as JPEG or PNG or SVG files as well as CSS files. This and the upcoming videos will focus on creating this app from scratch so that you can understand all the details, everything that has to happen behind the scenes so that we can have a working React application. Let's start by generating a folder here. We'll simply say React from scratch and we will switch into this folder and now we will initialize our npm application so we'll say npm init and then we can pass a dash y here this is going to simply ignore our answers to questions it's just gonna choose a a default value for each of the questions if we omit the dash y then we will be asked a couple of things and then here we could say um, we can start answering right so what's the package name react from scratch the version 1.0.0 and then here we could say setting up a react project from scratch um, the entry point is going to be index.js for now we don't need to change this for now because this will be published afterwards it will be built and published not published with webpack but it's going to be built with webpack and uh, the important information for entry point is in the webpack configuration so we don't need to worry too much about the entry point here in our uh, in our npm file and the test command for now we're going to leave it empty we're going to edit this once we add the support for jest so we just leave it empty and there is no git repository there are no keywords there is no author i could put myself here uh, and you could put yourself as well um, license will just leave it as it is and this is going to generate some configuration for us that is going to be saved under the package.json file within the folder that we are initializing if we are okay with this then we can just press enter and as soon as we 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 issue the list command the ls command and we see that there is a package.json file generated here we are initializing an npm project because we want to install and manage dependencies as well via npm the version I'm using here is version 8.5, but you can also use later versions, any 8.x and I believe also 9.x, there is a new major release, should be compatible with this. Since we are using pretty much standard commands here, not doing anything fancy or super advanced, I believe there are no breaking changes between version 8.x and 9.x for our use case here. Once we have npm set up, we can also initialize our git repository. So we'll say git init, this initializes an empty repository under this folder here and the first thing I like to do whenever I initialize a git repository is to touch the git ignore because I want to as soon as possible edit this git ignore file here so that we don't 
commit any unnecessary or sensitive files as well as we go along. So for example, .m file could hold sensitive information. We want to avoid from the very beginning to commit such files. So we can open this. In my case here, I'm gonna use Visual Studio Code. We can open this folder here and we can start editing the files in the IDE. For the sake of simplicity, I'm taking a template here. You can find this if you Google just a node.js.gitignore file. And this has a bunch of files that we would like to ignore from the get-go. It doesn't have all of them, but you can see there are quite a few um, directories here. For example, the node modules is a directory that we want to, to always ignore because it's very heavy, lots of files, and uh, we, we shouldn't really commit the node modules. We should commit package.json and package.log.json and then always install the dependencies within whatever environment we are running our code. But here we can also see the .m file and there are a few other things. For example, the dist folder can be useful. So I'm just gonna copy the whole thing and there are many files here that we are not going to, to create any of these extensions, but for the sake of completeness and since we don't need to worry too much about um, the extensions here changing on the files, then we can just um, add this directly to git ignore. And another thing that I would like to do is um, we see a dist folder here, right? So maybe we can um, directly here remove this next.js. We're not gonna use next, we're not gonna use next. So um, we could say build output directories. And this would be, for example, out is a is a possibility. This is a possibility. Build is another possibility. So um, we also don't want to commit build rip, uh, build folders here. What we want to do is we want to execute the build command in whatever environment we are running our code. For example, in a CI/CD pipeline, this um, build command is going to then generate our output folder, and then uh, we can use that folder. We don't need to commit this here in our local because um, this changes very often and then there are very often big changes to these folders whenever we are rebuilding the application committing it just adds noise it basically doesn't add any benefit other than a noise to our commits good so that's the root folder setup for now we can now come back to our to our terminal here let me clean it up and i'm gonna also create another directory called source and within source we are going to touch the index.html file. So this index.html file here is uh, similar to the file that we saw at the very beginning of the course that is shipped with create react app. So we're gonna just copy paste some boilerplate code here. And we can also type it if you want, but um, that is really boilerplate. I think we can also get from create react app if we want to, and we could, um, we could clean it up. But here, we're just gonna create a very simple, a very simple file. So we're gonna say doc type, right? So doc type is going to be HTML. And then we have HTML, a language is going to be English. It don't need to add this um, English necessarily here, but just for the sake of completeness. Then we have head and within head, we have a couple of meet meta tags. We are using UTF-8, right? So this is going to be UTF-8. Uh, this is a self-closing tag, so meta you can just self-close. And then a few other important informations here for the viewport. Viewport, and then we have some um, more information here. The content is going to be width is equal to device width. The initial here, the initial scale is going to be to one, set to one. And we will say that no, we don't want to shrink to fit. Right? So shrink to fit here is just gonna be set to no. And I'm going to also self-close this tag. Once I save this, then it should format a little bit better the file. That should be enough for, for meta tags. We can also add the title tag. And the title tag is not self-closing. So we'll simply say react from scratch with webpack and TypeScript. Yeah, so that's just um, everything that we're gonna set up. I mean, we could use webpack, babel, jest, and so on and so forth, but just, um, we could maybe just leave React from scratch like so. And then here we're interested in adding a body. And if there is no JavaScript um, enabled, then we want to simply print a message. You need to enable JavaScript to run this app, right? And then here 
uh, we have a div with an ID of root. And as you might already imagine, this is exactly what we're going to use with our React application. We're going to get by get element by ID of with an ID of root, and then we use this to mount our React application. So this is the root of our React application in the future. Let's save this. And the last thing I want to add here within our source directory is just an index.jsx file. Okay, so this is a, a placeholder for later. We're just gonna leave the file as it is. For now, let's take a short break and we will come back in the next video. Welcome back. In this video, we're gonna set up React by installing the dependencies and writing a bit of code inside of our index.jsx file. Back in the terminal, let's go back to the root repository. And here we want to install the React dependencies. We will say dash dash save exact with the npm install command so that everyone works with the same exact versions. Okay, if you don't add this React exact, it may be the case you will install some later versions of React, which may have some incompatible changes. It, it's unlikely to be the case, but just to be sure that everyone is on the same page, we're gonna save exact here. I will show you exactly what it does. So we will install React with the version 18.2.0 and react-dom with the version also 18.2.0. And once we execute this script, then we will add five packages. And if we come back here, we'll see that they are added under the dependencies object of our package JSON. And here you can see that it is simply saving the exact number. So there is no caret here at the beginning. This is very common to, to see in package.json files. And this simply means uh, fix the first uh, the first number, fix the major version. But if there are any later minor or patch versions, you can also install them, right? So this is a common practice to have. I personally prefer to fix the version specifically here um, so that we make sure that whenever we are installing this in different environments, then we have exactly the same version. Once we have this installed here, then we can import React from React. And then here we could say export, or we could say, for example, here import React DOM from React DOM. And this doesn't need to be React. This can be like so React DOM from React dash DOM. And then here we want to create our root where we actually render our application. We'll simply say React dot React DOM dot create root. And then here you see that um, there was no auto suggestion here. We actually need to import from the client. And then here we can use react dom dot create root by document dot get element by ID. And this again is our root ID, right? So this is our div here, which was added inside of our there's no semicolon. This is the div here that was added inside of our index.html. So we are simply creating a react dom root here at this div. Now here within our root, we can simply say root.render and this could be any React application, could be react.strict mode. We already know how this works and this could simply say hello world, for example. Once we save this, then we have it a bit better formatted. Um, the problem here is that even though we have this set up, we have absolutely no way of compiling this application into a standard JavaScript application. Here we have JSX and JSX is simply not understood by the browser. So we need a way of compiling this React application into an actual HTML plus JavaScript application. And this is done via majorly two tools, Webpack and Babel. So let's take a quick pause here. And in the next video, we will start with the setup of Webpack. Welcome back. Let's start with the setup of Webpack in this video. We come to the terminal here and we would like to install a couple of dependencies for Webpack. So we'll install and once again, we will use the save exact. We will install Webpack and the version we will use here is 5.75.0. We'll then install also the Webpack CLI with a version of 5.0.1. We will install the Webpack dev server so that we can develop locally and have a um, dev server with quite a few good and important functionalities. This is going to be the version 4.11.1. And then we'll also install the HTML Webpack plugin here. And this is going to be with a version 5.5.0. This is gonna give the foundation for us to work with Webpack. Later on, we will see how we can extend the functionality and add more features to our Webpack configuration by installing, by adding modules. 
Also within our root directory, we will touch the file webpack or we will create the file webpack.config.js. And this is the main file where we're gonna configure all our webpack application. We can have multiple files and use different configuration files depending on the environment that we are in. But for the sake of simplicity here, we're gonna just work with one webpack config file. Back in our back in our IDE, let's open it and we will the first thing is we will require a couple of necessary dependencies. We will require path and we will also require the HTML webpack plugin. And this is going to be require HTML webpack plugin like so. Now here, what we need to do is we just need to export here module.exports is equal to an object and this object contains the webpack configuration. The first key is going to be called entry and the entry here establishes what is the entry point for webpack to start the compilation process. So this is going to be path.join and here we'll simply pass a special variable, their name, and we'll say source and then the final part of the path is index.jsx. So this defines the entry point to start the compilation. We then have the output key and this defines the other end of the process. This defines the directory where the, the build application, the compiled application is gonna be saved into. So we'll simply say here, this is an object and we can pass here the options path and the path is going to be again path.join and we'll say again their name and here we're going to output into the build folder but if you want you could also use this for example I'm just going to say build and the file name here we are going to simply say um, index.bundle.js okay so important to see here that we're going to use a .js extension not a .jsx right so jsx is not um, process is not, browsers cannot understand JSX, we need to have in the end vanilla JavaScript files. Let's now define another key that's called the mode key and this is normally alternating between production or development but it's also often set via a process via an environment variable and so you will see also uh, in some cases you may see a process.env.node.env and this is a used convention that is commonly used to say where we are building the application. If this is undefined then we will simply take development. That means that for production applications, you should have the node env set to production, right? So uh, if you have your few, if you're building this in a CI environment, then you should set as an environment variable the node env with, so the key node env set to the value production like so, right? So here we'll simply say development, since um, if this is not set, we may want to have some additional or we don't need to set this locally for us. Um, but anyway, that's just convention. You could also fail the whole build if this is not defined to be a little bit more strict. Um, but that is the mode. So there are a couple of differences between development and production. And um, this is how we can differentiate whenever we are building the application in different environments. Another important key here for us to include is the resolve key. And the resolve key here is important so that we can work with relative in. Um, relative paths. We will add the modules option and then here we'll simply say path.resolve and then this is once again their name and here we just want to add the root folder of our application or rather the source folder right this is not the the root fo folder here react from scratch but it is the source folder where all the application code is going to be stored. We then also want to resolve relative dependencies or relative imports within the node modules folder so we will add this here to the array after we add the, the first option. Then we have another option which is important for our local development server and that is the dev server here and we can pass again another object here we'll say static and static is going to be path.join and this is just going to be once again their name and source. Okay, so this is uh, simply saying the the um, folder which needs to be served as static files in our dev server. This can be our directly our source folder, uh, but it can also be a source forward slash or source public, for example, right? This is also common practice where we put uh, static assets within a public folder within our source directory and then we should update the configuration here. For now, for the sake of simplicity, let's just leave source. Um, and here we add a final, a final um, option, which is the plugins. 
plugins option and the first one that we're going to use is simply say new HTML web plugin and here we'll say template and template is going to be path.join once again their name source and then our index.html file what does this HTML webpack plugin does is it takes this file this index.html file and as it is building our application, it makes sure that we are injecting this index.bundle.js file into our, into our index.html file. So it makes sure that we connect the index.html to the index.bundle.js file so that the JS file is actually loaded once we open the HTML file. Another change that we can do here is we can come to package.json and we can add a couple of scripts under our scripts key. So if we say uh, build, for example, this will simply be webpack. And this is going to invoke the webpack CLI behind the scenes. Uh, and this will look into the webpack.config.js and it's going to build our application. And we can also add a dev option here and the dev is going to be webpack serve. Now webpack serve is going to look into the webpack CLI and once it sees the serve option, it's going to look into our webpack dev server package. And then this is going to start our local development server. In our terminal, we can try to run npm run build, for example, um, but this is unlikely to work. And that's exactly because uh, it, it has an unexpected token here. You see that it doesn't know how to handle this react the dot strict mode. And this is because it doesn't know how to handle JSX files. Now remember, JSX is not vanilla JavaScript. It is, it needs to be transpiled into JavaScript after, uh, in the end. So this transpilation process, this, this trans translation between JSX and a vanilla JavaScript needs to be done outside of Webpack. This is where Babel comes in. Babel does this transpilation between JSX and JavaScript. And that's what we're going to set up in the next video. So let's take a short pause and come back in the next lecture. Welcome back. In this video, we continue with the setup from our React from scratch application and we will work towards fixing this webpack error by installing and properly configuring our Babel configuration. Let's start by installing the dependencies and these dependencies we can save as development dependencies that because they are not needed in production, they are needed just for the building of the code. So we're going to save dev and we'll also save exec. And perhaps here I can actually just clean the screen so that we have a um, better overview. We will start installing the Babel core dependency and the version that we will use here is 7.20.12. We'll then also install Babel forward slash preset env and this version is going to be 7.20.2. The preset env is useful whenever we are trying to transpile JavaScript and add polyfill to, so that more modern JavaScript is too compatible with older versions of the browser. So not every web API is available in older browsers. And the preset M from Babel can help polyfilling the most common web APIs by either providing a mock or a stub implementation, but at least making sure that the application doesn't break in older browsers. We also want to install here Babel forward slash preset React and this is going to be version 7.18.6 and finally we want to install the Babel loader this is for webpack so that webpack doesn't doesn't throw the errors that it has been throwing us and it's going to be version 9.1.2 once we have installed the dependencies we can then create the file .babelrc. There are also possibilities to use babel.config.js, but here we'll just use babelrc. And then here in our IDE, we can simply use curly brackets, we'll say presets, and then this is going to contain two values. The first one is going to be at babel forward slash env, and the second one is going to be at babel forward slash react, like so. Now, once we save this and we try to, to execute our code, let's see if everything is working. We will run the build command and let's see, we still get the error because we forgot to add the Babel loader to our webpack configuration. So here under module.exports, we can create a new entry that's going to be called module. And then here we have an entry which is called rules. And then rules is an array. 
and here we will pass multiple tests that we can execute depending on the file extensions. The first file extensions that we are interested in are the, and here I'm just gonna add this as a new line, that is going to be, and here I'm using a regular expression, so we'll simply say dot, and here let's say JSX, and the X here can be optional, so we'll simply do it like so and then we can say this is going to be the end of our file name now we can close the regular expression and here we can say can also exclude the node modules just for the sake of completeness so we exclude node modules and then here we will add use loader babel loader like so one more thing that we can add here within our options is we can say that this is going to use a certain preset presets and this is going to be our at babel forward slash preset dash env like so now we'll save this and let's try to run this uh, command npm run build again and now as you can see everything was executed successfully if we open our IDE, we will see that there is a new build folder here and here you can see the index.html file as well as the index.bundle.js that we have indicated here within our Webpack configuration, right? So this here was the file that was generated as an output of our compilation process. If we were now to come here with our index.html and then right click and then say go live or open with a live server then let's see that should already give us perfect that gives us the page here so as you can see this hello world is the value that comes from our index.jsx right so this here is already being shown on the screen it's already served which means that this application within our build folder already is it has a basic structure that can already work in modern and also in older browsers because we are using this polyfilling functionality from babel we can also try to run our dev command and then as you can see here this is going to initialize a webpack server and let's now change a little bit here you see that the webpack server is running on port 8080 okay this is a live server that is basically compiling the files and then serving them so we can come here to the browser and let's leave the 5500 port open here in one tab and let's open the localhost colon 8080 in another now you see here that we also have the hello world this is a little bit bigger because the browser has some some zoom once i reset it everything will be fine now the difference here is that when we run the webpack dev server this will auto reload this will hot reload whenever we make changes to a file so if we say goodbye Right, so goodbye world we save this and we scroll down you see that it gets again recompiled here and if we come back to the browser page then now the 8080 says goodbye world but the 5500 still says hello world so the 5500 contains a list of static assets that is a result of our webpack compilation but it's not actively looking at the code and it's not updating its contents if we want to do that we would need to within a terminal run the build command again and this build command simply outputs the files and then if we were to come back here and refresh it then you can see that it already has the new value so this is the difference between the webpack dev server it is something that automatically reloads whenever we make a change to the code and this when comparison to the result of the build command of the webpack simple webpack command this simply outputs the files and we can then here we are serving it via an extension in our vs code ide right so via this extension here which is the um, live server live server extension so this helps us serve html files and then since the we can see here since the index.bundle.js is then injected into our html file this is a result of that html webpack plugin um, this is then also loaded whenever we open this file in the browser now that we have our application up and running, let's take a short pause and let's come back in the next video. Welcome back. In this video, we're gonna add support for loading and properly handling CSS files in our React application. We will start by installing the necessary dependencies. So we will save this not as, yeah, we can save it as dev because this is needed only whenever we are building the code. And then we can save the exact versions here. And this is going to be the style loader. 
and the style loader is going to be the version 3.3.1 and also the CSS loader and the CSS loader will be the version 6.7.3 once we install this, then we can go to our Webpack configuration file and then add the respective loader. So the process here is really very similar to whenever we want to add new files or new behavior to Webpack. Much of it is going to fall under this module rules. And basically we're going to add a very similar structure here where we, instead of testing for JS or JSX files, we will test for CSS or SCSS files. Here we can exclude non modules or we can also remove this. It doesn't really matter here. And then we we'll want to use instead of passing an object, there is a um, slightly cleaner version or rather a uh, more concise version where we don't need to pass the whole object here. We can simply pass an array of the loaders that we want to use. So we want to use first the style loader and then we want to use the CSS loader. Now this is okay when we are fine with going with the default options here, but whenever we want to customize something, then we would also pass an object with a loader key. This is going to indicate the loader and also some additional options here whenever needed. Now here within our source directory, let's add a new file. We're gonna call this index.css and we'll simply say dot red text like so and this is just going to have a color of red All right so nothing fancy here we just want to make sure that this is working as expected now within our index.jsx file here we can wrap this goodbye world in, uh, in between divs so we're just going to put div and div and then here we can say class name that's simply going to be red text now i'm going to copy paste this here and once we start our development server let's try here again we should see on the screen that this is going to have a red text so within our not the 5500 but the 8080 let's refresh this and of course i'm missing a very small detail here is that we need to actually import the files somewhere in our javascript code so here it can be like so index.css once we save this then we will see the styles that are applied so this file here is necessary for us to add at any point in our application but ideally at the root level to make sure that it's always loaded because otherwise webpack doesn't know that it needs to load this css file so we always have to add it here and then webpack is going to do the job of loading the file if we had multiple files and in different jsx files we wanted to import these different css files that's also possible and webpack will make sure to take care of it for us we are now able to import and handle css files but there are also other types of static files that we want to be able to handle with webpack we're going to cover that in our next lecture but for now let's take a short break Welcome back. In this video, we're going to see how we can load additional static files or how we can handle additional static files with Webpack. We're going to cover JPEG, we're going to cover PNG and GIF files. And SVG we will cover in a later video since there are a few additional things that we can do with, with SVG or additional libraries that we can use. But for now, let's focus on these files here. I have a nice picture of a code here, very nice code, easy to read. Um, we will import this within our index.jsx and we would like to show that on the screen. So let's just try to import the um, code here, code image from dot forward slash code.jpg and once we try to use that let's see what's going to happen so we will create an image with a source that is going to be our code image and then we're going to save this we have our we have our server running here but as you can see then immediately we get an error from webpack webpack doesn't know how to handle jpeg it doesn't know how to handle this extension so it just throws us an error as you might expect the process for handling it is quite similar to what we have done so far we are going to use a module that is built in in webpack 5 and later versions and if you are using an older version of webpack then we will cover 
cover this on the second part of this lecture. So for now, let's just in immediately, or actually let's not start the, the dev server because whenever we change the Webpack configuration, we need to restart the server. So let's first change the configuration here and we will use a test. And the test here, we would like to test for a couple of extensions. So let me just do it like this first so that now we can focus on adding the extensions. It's going to be the JPEG extension, it's going to be the JPEG like so, it's going to be the PNG extension and also the GIF extension. Now whenever we are, whenever Webpack is, is facing or is meeting one of these files here, then we would like to use here, we would like to use simply the asset forward slash resource. And here it's not used, it's a small difference. Now, whenever we, we are using a built-in module from Webpack, then we can simply indicate that this type here is going to be an, a resource, right? So this here behind the scenes, Webpack is going to evaluate what's the best way of loading and handling these images. And then in the end, it's going to generate and handle everything for us. Once we save this and come back here to our to our ID to our terminal and then we simply run the dev server now we should be able to see everything compiled correctly here and if we come back to the browser and refresh the page then we see a very very big code image here so this is the basic principle for handling static assets with webpack 5 or a greater version now you will also come across a, another approach, which is by, again, using a loader, okay? And the, the loader that is used here, let's come back to our, to our terminal. The loader that is used here is called a file loader. So we're gonna save dev again, save exact, and that's going to be file-loader at 6.2.0. Okay, once we install this, we can then add this loader here instead of type, we'll say use. And then very simply here, once again, an array, file-loader. We're gonna save this back here in the terminal. Let's run dev and we should see exactly the same result on the browser. Everything is successfully compiled. And once we come back here, we see exactly the same behavior. If we open the Webpack page for file loader, you see here at the very top uh, a warning saying that this has been deprecated for version 5. Please consider migrating to asset modules. And once we open this, then we have exactly the same that we were using here, asset resource, asset inline, asset source, and asset. Uh, there are different ways that this is handled by Webpack behind the scenes. We're, gonna not, we're not gonna go into the details here, but in case you would like to, to read this in details, and I highly recommend you do so. There are lots of very good um, documentation here, especially regarding the loaders. If we come back, then you see all the different loaders that are supported by Webpack. You have documentation on how to install and how to configure them. And you already know the principle. The principle is simply we need to install the loader via NPM and then add the loader with the respective file extensions to our Webpack configuration here, and then configure the loader whenever needed. Within our Webpack config, let's revert this to using the native module since the file loader is deprecated. We're gonna stop this and we will uninstall, uninstall the file loader here just to be on the safe side. We don't need to have unnecessary dependencies installed in our, in our local environment. So let's just uninstall it. Now we are able to handle JPEG and other static assets, other images. So let's take a short break and let's come back in the next lecture. Welcome back. In this video, we're gonna go through different approaches, how we can handle SVG files in a React application. The SVG files are slightly harder to handle than actual just image files, and that's because they have this XML format. However, this XML format is not JSX, okay? This is pure XML. SVG format. This is not really HTML. It's also not really JSX. So whenever we try to import something like this here, let's say that we want to import, we want to import the logo, right? So maybe if you are already familiar with with the uh, with React and the way that we do things, then we, you could probably say, okay, actually this is this looks like a JSX. Maybe I could just import logo from um, dot logo dot svg like so and then just try to use this 
in here in our code, right? So we could simply try to say logo like so. This is how we import React components and this is how we use them here in our code. Once we save this, come back to the terminal, let's then run the development server. We will see that this is not really going to work because Webpack just doesn't know how to compile it, right? So it says that we need we may need an appropriate loader to handle this file type. And here you can see that it's just giving us the SVG on the screen. Now here within our um, Webpack configuration, the quickest way or the fastest way of doing this, of handling SVGs is to simply use our asset resource. Like so, we add a, an additional SVG here in the end so that SVG files are also handled by our resource or asset forward slash resource. And then within our index.jsx, we can simply add this as logo source and we could use this inside of an image tag so if we were to do it like so image source that's going to be our logo source and i'm going to put this on the top of our image so that on the top of our code image so that we can actually see this back here let's cancel it and start again because we have changed the configuration and now we should see that everything is working as expected once we come back to the browser and come back to our application, refresh it. Then we see the React logo here. And afterwards, we also see the image that is loaded. Although this is the fastest way, at least with our setup now, of getting things to work, this is not really the best way of handling SVGs because SVGs are, are very flexible images and it can be maybe the case that we want to style some parts of the path of an SVG. And this is not really possible when we are passing the source here to an image tag. So an alternative and a more flexible approach is to use a supporting library here we will install the library that's going to be again a development dependency and we will save the exact version and this is svgr forward slash webpack at 6.5.1 this is also the library that is used oops sorry here we are missing an at in the front so we're going to say at svgr forward slash webpack um, sorry i was saying that this is also the method this is that is used by create react app for handling SVG files, okay? We will, in a later video, see how we can navigate the Create React app configuration, and then we will find eventually that they use the SVGR to handle SVG. So we're gonna go with this library. It's a very stable library, very flexible, good to use. And what this library does is it takes SVG files and then it transforms them into React components so that we can use them the same way that we use React components. Now within our Webpack configuration file, we need to add a reference to SVGR. So now here we're gonna remove the SVG from this initial test and we will simply add something else here. We'll say test dot, and then here we want SVG. That is a dollar sign. And then we can close the, the regular expression. We can also omit the, pre, the curly, the round brackets altogether. We can just test for SVG. And then here we can say also, we wanna make sure that the issuer is going to be a JSX or a TSX file later on, but let's use now just JSX like so. And this is not strictly necessary, but I would like to explore the different ways that we can configure things here. And then we want to use, and that is going to be our at SVGR forward slash webpack. Now this allows us to import the files here within our within our index.jsx file as just logo, like so. And then here we can then use this as we would use a React component, right? Logo, like so. We're gonna save this and now we're gonna start once again the development server. We'll see that everything will be working as expected once we come back to the browser and we refresh the page, we see that everything is again displayed as we would like it to. So this is another way of handling SVG files. We will simply leave it at that for now. We don't need to explore the very specific configurations of SVGR. You can always look for this package. For example, let's copy this and paste here. And then we should be already able to get some result or actually the second link here is interesting. It is um, the configuration of our of our SVGR, right? So here they give the, the full version with both JSX and TSX. And they also give the possibility here regarding the options that we can use to configure our webpack. Now, this is here, there are different 
ways that you can use SVGR and there are different platforms, different environments that it supports. So as I mentioned, it's a very, it's a very um, flexible library and it's good to use it to, to handle SVGs. As with everything that we're exploring here, I would definitely recommend reading the documentation, going through the different pages, Webpack, Babel, SVGR, and any other loaders that we are using here, so that you get a good understanding of the scope of these loaders and also how the whole system works together, how everything comes together to generate in the end the static files, the static assets that we serve as a web application. Welcome back. In this video, we're going to integrate TypeScript into our application so that we can benefit from all the static type checking that TypeScript brings. We will start by stopping our running server here and we need to install a couple of packages, namely the TypeScript package as well as a couple of additional types so that the application in TypeScript works correctly. Let's start with npm install. We're going to say save exact and save dev since TypeScript is going to be used only during development. In the end, Webpack is going to build the final code, which is purely JavaScript. There will be no TypeScript in the final code, so TypeScript is used only during development. We're going to install the version TypeScript, so TypeScript at version 4.9.5. We also want to install a couple of types here. The first one is at types forward slash react, and the version we want to install is 18.0.28. And the last one is types forward slash react dash DOM. And the version we want to install here is 18.0.11. We have now installed TypeScript and a couple of types, but we haven't really installed the dependencies that we need to be able to transform TypeScript into JavaScript in the end. So we're going to save npm install. Once again, save exact and dash dash save dev. And the first one that we want to install is the Babel preset for TypeScript. So that is at Babel forward slash preset dash TypeScript. And the version we want to install here is 7.18.6. And the last one is TS Loader. This is for Webpack to be able to work with some TypeScript functionality. And the version here that we want is 9.4.2. Once we have installed this, we can now come to our Webpack configuration here and we need to resolve the TypeScript file. Remember that we have here a resolver for JavaScript. This is the Babel loader, but now we want to also resolve TypeScript or TS or TSX files. Here we are going to ditch the JavaScript configuration here because we don't have any JavaScript files in our project anymore or at the end of this video we will not have any. So simply say TSX here and then what we will do is we'll simply use the TS loader. Here I'm going to remove all the options and I'm going to just pass an array with the default configuration for TS loader. This will resolve TypeScript, so TS or TSX files and it will use the TS loader that was just installed. This will make sure that Webpack can properly process the TypeScript files during the build process. We should also not forget to add here under our resolve configuration option, we can also add extensions here to make sure that the TypeScript extensions are properly resolved. We're going to say .tsx, we will say also .ts, and we'll also say .js and .jsx as well, since this can also come from the node modules here, but in the end this should already be in a format that is compatible with most applications. Since the libraries that are under node modules here, they are normally built for a variety of platforms, then we shouldn't have to worry too much about making transpilation here from TypeScript to JavaScript, but nonetheless, just to be on the safe side, since there may be some JSX or JS files coming from node modules that we may have to do a little bit of, not us actually, but Webpack to do a little bit of work there, we're just going to make sure to to include also the JSX and the JS extensions here. That's just a um, um, safety net since in our projects we will be working mostly or solely with TSX and TS files. If you are introducing TypeScript into an existing JavaScript project, then this will also look like this because you will have JSX and JS files existing already. But in addition to them, you would also like to resolve TSX and TS files. Now that we have included the necessary changes here in our configuration, we can come back to the terminal and there is a command that is recommended that we run. And this is npx tsc init. This will generate a TypeScript configuration 
you will see that it says created a new tsconfig.json file and if we open here our IDE you will see the tsconfig.json. There are many many different options here most of them are commented out because the default values are the ones that TypeScript will suggest but here we would like to check a couple of these uh, options to make sure that everything is in order the configuration is compatible with a react application the first one is the target and the target one is es 2016 and here if you need to support older browsers you perhaps want to set the es5 as the target uh, since this is a standard from 2009 that is implemented by pretty much every browser out there or at least every browser that is currently in usage Perhaps this is a safer option here, but nonetheless ES2016 should also work fairly well. The next option that we can customize here is the lib and the library here. You can see in the comments is very nice. It also specifies or it, it describes every individual variable here, every individual configuration and what's its purpose. So the lib is going to set, um, specify a set of bound, uh, bundled library declaration files that describe the target runtime environment, right? So for example, here, one important library is the DOM library and also the DOM.iterable library. Um, here we could say DOM like so, just to be consistent. And then we may also say ES next here in case we want to make sure that we include ES next features in our application. Um, then we have the allow.js and allow.js here, allow.js, it allows you, it enables TypeScript or rather it allows JavaScript files in TypeScript projects. You see that the default here is to true. That means if you have JavaScript project, uh, JavaScript files in your project, then you will want to set this to true. If you set this to false, it's going to be more strict. Another interesting comment here is that there is another option, the check.js option that you can use to get errors from JavaScript files. Even without having them in a TypeScript format, you could check these two and set them to true in case you want to be on the safer side. We're gonna set, we're gonna leave them to true. It doesn't matter if we uncomment it since the default value is already true. We, the next one that we want to check is skip lib check. And this is set to true here. We will leave this set to true because it might be the case that some of the files that are served in our node modules are not 100% compatible. There may be some TypeScript errors there and we don't want to prevent our project from compiling, from building if there are errors in the installed modules, in the installed libraries, because we have very little control over these errors. Sure, best would be that there are no errors here, but there may be cases where we just have no control over it and the TypeScript errors from the node modules should not prevent us from building the application. We will leave this then to true and the next one that we want to check is the ES module interoper interoperability. That's a hard, hard word to say. Uh, this is basically um, to allow us to, to import CommonJS modules via, via the import keyword in TypeScript. And this is very useful because then we can use this without creating, for example, MJS files or CJS files and so on and so forth. We can just use import and then TypeScript is gonna handle this behind the scenes. We then have the also allow synthetic this one allows synthetic default imports and this is exactly what I was just saying, import X from Y when a module doesn't have a default export. Right, so this is uh, just for the sake of better development experience, we can uncomment this and set to true. And the other one that we also want to set to true is isolated modules. We then have a very important option here, it's called strict option. This is already set to true and this is basically um, way st more strict type checking behavior from TypeScript. If we remove this, then we can we have a bunch of options here at the bottom that we could use to customize the type checking behavior. But we want to be as strict as possible because the more strict we are here, the more bugs that we can catch due to type mismatch and the more bugs we can avoid at runtime. Within our module option here, we can set ES next, that will work just fine. And then the module resolution, we will use the node module resolution. Here there is a small comment about it, uh, but if you are curious and interested about how the different module resolution strategies work, then um, 
you can find all the possible options here for TypeScript. If you click on this link, that is going to open a link on the browser and that will explain all the different module resolution strategies. As you can see here, um, the, the Node 16 is a very new one. It's from TypeScript 4.7 onwards. So the Node 1 is the most widespread one and the most used. We're going to leave that as Node. Back to our configuration. The next one that we want to have a look here is the Resolve JSON module. And this is another very useful one uh, because it allows us to import .json files into our code and they are uh, transformed into JavaScript objects. First so JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. That means when we import a JSON file, it's fairly easy to parse it into a JavaScript object for JavaScript. So when we are able to import these JSON files, we may also import, for example, configuration files into our application. There are only two more options that we would like to check here. The no emit one is um, whether we want to enable or disable emitting JavaScript files at the end of a compilation process. This is normally used when we, for example, want to have TypeScript only for type checking, but we don't really want to transform type TypeScript into JavaScript. If you are developing a node application, for example, which will run in a, in a compute environment somewhere, then you can also use, for example, TS node to directly run TypeScript files, you don't need to compile them into JavaScript. So the no emit here could be set to true, for example, and then you would just run the TypeScript command to make sure that there are no errors, but you don't need to generate JavaScript files. Here, we'll simply, we'll set this to false because it's very important for Webpack to be able to emit the files, to be able to simply have the resulting JavaScript at the end of the process. And the last option that we want to check is the JSX option. And here, we will uncomment this and we will say react-jsx. Now, outside of our options here, we don't see anything else. So this is all under compile the compiler options object here, the compiler options map. If we collapse this, then we can here right next to it, we can add a include key. And the include key is an array of locations to include in our configuration. We we'll say include, and then here we'll simply say the source directory. So everything that is under source is going to be included in this TypeScript project. It's very useful to understand that one TS config.json defines one configuration for one TypeScript project. We can have multiple TS config.json files. For example, we want to we, we could have one configuration for the dev environment and one configuration for when building production applications or the production code. And we can run this by simply passing, for example, something like this. So here is just one example. We are not going to do that. Um, we're not going to run these comments, but let's say TSC dev, for example, this would be TSC dash project. And this would be TS config, for example, TS config dot dev dot JSON. Okay. And this could be the case that now we have instead of just TS config dot JSON, we actually have here, let's uh, rename this and then we'll say TS dot dev dot json for example and then this can be used with a different configuration than the ts config dot json and this is going to then be taken into account when running the tsc command now this is more common when we are building node applications or backend applications which will run in a virtual machine but just for you to know that this is possible right so this is also why here when we have the include key we may include different sets of files or we may, we may exclude certain files depending on the project that we are working on Let's delete the tsconfig.dev file here since this is not really important for us. And here we just want to then include the source folder. The next step that we can do here is to rename this to be a tsx file instead of jsx. And the moment we do that, you see that we start getting a couple of errors. That is because we are now actually doing some TypeScript type checking here. And um, TypeScript doesn't know what a .jpg is or what a .svg is. Even though this is already properly handled by Webpack by using our loaders, TypeScript itself behind the scenes doesn't really know how to handle these modules. 
we also have another error here that you will see that TypeScript is saying, oh, actually this element, this get by element by ID can be null, but the React create root here expects an element or a document fragment. It doesn't allow for null. So here we could either say this as HTML, as HTML element, for example, this would be one possibility, or we can simply add an exclamation mark here in the end. And we are telling TypeScript simply, okay, look, I know that this may return null, but I will take care of it and I will make sure that there is an element with an ID of root in our document. So you don't need to worry about it. You can rest assured that whenever we run this piece of code here, this will return a non null value. The next thing we would like to do here is to tell TypeScript what these modules are or actually a type definition for these modules. And, and this is something which you come across sometimes. It, it eventually will come across during your developer journey. It's not something that you come across every day. But there are cases when TypeScript doesn't really know how to process or what these extensions here mean. And the way for us to address this is here under source, we can create a new file. This doesn't really matter how you call it, but I'm gonna call it modules.d.ts or you could also say custom types, for example, custom types dot d dot ts and the dot d here is important because this tells TypeScript that, hey, this is a type declaration file. There may be information here about what certain types actually mean. And this is what we're gonna do here. We're gonna say declare module. And this module is going to be anything.svg. And here we will simply say that whenever there is an export, a default export, this is going to be a React function component, which will receive here a React.svg props and then here we it will simply be svg svg element okay so this is a little bit um, complicated in terms of syntax the bottom line or the summary here is that it is simply saying okay whenever you have an svg file treat it as a react function component which accepts svg props now why can we do this that's because here within our webpack configuration we are using svgr webpack to transform svg files into react components this is what allows us to treat the svg imports as react components as you can see here, the error that we had in the SVG import is already gone because now TypeScript knows how to handle .svg files. And the other one that it doesn't know how to handle is the JPEG import. Now here, this is fairly simpler. We'll simply say declare module and then any JPEG file, the export that comes from it is just simply going to be in the form of a string. We can save this file like so. And then here back in our index.tsx, you will see that the warning is also gone. This is looking much better, but this is not everything that we, that we need to do. So there is one last step. And if you remember here within our Webpack configuration, the first option, the entry point is index.jsx. We need to change this to tsx. If we don't, if we just come back here to the terminal, and we try to run npm run dev, for example, then you will see that Webpack is not going to find the file. You see here that we can just scroll up and there is basically, it cannot resolve the index.jsx file. If we come back then, let's cancel this. And we come back here, we change this to tsx. We're gonna save this and then we're gonna start it again, npm run dev. And now hopefully everything should be up and running. And here we get a very interesting error. And there is again another thing that we need to change. This is in our SVG test here on in our SVG rule. And this we are looking only at JSX files, right? So one way here for us to do that or to make an alternative is either JS or JSX or TS or TSX files. So we're gonna save this and now back here, let's stop it. Let's clean the screen and let's try to run it again. Let's see if that error is gone. Perfect, the error is gone. Everything is compiled successfully. Once again, since we were just looking at JS or JSX issuers here, then Webpack was not really properly transforming the SVG file when it was imported by a T 
TSX or within a TSX file. Now that we have changed this, now that we had make sure have make sure that the the also the TS and the TSX files are within the allowed or the observed issuers, then everything is working as expected. Back to the browser here, we refresh the page, we see that everything is still working just as before. And here, let's give it a little test. Let's remove our build folder. And in our terminal here, let's try to run npm run build. And let's see what the output looks like. You will see that the output is actually going to be JavaScript files. It regenerates the build folder. When we open it, you see that it has an index.bundle.js and this here is pure JavaScript. Very hard to understand, yes, granted, but this is JavaScript. We don't need to worry about what is in here or to try to understand this. This is all Webpack generated. So the only point to show here is that in the end, even though we have TypeScript files in our project, we generate JavaScript, vanilla JavaScript files in the end. Perfect. This was a relatively long video, lots of interesting stuff about TypeScript, how it works behind the scenes, how we should integrate it with Webpack and with Babel. So before we move on, let's take a short break and then we come back in the next lecture. Welcome back. No application is complete without a working test configuration. That is what we will implement in this video. We will integrate Jest and React testing library into our project so that we can write unit and integration tests for our components. In our terminal, as always, let's first install the necessary dependencies. We will say save dev, save exec. And here we'll start by installing Jest. Jest is going to be version 29.4.3. Then we want to install ts-jest and this is for handling TypeScript within Jest. It's a pre-configured set of presets for Jest and TypeScript. This covers most of the use cases. There may be some need for um, one or two fine tunings or tweaking of the configuration depending on very specific application configurations. But for us here, the standard defaults are going to work just fine. The version that we will install is 29.0.5. We then want to install the Jest environment, environment-js DOM. This is not shipped by Jest anymore. It was shipped together with the Jest package in earlier versions, but in later versions it is not anymore. So we need to install it individually or separately. This is required for us to run the Jest tests in a DOM similar or rather a, an environment that is simulates the DOM environment. Later on, we will see where this option is used. For now, we will install the version 29.4.3. And then we also want to install types forward slash Jest. And the version is going to be 29.4.0. Once we install this, this packages here, then we will be able to generate our configuration for the Jest part of our application. Jest is a framework for running tests, which means that we are not going to use Jest in production. That is why we have save dev here and we are interested in configuring Jest to run unit and integration tests within our environment. But all this is going to be run either from within our CI environment or from within our local machines, it's not really going to reach the production code or rather the production environment. It's going to test the code that will be deployed in production, but it's not going to be run exactly in production. To rephrase it a little bit, it's going to test the production code, but the tests themselves are not going to run in production. So here we will say now, once that we have installed the packages, we say npx ts jest and this has a, an option for us config colon in it. Once we run this, we will see that we generate a configuration here. If we come back to our IDE, then there is a jest.config.js. And here you see that we have our test environment. Jest can also be used to run tests in a node environment, but here we are more interested in running it in a JS DOM environment. This is where the library that we have installed here, the Jest environment JS DOM comes into play. If we don't install this and we try to use the JS DOM option here, then Jest is going to throw us an error. It will instruct us to install the package, but just to avoid the error, we already did that beforehand. 
now we have just roughly set up here the next thing we would like to do is to install and set up the react testing library react testing library is one library that gives us a lot of features and interesting very intuitive ways of operating with react components and interacting with them so I'm particularly a fan of it and I recommend it if you are getting started with React, if you're getting started with writing tests, it's a very easy and intuitive library to learn. So we will install here, save dev, once again, save exact. And the versions that we'll use here is at testing dash library forward slash react version 14.0.0 at testing dash library forward slash user events version 14.4.3 and the last one here is just a set of utility functions for jest testing library forward slash jest dash dom at version 5.16.5 this will give us a couple of additional features to make assertions within our jest tests once we install this and just for the sake of completeness the user events here is a set of utilities for us to interact with whatever is rendered on the screen. Small typo on my end here, that should be user event, not user events. Once we fix that, that should be fine. So as I was saying, this user event here gives us a lot of interesting ways of interacting with components, very intuitive ways. And when we read the code of the test, it becomes very clear what we are expecting the users to do to how, how we are expecting them to interact with our components. We don't need to do any additional configuration for testing library. We just need to import and use it. Now I'm gonna clear the console. Let's go back to the IDE. And here within our package.json, we can then finally configure our test command. We will simply say jest like so. This will start our jest test runner and we could actually already try it. It's not going to work, but we will see that there is something actually happening. Okay, so when we run npm run test, you see, that just starts up and then it simply says that it didn't find any tests and the tests that it looks for it's in here in this test match option we can customize this within our jest.config.js file but basically anything inside of a double underscore tests double underscore folder or anything that ends with either dot spec dot tsx or dot spec dot ts or dot test dot ts so we are going to start developing our first test and for us to do that instead of using directly root.render here we're going to create a new file within our source folder this is going to be an app.tsx file and we will create the equivalent of a test file app.test.tsx and then within our app.tsx we will simply export this whole thing here so i'm going to cut this i'm going to add app and then our already closed tag here. I will import app from forward slash app like so. And then here, and we could actually also make this a named export. So simply say here, export const app that is going to be equal to a functional component, which will just return for us a React fragment with everything that we had in the previous file. Now we are missing the logo and the image. So that's what we're gonna cut and paste from this file here within our app.tsx. Once we put it here, and then we could also have the index.css imported by, by the, or imported within the app file. Perhaps we could do that. Let's do it here, just so that we can see one more behavior of chess that we need to configure. But once we have this, we save this and back to our terminal. Let's first make sure that the development code is working as expected, that nothing was broken with the imports. Although the code is properly compiled here on the top, we have this TypeScript error that says that whenever we have a file, an empty file here, it cannot be compiled under the isolated modules option. So all we need to do is here, we can simply add an export like so, just for TypeScript to stop complaining. Once we stop this and start it again, then we should see that everything is up and running. Perfect. So our changes didn't break anything in our configuration. We can stop this now and we could try to run here or rather create our first test. So we will describe, and this is the structure of Jest. Jest provides a, a wrapper describe, which allows us to, for example, write something like this app component 
tests and then this receives a description in the first argument and then a function as the second argument and then within our describe we can then add an it and this could say for example renders goodbye text on the screen same principle here it receives a description as a first argument and as a second argument the function that will be executed by jest now here this is where we can then import render from our testing library at testing library forward slash react like so and we can also import our app from the app file now we can here simply say render app and this is not going to work as expected and i will explain in a little bit but i just want to show you how easy it is for us to start rendering something on the screen with testing library now that we are trying to render the app here and we have a test within our .test.tsx file, then we can try to run npm run test and let's see what comes out on the screen. Perfect. So that's the expected error that I wanted to see here. Uh, you see that there is a lot of descriptions and the first one is, or rather a, a, a useful one is this import line here that is highlighting, oh, Hold on a second, I don't know how to handle the index.css file. If we were to come back to the IDE and open the index.css, the first thing is a dot, and then that's what Jest is telling us. Um, wait, I didn't expect to actually see a dot. I was expecting some JavaScript or some TypeScript file here that I could handle. If we scroll up, you will see that this is exactly the, the error message here that just failed to parse the file. And for Jest to be able to handle such static files, one of the most used ways is to simply say, okay, just look, don't worry about the styles, don't worry about the images, don't worry about SVGs. We are not gonna test these things explicitly. You can just mock these files and focus solely on rendering the components for us to test interactions and behaviors. How do we do that? Well, we do that by adding a couple of mock files and we can add here on the top directory underscore underscore mocks underscore underscore or you could also add under the source folder but I find that since this should not be included in production code then I also am fine with placing them outside of the source folder. If these are needed at any point by your TypeScript configuration then you would have to include them here just as we did with our with our um, source folder to include in our TypeScript project, but since they are not needed for now, we just leave it outside. The first mock that we want to implement is the file mock, and the file mock is going to be file mock.js, and all it's going to do is it's going to have module.exports is going to be whatever string you want to you want to call here. You could say like file stub for example so that we can mock the contents of any non-javascript file for example jpeg png svg and so on let's see how we can add this to our configuration and this is within our jest.config.js we will add an option called module name mapper like so and this is going to take an object and as a key here we can pass a bunch of file extensions we'll say backslash backslash dot and then here that is going to be uh, once again all the extensions we want to handle that would be jpeg jpeg like so png gif this could also be some font files like eot or otf or for example ttf wav wav2 so there are like lots of things lots of formats we could also have some video files here if we want to mock so that if we import any videos coming in our application and we can also add the svg here so bottom line is that we can add as many files as we want here file extensions and then we can tell just look for all these files simply use the following root dirt this is a specific value in jest or, or it is a placeholder in jest for the root directory this is where our jest.config.js file is placed and then within this directory look for our mocks directory and then for file mock.js okay so this is just telling jest 
whenever you encounter any import with these extensions here then use whatever or replace this import by the exports of this file mock.js and very similar here for our style file we can do it like so and then we can say css or less files for example and here we need to pass i i just forgot to pass here we need to pass a dollar sign in the end and a dollar sign in the end as well here uh, and then this you can use you can tell just to use once again similar principle root there forward slash mocks but then here we will just call this slightly different style mock dot js now we're going to save this and we'll copy paste this we're going to change the name of the file we're going to call this style mock and instead of having module dot exports is a file stub we will simply set this to an empty object like so now we're going to save this and back to our terminal clear the terminal and try to run our tests again and as you can see the tests are passing successfully so now whenever jest is encountering any imports here within our files let's open it again source app.tsx whenever jest comes across a .svg or a .jpg here or a .css it is not going to try to import the actual contents of the file what it will do is it will look into the mock files that we have provided and it will import whatever is exported from these files now within our test we can wrap we can finish the test by expecting or by telling jest that it should expect something to happen right so here after it renders the app on the screen what it should happen is that we should expect the screen dot get by text like so with a let's say a goodbye right so goodbye here and i'm making the the typo on the letter here the cap the 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 first letter i'm putting it small cap instead of uppercase and here that's just to show that we will get an error the test will fail and in the end we will see how to fix that so we expect the screen whenever we are looking or whenever we are trying to find an element with this text we would expect this to be in the document now this to be in the document is not going to work just yet we're going to save this let's try to run our test once again and we will see that to be in the document is not going to be defined and here you see that first of all it's not finding anything anything so let's fix that and here we can just say for example we can pass a, a regular expression like so with a uh, case insensitive and once we save this and try to run this again uh, then we should see that the to be in the document is not found but here it's very interesting you see that it already renders the elements that we are rendering here on the screen right so now at the end here you see that it says that the to be in the document is not a function and this is where our our library testing library forward slash that just dom comes in handy so this provides a bunch of functions like this one i find the that the to be in the document is the one that's used the most often once we save this and then we try to run the, the, the tests again, then we should see that everything is passing. Perfect. So everything is green as we want it to. And here, just a small comment. You would have to import this testing library forward slash just DOM in every test file. There is a better way of doing that. Of course, if you want to, you can come here to the root directory and you could add a new folder and say test setup, for example. And then within the test setup, you could say setup after env. This is just, once again, just a convention. It doesn't need to be this name here, but then we could actually add then here the import from within our file. Instead of doing it there, we can do that in the setup after env. And we can customize our jest.config to say here setup files after env. And we need to pass here an array of files. The um, it's going to be pretty much the same um, pattern as above. So root directory forward slash, and here the name is test setup, test dash setup forward slash setup after env.js, like so. Once we save this, come back to the terminal, clear it, and try to run the test again. Then 
we still need to make a little change here. I forgot that since we are not really transforming this file um, into common.js, then just may run into problems here. This is a very well-known issue when we have imports, just doesn't handle them very well yet, despite this problem being like a couple years old. So if we just use require here, that should be everything that we have to do. This is a common JS import syntax. And then here we will just run the test again and we will see that everything is going to be green. Important thing is that we then don't need to import this testing library forward slash JS DOM before each and every test or within each and every test file. For now, we can take a short break. We have done a lot here. We have integrated just into our application and we can now write unit tests whenever we want to, ideally before we write any of our components. But here it's important that we have a working setup. Let's take a short break and let's come back in the next video. Welcome to the last lecture of this course and for this last lecture I would like to close with going into or showing you the details of how you can find stuff within the Create React app configuration. For the majority of this course we have worked with a Create React app based application and we know that we have a couple of scripts here that then call this Create or React scripts behind the scenes but we haven't really dug into the configuration that is used by Create React app. In the previous section, we set up a React application from scratch. So it's only natural that we would like to know where we can find some more information about perhaps something that is not supported by that application, some specific use case that we can then perhaps extract some knowledge from a Create React app setup and apply them to our application or to our React application that is set up from scratch. So here we have this React script in the beginning of every script in our package.json. This is just our traditional package.json. Now, where is, this uh, where is this located? If we come into node modules, you will see that there is a lot of dependencies here. And one of them at the very bottom is going to be this React scripts, right? So if I scroll down, until we find the letter R, then we will eventually come into this React Scripts package. This is a package that is published and it is installed as a dependency. And if we click here in the package.json of the React Scripts component, then you will see all of the dependencies that it has. It has a lot of dependencies here and then we start seeing all the indirect, the transitive dependencies that we are installing in our project when we use Create React app. You can also see that some of these dependencies are actually quite old. For example, it is using just 27 while nowadays, or at least at the recording of this video, we have the latest version of 29.5. So this is defined by the Create React or by the React scripts package and may have little influence over that. This is one of the disadvantages or this is one of the limitations of using Create React app is that we don't have direct access into the underlying dependencies. And if something is outdated or old, we have to update the whole thing in order to update that dependency. At the same time, just make sure that the dependencies are compatible with each other. But from my perspective, it pays off, it is better in the long term for production projects to have direct access to these dependencies. And then whenever we are updating any of them, we should have a testing setup that will inform us in case something breaks. This is then the first aspect or this is the first place where we can find dependencies, where we can find useful information regarding which dependencies are installed and required by Create React app. The second place is inside of this config folder. And when you open the config folder, you will start coming across things which are familiar to us after setting up the React application from scratch. For example, we have a chest configuration, we have a webpack configuration, and then you can see that here we have, for example, a webpack config.js, and when we open it, it is a very, very, very big file. It has a lot of dependencies here at the top and it does a lot for us behind the scenes. It is almost a thousand lines long. So this is very useful as well. If you want to understand how Create React app 
handles certain assets. For example, if you want to see how CSS files are handled, then you can search for CSS and there will be a few things here. But eventually we will find the, the rules where we handle CSS. So here you can see that we are starting to see something we are familiar with, the loader, some options, and as well as here, the CSS loader, as well as some CSS options. And here you see that this is going to be for the environment production, while this is not going to be included into dev or non-production environments, right? So here we also have a post CSS loader and we have a lot of different things that we can examine in detail so that we can get this knowledge and use it in our actual, in our own applications. Another useful section inside of the Webpack config is the optimization section. If you want to optimize or minimize your code for production, for example, this gives us a few clues of what is being done by Create React App. So first of all, it uses the Tursor plugin to minimize our JavaScript code. And secondly, it uses a CSS minimizer plugin. So these are the two plugins that are used for optimization in React. And if we want to use the same configuration, then we can transfer much of the knowledge from here. Another very interesting folder that I recommend exploring is the scripts folder. This is where our individual scripts that are used in the package.json for our project. I scroll down here. So this package.json file, the React scripts, we have the start, build, test and eject scripts. And these are the ones which are mentioned here, right? We see that there is a build and eject, a start and a test script. And when we click on them, we start getting a bit of a more um, a better insight into what Create React App is doing behind the scenes when we run build. As you can see, this is not just a webpack command, it's a longer setup and there are lots of interesting stuff here if you want to dig deeper into it. We have also an eject command and what the eject command does is it just unpacks all this configuration here into our own project so that we have full control over these files. Now, the eject operation is not reversible, which means that if you eject a Create React app application, you cannot go back into this and have everything managed by you by React script. So the eject is a case where you cannot configure something or you don't want to stay tied to React scripts you can run the eject command and you have all the information then copied or rather cop not copied, but unpacked, transferred to your current project. You can give it a try. I definitely recommend setting up a Create React app from, from zero and then just running the eject command to see the difference between the two versions, the one that is managed by React scripts and the other one that is managed by yourself. You also have a start and a test command here or the, the scripts. And another important aspect is the create just configuration file. And here you can see that there are a few limitations. So, so uh, create react app is already setting up a lot of configuration keys for us here. And then in the end, it gives us the possibility of overriding just a few of these keys. So if we scroll down, you will see that it says out of the box create react app only supports overriding this jest option so it does not provide full control over the jest configuration and this is also one of the limitations perhaps if your application requires a specific testing setup it might not be possible to directly override it with create react app Lots of interesting stuff here. I definitely recommend digging deeper into the React scripts package that is installed in Create React app applications so that you get a very good and solid understanding of all the configuration that is done behind the scenes for you.